championship. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long year of competition for these players, and it all comes down to this. Welcome to Championship Sunday, live from inside the Cobb Galleria in Atlanta, Georgia. We started with 600 plus competitors, and now we're down to the top 32 remaining in the singles tournament and the top four remaining in the doubles tournament. We're in for a wild day of intense matches. Welcome back to BCX 2023. I'm your host, Win Ann, better known as White Sheepy. And alongside me this morning are the legendary Sparky, Duke, and Flambo. What's going on, guys? I'm having a great time. <laughs> this is the tournament of the year. This is what, like, Winter Championship Day 1. We're already looking forward to this. A winter Championship, really, last year. We were looking forward to this moment. All the gamers are here. Well, technically not all of the gamers. Lots Unfortunately, you got froned, is at home, sick with COVID, well. unable to be here, unable to work this weekend, we and we are all very sad and hope you get better soon. It's not quite the same BCX without you. But aside from you got froned, basically every gamer is here, and that's why no matter who you're talking to, Brian everyone's like, home is like, this oh, is the yeah. hardest tournament that it has ever been, and that's the hardest tournament that we will ever have, uh, probably until next year's BCX. Yeah, I mean, kind of to your point, though, like the competition just keeps leveling up. I know I keep hammering home this point to the people who've been watching every single pre-show and every time I'm on, but seriously, like, there's just so much going on. I've seen tweets of people being like, yeah, history is going to be made. We say that every year because somebody's going to write this down. Somebody will be the world champion. But really and truly this year, some very different history could be made. We are seeing a lot of people saying that someone other than North America is going to be going home with a gold medal. Yeah, it's weird because it's never been so obviously this close, right? I mean, as you were saying, South America has been on a tear, especially on land. We saw in those royales, South America kind of had everyone's number, but there's so many storylines leading into this BCX. You have the returning champ, Impala, still in the bracket. You have all of these people who have something to prove, but there is only one trophy for singles that we can give out on that side and on the 2v2 side of things as well. Teams that we haven't seen before making deep runs. I'm really, I'm just, I'm waiting to hop in. <laughs> well, before we do that, you know, we definitely have wrapped up two amazing days, right? Yesterday and on Friday. But we still got plenty of matches to go on this championship Sunday. But before, you know, we get into too much further, I want to take, let's take a look back at like those first two days. And this is day one recap. You guys remember that was, that was start of it all. It was day one doubles tournament. Sparky, how were you feeling at that time? Doubles was really fun. You're seeing on your screen, you're seeing Fred Fredberger and Jeff, uh, previously known as Jeff Wardo there. They were fun to watch. Everybody's been really fun to watch. We've had some surprises. Obviously, Money Holla taking down Cody Travis. We've had some people on stage like Bunny. Everyone was like, oh, Bunny. Oh, I love the little like greater than less than sign in the W. I hope you have a fun time at BCX. And then we saw some darn gameplay coming out from Bunny. There's been surprises on the stage, on the main stage. There's been surprises on the side stream. There's been surprises down in the gaming pit because that's where the real gaming happens. <laughs> Day one was incredible. I love the two's gameplay. Made it, you're seeing made an experience on your screen right now. They had, oh my gosh, their set against Javid Fakey was unbelievable. I mean, like you said, day one, all about 2v2s and a fantastic time. You know, we love watching 2v2s, seeing the 2v2 action, the combos that come out, the upsets that happen at the World Championship inside of 2v2s, and one team kind of trickling above a lot of other ones, like Zen and Godly, really surprising a lot of people. That's one of the standouts for me, at least. Yeah, for me, I think, you know, aside from the 2v2 gameplay, day one is also just quite literally day one, so it's our first chance to really get to sit down and talk to some of the players. I spent so much time in the Sinestro Robbie just sitting down and meeting people I've never seen before. Well, besides day one, we also had day two that was all about some of like our, our best single stuff in pools. And we got something for y'all to check it out. Man, the one we want action is going to be absolutely insane. We got a super huge crowd. <laughs> I 
Lana just refusing to give this one away. It is his game to lose the way he's been playing. Uh oh. <laughs> he wants to say he wants the more, bro. He is really living in the moment. Money Hall takes a 3 0 over Cody. That was a good recognition that he was too far away, but doesn't actually get the follow up that time. That's gonna KO Flowey, taking it. He played Incredible Snowy, did exactly what he needed to do. They have done so well because look at what he is capable of. Anime, though, does land. This is the Grab Pound Connects. Anime clutches game five. Is this Bunny's just best performance ever? Throughout that entire final game, it was destruction. I want to call out like what he's doing, but then all of a sudden he starts doing something else. What? Why are we doing that? And give it up for Sarvey. Oh my! No! It could be in there. What an incredible day two yesterday. All those upsets, everyone bringing their A game. Patrick and SpongeBob. Yeah, we didn't even talk about the sponge. <laughs> <laughs> Krabby Patties. That was so amazing. And gosh, just looking through the, that highlight, just remembering everything that's happened, all the players who have made their way through to today, which is now top 32 in the singles tournament. Wow, that was incredible. Now, BCX has been very amazing, awesome for the competition, but it's more than just that, right? Okay, because it's all about the expo as well. So being back together again is always such a fantastic thing. And look at that. You can see SpongeBob and Foda and Patrick all together there. And still people, more people. I know. <laughs> than Spongebob and Patrick. And it's especially just awesome being able to just meet all your friends in person and just get back together again. So guys, I, I gotta ask you, what's been your favorite thing about the Expo experience so far as we you know, get closer to closing out BCX 2023? I'm gonna talk to you first, Sparky. Uh, I had a great time sitting in the audience with Pauly Monto. He's usually one of the main people that I will go and sit in the audience with and enjoy the games as they are going on because you're usually working and a lot of times <laughs> you're usually working. So me, me and Pauly, hook up and we're the ones out there in the audience. That's that's actually the reason that I lost my voice last year. <laughs> They're giving us like one block a day this year so we don't burn our voices out, but like I lose it in the crowd and Polly's waving the Swedish flag and that's that's probably my favorite part so far. Yeah, I mean, generally I'm all about that gameplay, but really when it comes to BCX in particular, I'm all about the community. When I get to go out there, shake hands with people, get to kiss babies or whatever, just like <laughs> meet people and get to hear their experiences and, and hear them say like, hey, this is my first ever BCX and be like, How's it, how is it treating you? And almost every single time they're like, this is the best thing ever. I'm so glad I got to come out. If you're watching at home, I highly recommend you come out. You can just tell from the energy that this crowd brings that BCX is just such a special time. Yeah, no, it's definitely a culmination of all the great things that Brawlhalla Esports has to offer. Me personally, I've had a fantastic time interacting with all of the cosplayers, actually, that decided to make their way out to the event. I mean, we had Magyar playing DDR with us last night. Like, where else could that happen? It's been so fun getting to meet everyone. We got Thea cosplayers. We have the whole roster. There's some, even the skins, you know? They don't just go with the default. We have the varying skins as well, so it's just been so fun. I can't wait to come back next year. BCX is it. Love it, love it. Now, guys, of course, we want all of our viewers, you know, to be able to participate somehow. So all of our viewers at home, you guys can grab some amazing viewership rewards and you can do that just by staying and watching and just tuning in throughout the entire day to get all this exclusive stuff on twitch.tv slash All right. Also, also, if you're here at the venue and you haven't done it yet, we got amazing merch this year. And of course, that's all, you know, new, brand new. Look at that right there. The t-shirts, the mouse pad, the joggers. You can grab some merch here live at the venue. But wait a minute. If you're at home and you're not here, that's okay. We're going to put this stuff online sometime next week. So that way you guys don't miss out either. 
okay? And then also, don't forget, the Yeti.com slash Brahala uh, is having a ultimate Brahala sale. 25% off their entire collection only for this weekend. And let me tell you, the weekend is finishing. Today is November 5th. It's going to be your last day to get a chance to get some amazing, comfortable, swagged out stuff. Seriously, I use all of this stuff before the sale goes away. All right, guys? Now... We do got one more other thing that's happening here at the venue, and it is our Make-A-Wish uh, collaboration here with Make-A-Wish Georgia. So you can scan the QR code um, on the screen right now and donate to this amazing cause, Make-A-Wish Charity, and you'll be rewarded with the Wish Maker title reward in game. Okay, you don't want to miss out on this either because not only will you be helping a great cause, and we know how generous you guys are in the community, but you also will be getting a very limited, exclusive title reward. This is the only way you can get these rewards. It's not only a title reward, the Wish Maker, you get that Moonin avatar too that you can see at the bottom there. This is the only way to get this stuff and please make a wish Georgia. They're literally doing some amazing, amazing things for children in need. So, all right guys. So, okay. Now let's get down to business because we've got some champions to crown today, right? So, uh, we got another action-packed day of a bunch of matches. It's Championship Sunday. It's Top 32. Um, let's take a look at our first three matches of the day, starting with our doubles competition first. So we're, woo, just looking at these names already, I'm almost breathless because up first, we do have Zen Godly versus Made and Experience. And as we keep going on, Acno Blaze versus Radish and Meg D. And then it continues. This is your top four. One of these teams is your champion for doubles. I want some quick thoughts about this, Sparky. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? You're nodding. What are you for thinking? Dues, you know, I think Zen and Godly might actually do this one. I think they might take this one home. I think it would be a very special bond. The very first world championship team was a North American and an EU coming together to win the Brawlhalla World Championship at BCX1 so many years ago with Starlight and Daiku. And now we could even squash the centuries old beef between America and Britain coming together after the Revolutionary War. We can finally squash it here. We're on the same team now. Let this guy get up here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they well, put an extra chair here for some reason. Well, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in the singles competition, Godly and Zen actually had to fight each other. They had to yep. brawl it out. Winners round one. Right? And who was the winner was of that? Godly. I believe it was Godly, Godly in game seven. five. That's right. Which is wild that Zen took it all the way to game five. I would not have seen that coming. I think that is incredible to have to fight <laughs> your teammate in singles. And then now, come here to Championship Sunday, it's time to get together again, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, so we do have some players to talk about, right? And we're already starting to talk about them, and I'm gonna ask you again, Sparky, I want to know your thoughts on Godly. If Kaina wasn't here, Godly would take this tournament. No worries whatsoever. It would be light work for a player like Godly. But unfortunately for him, Kaina is here. The good news for Godly is that Kaina is on the other side of the bracket. So it's going to be a little while before he runs up into Kaina. The other people on his side of the bracket that I'm looking at, like he's going to maybe have to be worried about Laura's. Of course, Impala's there as well. Meg D's there. But I think Godly might take this tournament home. I think this would be really the final step that he's looking for, the final one that he's been searching for this entire year. He hasn't won a Royale, but I think if he won BCX, the Royale desires would quickly be gone from his mind as he accepts the big trophy and the big check. He's playing so well in ones, he's playing so well in twos, his mind seems locked in, the execution from brain to hand seems completely absolutely better than almost everybody else at this tournament. It's godly, baby. Okay, well, you told me you want to talk about this next, next player. Yeah, I get, I get two and, in a row. And, and yeah, you do get two in a row, and we're going to the North American region. It's Meg D. Meg D, another player also doing very well in twos and in ones, made it into the top 32 in ones, made it into the top four in twos alongside his teammate Radish. Meg D is one of those players that I always want to say that, like, oh, you never really know what you're going to get, but you, you, you kind of do at this point. Megdi has really solidified himself 
in North America and of course the world at large. As a very strong player, you're seeing the clips that he got on, uh, who is this, Delta, earlier uh, in the weekend. Meg D is so strong when he has the gauntlets, when he has the sword, one of the best Val players out there. Meg D is such a strong competitor. His ability to turn down the speed and his ability to turn up the speed at will. When he finds the moment where it is perfectly optimal to turn up the speed when he has the power to do it, he does that. But the rest of the time, he will grind you down unlike anybody else out there. Okay, that is such a good description of, of what and how Meg D has gotten so far. Now, I'm going to jump over to the European side of things here. And Flambo, I know you're excited to talk about this player. Tell me about Skeldra. Aye. So Skeldra is the dude I'm looking at right now. All my great sword players in the venue rise up. We're doing hot at BCX 2023. I think Skeldra, I look at this great sword gameplay, and I don't really see someone who's piloting the weapon as effectively. Yeah, sure, there's other players who are able to get results, but specifically in the optimization of the weapon, I think Skeldra is doing stuff that no one else is. I'm really looking forward to a deep run from Skeldra. I really want him to win. That would be so cool, but we're going to have to wait and see. Well, I don't think we'll have to wait and see for too long. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to jump to the next region here, South America, highly talked about. And I'm going to pick at you again, Flambo, because here's another player who is doing great with a great sword. Yeah, I mean... Use on the other side. I was saying Skeldra seems to be optimizing the weapon in a lot of ways, but I think when it comes to just overall player benefit, you seems to have it across the board on the stats, right? Has the punish game, has the defense, has the movement. Even if I think there are some things that could be optimized in terms of maybe some of the punishes or some of the approaches to what the weapon can do, use without a diamond. Look at that string, right? Like clearly here to do some damage. And I didn't think we were going to see the J Yun on land because before we heard him say, oh, I don't like playing greatsword on land. Yet here he is, chefing people up, cutting people up, dicing people up. Oh, and it's so good, too. Oh, you love to see it. Now, uh, I haven't picked on you quite yet, Duke, so I'm going to ask you about this European player. We can't forget about him. It's Akno. Tell me your thoughts. I mean, I think Akno has basically solidified himself as a ho household name. One of the goats of 2v2s, and the fact that he hasn't gotten a world championship win alongside Blaze is borderline criminal at this point because they are such a long-standing powerhouse of 2v2s, but... You got to point out the fact that he's not just a 2v2er, he's a 1v1er. Both Akno and Blaze currently sitting in the top 32 as well. They are here to play this weekend, and they're going to be having a little bit of split focus. But either way, Akno and Blaze, two powerhouses in the 2v2 space, and I'm particularly looking at Akno to try to bring this one into the grand finals because he's sitting on the elimination side of top, of top four in 2v2s. That's right, but he is in top four of 2v2, so it's very, very possible. Now, talking about another goat and this one is and was a world champion do tell me about sandstorm i mean sandstorm at this point like a lot of people at home are like oh my gosh they always talk about sandstorm but the like one time we don't talk about sandstorm everyone at home is like why are you not talking about my goat he's just that <laughs> guy there are people who watch sandstorm go down oh three and still go yeah but like the lights were probably in his eyes he's got so much fandom behind him and for good reason he's an absolute monster at the game currently out of the 2v2s which means he gets all the focus on the 1v1s here he's already in the top 32 and he's looking to get further Oh my goodness, yes. And I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen here in, in the singles tournament, which we will see what happens later today. Now, I got to switch over again to our South American region because they have been showing up. They've been coming out here. And we are talking about Kaina, Kaina being on top here. And Duke, I want to know how you feel about Kaina. I don't feel anything about Kaina, <laughs> but other people feel a lot of things about Kaina. Honestly, Kaina's got some of the best hammer plays in particular out of anybody that I'm seeing here this weekend. You're seeing the way that he's able to play this Taros like nobody else is playing this Taros. And honestly, it's just really solid fundamentals at the game with a great weapon set that he's bringing to the table. But he is one of the big favorites for the South Americans. A lot of people, despite the fact that he didn't do that hot in the Autumn Royale, are still looking at him to be the big guy for South America. And like Sparky said, he's one of the big guys who believes in him. That's me. 
Do you, you want to add in about how, why, how, why? Dude, kind, kind of a legend. Like, he, he tears up the ranked queue in his region. He tears up every community tournament in his region. He's tearing up the bracket here. He beat Stingray. The, the clip you just saw was him beating Stingray, something he was unable to do last year. He ended up choking the ending, and Stingray was able to come back. But this time, he took out Stingray. You know who's eventually going to be on his list? If I'm the one writing in the names on the bracket, it's going to be Godly. That's my biggest question for Kaina. Can he get the run back against Godly, the other player that he choked against in the end and ultimately defeated him. I love Kaina. Kaina is one of my favorite players this entire game. Every time I hear his name, I always hear it the way. I can't remember which Estesau commentator says it, but he says, Kaina. And I love the way he <laughs> says it. Whoever that is, I don't remember if it's Macaw. I don't know if it's Messino. I don't know if it's Sanchinu. If I said those names wrong, I'm sorry, man. I'm American. I have a mirror brain. <laughs> but tell me who says Kaina's name like that because I love it every single time. And I love watching Kaina every single time. Ooh, oh my goodness, we are gonna definitely have an amazing championship Sunday. So, one last player we do gotta talk about. Flambo, I'm gonna look at you here because it is our current world champion for singles, it's Impala. All right, so Impala, for a lot of people, Sandstorm, that's my goat, Boomy, that's my goat. Impala is the GOAT right now, right? Has the title. And I remember we were saying in the green room earlier, I talked to Impala a while before top four, top eight last year for like a good hour to get a good insight into his brain of what he thinks as a player. And honestly, his mental is so phenomenal. I think it's been a bit of a rocky year for him, admittedly. I think there was a lot of pressure after winning BCX that everyone thought, okay, are we gonna get back-to-back -back repeat performances? And I think that messed with his head a little bit. In fact, he was so close to not even coming to BCX at all, but with a quick change of heart, decided to make the change, came here and got into the top 32. I would really love if he could make the run again. I think it would say so much because, yeah, sure, maybe I don't win the winters or the summers or the don't even make it to the Royales, whatever. But if you just win two BCXs back to back, who cares? Oh, my God. And you just saw that clip there of Impala versus Agno from yesterday. Gosh, what a set. I was literally screaming back there backstage because I love Kaya. If you don't know anything about me, I do love Kaya. I'm a Kaya main. And, dude, do I support my Kaya? players, okay? And that is Impala, and he played beautifully yesterday, so, whoo! Okay, guys, so, we talked about the players, we're talking about who we're excited to see. There's a couple more other exciting things that I would like to talk about before we really get into Championship Sunday, and uh, I got something for you guys to check out. A uh, pretty cool video, uh, so, you guys, take a take a look. That's right, guys. I know we do a lot of crossovers, but it's our time to cross over into another game, and that's in Roblox with their weapon fighting simulator. I was seeing your reaction here. What? <laughs> Bogey's a raid boss. Yes, yes. Bogey's a raid boss. If, so, if you told that to not not just a Victorian child, if you told that to someone <laughs> who likes Brawlhalla in 2016, they would just melt on the spot. <laughs> they would just be incinerated instantly if you told them Loki raid boss in Roblox they would just perish on know, the spot. You saw the, the logo on top of that, like, kind of banister or whatever as you are like, going in, and you were like, yo. Like, that's the that's, logo. That's the Prahala That's the logo. one that I know. Did that's you see, right. Did y'all see Mordex in there? Yeah. yeah. Mordex, Hattori. And Hattori. That's right, that's right. Yes, those are characters. Those are legends that you can talk to um, in that weapon fighting simulator, like, game mode. And then, yes, you're right. Loki is the boss. And Loki feels like a raid boss in ranked. <laughs> so I don't even want to okay. know what it's going to be like fighting that Loki. Well, you can... 
to, you can join in this fun event when we are crossing over into Roblox on November 15th through the 29th. So don't miss out. Check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, so uh, that's not all the reveals that I want to talk about here, you know. So uh, first off, we asked you guys what you thought was the weapon pairing for Blaster's 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 the Blaster's 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 61. So you know what? Let's go ahead and take a look at the final poll numbers uh, of what you guys thought the weapon pairing would be. And uh, we got a lot of we got a lot of battle boots. And what was that cannon there as well? Okay, all right. And then the third being great sword. Great sword! Great sword! <laughs> <laughs> Who was the last great sword legend? Was it Mako or Arcadia? It was Arcadia. Arcadia. It was Arcadia? Okay, I couldn't remember the order that they came out in. So uh, these are these are some great guesses all around, and uh, I'm excited to let you guys check out a first look about something so you don't have to wait any longer. Blaster's boots, Blaster's great sword. Great sword. Uh Legend number 61, and that's right, that is our 61st legend. And oh my goodness, <laughs> I love hearing the crowd <laughs> behind me <laughs> with cheers, maybe mixed results, who knows? But that is your first look at legend number 61, what the weapon pairings were. So some of you guys who guessed cannon and spear, good job for you because you got to enter a chance in a giveaway. Yeah, I think it was a skin giveaway a if you were skin. correct on exactly. your bearing guesses. Exactly, exactly. But yes, we're so excited to finally uh, kind of share this with everyone here, actually, because everyone here at the venue will actually get their first hands-on oh. at playing, yes, Legend number 61 here. And that will be available later today at the venue, um, available after the doubles uh, top four. Uh, so everyone here at the venue can actually go get your first look, hands-on experience with legend number 61. And I do want to say that everything you saw is still all in a work in progress, as you guys know. And we were just so excited to share with you guys this first look, this first experience of the next new legend, which will be coming soon. More details to come, as you guys know. Uh, so we hope, we hope you guys enjoy it. Let us know how you feel. And everyone at the venue, I'm, I'm just so thrilled that you guys get to have a first hands-on experience with this. We've been working so hard at it. Uh, thoughts, questions, guys? The <laughs> arms race in Brawlhalla <laughs> is quickening so fast. If you look at the arsenal that Isaiah has, then all of a sudden it was stepped up with Master Chief in Brawlhalla Combat Evolved, and now you have like the, the cannon mech, like Lockheed, Raytheon, <laughs> they're all eating good now <laughs> in Brawlhalla. The arms race is quickening at a <laughs> rapid pace. Cannon and spear. Uh, I, I, look, I'm going to be honest here. I, I have a very strong opinion on Spear. <laughs> okay. Uh, spear, spear players, you know what? You, you, just, you, sh you should be thanking your lucky stars that I was not in charge of this legend <laughs> because uh, it would oh. not have a Spear. Okay. would not have a Spear. Well, well, not to rile you up even more, but did you see how the Spear down sig works where you can change from electric to fire? Yep. And yeah. The neutral sig will change based on which element you have on it. You're about to tell me that Spear players can put, like, dot damage and conditional <laughs> effects. I feel like... People, because I've been saying for so long, oh my god, Spear is the sauciest weapon. It has negative Riz. And then they were just like, well, what if we made a legend <laughs> that was the Rizzler of Spear? And I'm like, I'll give it up. I'll give it up. It looks really freaking cool. I can't wait to get my hands on that legend, but still holding out hope for the big one. <laughs> you know. There's a lot of movement in those six, too. I'm worried about yeah. that. A lot of movement on both Cannon and the Spear signatures. You saw some movement a little bit like. Uh, 
Wushong spear neutral signature, but like yeah. more movement with like the whatever was spinning around yeah. in yeah, there. Kinda yeah, kind of like yeah. Enchantress side thing. Yeah, the where like Static Shock just like <laughs> riding through, riding the little robot, and then of course the the the, the crawling mech as it comes towards you as you're uh, piloting it dude, with the giant. Cannon. Did you hear it's the terrifying. crowd pop when the mech comes yeah. in and hits Ulgrim? Dude, They're like, oh, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. That is truly terrifying. Oh well, I'm glad you guys are so excited for us, but. We gotta get back to the tournament, all right? It's Championship Sunday. We're down to our final four teams in the doubles. I gotta ask you guys your quick predictions on these four. Sparky, go. Uh, I wasn't ready because they told me I was on pre-show about 20 minutes before. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. In first place, Kaina. Oh. All the way from south. Wait, wait, I went wait, in wait, first wait, place. No, I, I choked. Twos? I choked. In twos? In twos. In twos. We're in doing twos. twos. Sorry. Twos. Look, this, it's okay. this is why I have the computer. This is why I need prep. I'm not good when okay, you put me on the spot. Okay, let me tell you like the this. teams. It's, Zen, it's, oh, I, no, I remember this. I remember this. Okay. In third okay. place, it's Zen and Godly. In second place, it's Agno and Blaze. And in the first place, it was kind of Lores. But uh, let's see. Uh, no, now it's going to be in uh, first place is, is Zen and Godly. In third place is Meggy Radish. Second place was Agno and Blaze. Woo! And he did. you did that all live just now. You did not plan for was, that, did I was you? Not ready. That's okay. What? What is this? Is it not? Look, dude. Look. Okay. I was ready for one's predictions. Really not possible. All right. It's is okay. It? It's okay. Right. I, I can come back to you, Sparky. It's okay. Duke. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Somebody it's okay. Come in. I okay. sounded like the fire alarm. This morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Don't worry, everybody. There's not a fire. It's, it's chill. It's chill. False alarm. False alarm. Quick predictions. <laughs> Top four. Uh, doubles. I put Acno Blaze. I'm gonna commit to that. Put him in first. I'm gonna put Zen Godly second. Made experience third. Ooh, okay. Made okay. experience. Too. Come on. All right, Flambo. It's tough because I feel like this could be the maiden experience show. I feel like this might be the one they've gotten so close many times before. I'm going to put them at number one. Let's go. At number two, I think Acno and Blaze are going to become a heartbroken. And at number three, I'm gonna put Zen and Godly. But actually, I'm maybe right. I don't know, man. But yeah. man, I gotta, I gotta say something. So yes. I, I mean, we do have man. to talk about Meg D. Radish are like playing out of their mind. They like are. they are a serious contender. Do you like they earned that they're top four. Stock, dude. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Sparky, yes, you can, raised your hand. Can I redeem myself with, yes, a, with a prediction that is possible <laughs> okay, yeah. in, in reality? Yes, uh, third place is gonna be Agno and Blaze. Second place, Maiden Experience. First place, Zen and Godly. Okay, there you go. Uh, Radish, Megdi, no one on the no. podium, you don't think? We don't have faith in him, apparently. All no. right, now, I'm going to change it then. It's only because yeah. it's Agno and Blaze down there. Yeah. Megdi, Radish, number one. I changed it. Okay. Yeah. Dang, last minute changes. Well, folks at home, let us know how you feel in Twitch chat, on socials, and all that stuff. Hashtag BCX2023. Now, we're going to take a pre a <laughs> we gotta take a very quick break. So don't go far, because we're about to kick off Championship Sunday.
the Brawlhalla World Championship. The event that has brought players from all over the world to compete in Atlanta, Georgia. There's so many good players down there. He's playing out of his mind, but is it going to be enough? The side like to chase off the way. He doesn't want to get caught by experience, but it's not enough. There it is. He's got it. Full finish. Why are we doing that? Give it up for Sarve. Oh, wow. Throughout all of the obstacles, the challenges, the heart of a champion is determined by one person. So what makes a champion? The courage to risk failure? The determination of never giving up? The aspirations of conquering one's fears? The ability to power through and conquer? No! It could be it! Oh! There it is! Nothing is worth it just as much as the BCX World Championship. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to find out who is going to be our 2023 doubles and singles champion. It all comes down to this. $250,000 total prize pool on the line and their shot at being crowned the BCX 2023 champion. It's time to find out who that will be as we kick off our first match of the day in our doubles top four bracket. So let me bring out Zen, Godly, and Made an Experience. All right, I hope you guys are ready. For anyone at home who doesn't know, this is our winner's finals match. Whoever takes this win will go straight into that grand finals and will not have to fight through the elimination bracket. It comes down to a lot on the wire right now. Godly, I'm gonna start with you. Did you get enough rest last night? Are you ready for today to kick things off here on the main stage? I'm ready. It's game time. That's it? You're just locked in right now? I'm just locked, that's it, it's game time. All right, then experience, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Is today the day we've got the highest energy out of you? Are you ready to get into this matchup? I want to win. You just wanna win? That's it. All right, I feel like uh, early morning winners finals means nobody wants to talk that much. So I'm gonna get one more question in for you and I'm gonna allow you to do a little bit of trash talk here. Will you take the dub home against Maiden Experience. That's the plan, yeah. It's not trash talk, but I respect them, but we, we, we want this. We want this really bad. We, we want to win this. We're going to win this. All right, Maid Experience. Anything you want to say to them before we get this match going? Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, just good luck. We're going to play our best. Let's just have fun. All right, I, I, they clearly want to get themselves into this match. I'm not going to hold you guys up. Go get ready, set up at your stations. We'll send it back over to the desk to get this thing started. Thank you, Glitter, and oh my goodness, Zen Godly versus Main and Experience as the first match of today on Championship Sunday at BCX 2023, and they are super ready to go. Do not think that because they were a little bit more quiet that they are not, that's the intensity. They're like, get me in this game. But I am so excited to introduce onto the desk Ajax and Taza. Guys, how are you feeling? Hashtag humble bros is what we got going <laughs> off to start because as quiet as they may have seen, the action is going to get ready. Actually, it is, before we say much else, it's a little quiet in this building. BCX, how you feeling this morning? <laughs> Everyone's ready. Everyone's ready to lock in and focus up and see who's really going to take this win. Taza, how do you feel? 
I'm very excited for this top four. We've got two of North America's best teams going up against an international team in Winner's Finals, which is Godly and Zen. And then we also have EU's Acno and Blaze on the other side of the bracket. This is going to be a... I mean, Ajax, we were talking about this before. Yes. When it comes to the results of these of this two's bracket, it's really anybody here can take the game uh, and take the entire world championship. And this first matchup here is between two teams that absolutely respect each other so much that we're just kind of like, we're going to do our best to win, right? Experience and Godly, they've been seeing each other play and grow and to see the same time and now they have to fight against each other to get into grand finals and noticeable absence of the number one overall seed which is Akno and blaze in the alim side because godly and zed had something to say about that as godly has done to them quite a bit earlier this year though they kind of sent a message we're back when they took over dreamhack but as they got to this spot it's worlds you know how things go and speaking of regions we thought would perform extremely well in worlds there's no south america to be found here because they both got stopped at fifth place one of which was on a team that is in a five-game Elim side run through Laura Zinkaina, Sack and Fiend, I believe is the, one of them they took out, Luna Snowy, Boomstorm, and that is oh. the team of Meg D and Raiden. Yes, and the team that I know, Sheepy, we were here on the desk <laughs> on Friday where I was like, look, there's going to be a, it's a toss up what's in top three, but I think Radish and Meg D had the, the ability to win it all and making that run after that upset against Blue and Cressu through so many game five sets against best teams was really, really impressive. Yeah, Radish and Meg D legitimately are playing out of their minds, but this is going to get so intense. You can see it right here, Zen Godly versus Made and Experience. They are gearing up, they are getting ready uh, to lock in and I, I, I personally think Maiden Experience are playing so well. Yes, Ajax. I, I'm still proud of that. <laughs> as I kept looking at the teams, I remembered something about Maiden Experience is that they love doubt. They love when people are counting them out and nobody really had them in their prediction. So last second, I was thinking maybe they do make the run, but I had them in third for a reason because I was looking at the Godly Zen team and I was watching as they were performing. This is a team that only had one community tournament before where they got second over at Moose Wars. And here, they're in a guaranteed top three finish potentially as we get round number one, winner's finals of 2v2 championships starting right now. Yeah, and going into round one here of this best of five, we've got double gauntlets on best sides of both sides of the field. And it's going to be the Zonics from Experience and May going up against Zen and Godly here uh, for game number one. And all waving up on, on the Fortress of Lions has actually not really been... Uh, uh, there's not been a, a moment where somebody has gotten caught just yet. Oh, I'm saying that Godly could be the first one that takes a ton of damage between these two teams. I'm expecting stocks to fly within 30 seconds apiece. Yeah, and a lot of things uh, have changed a bit with the Chronics falling away, but Zonix has really been the staple change ever we, since. We exchanged ranged weapons. We yeah. got a bow now instead of the Blast. Like, look, we still have Lockdown, we still have Pressure, but Ooh. we still have the first stock going away from you as experience. It's the first one to fall. Yeah, and so Godly and Zen uh, with Aang and Dalsim, which is the epic crossovers for Rayban and Wuxiang, are doing fantastic here in this opening. Experience at the bottom of the stage does get the reversal into Zen. Okay, Zen was going for a very early knockout on what was a bit, would have been Experience's fresh stock, and Experience gets the down air, turns that around, and they even up the stocks across the board. Something crucial with Made in Experience is that they were pretty much behind in every set, and they always won that reverse or getting that oh. game five. And a lot of it was offstage play coming in from down. Experience like this, going for the near. I'm trying to get it against the ground, but anyways, down. here comes the save. Seven. Here comes another one. Godly is not going to make that back as made an experience double up and Zen's still trying to find ground. Godly's entire stock was just an exchange between experience and made hitting with Godly ground pound over and over and over again and even with the help of Zen he wasn't able to make it back. Goes down to one stock very quickly as they try to set up a team combo that Zen just wasn't able to finish because it was interrupted by the uh, teammates of the blue team. Yeah that end light would have sent it perfectly over to position but instead Whoa. it's going to be Godly who answers back. It is now two to one apiece but Zen is in a troublesome spot. Look at how, how he's chasing all the way. Gets the ground pound and there we go again. Experience falling, but Zen not too far off either. And that recovery from Godly, that friendly fire sending Zen off the right side of the stage means a team combo could come onto Godly's final stock. Zen gets hit by a dive kick, but he's not going down just yet. And looking for a weapon here for experience. Can he find it? There's the spawn on the platform. May trying to give him some purchase there, and now it's Gauntlet's across the board. Neutral light into the down but May not positioned to be able to get the follow-up. Means Zen oh, still has two oh. stocks to his name. So close to be able to close it, but they do end up getting it anyways. Very close game right now, but Godly started to pick it up. We talked about it last year with Fozy too, where it seemed like Godly wasn't the one that was kind of the all-star at first, but by the time it got to Final Sunday, he really woke up. They need that to happen here today. 
Yeah, Zen uh, trying to play the front line here as Golly's getting sent deeper and deeper into Orange. Made similarly looking vulnerable on the Devil Jin. Oh, Experience Ooh. jumps out of the way of that exhaustive recovery. That could have done damage. And the ground punch are coming through. Is Experience going to go for them again? They try to stack up two down six in a row. And now Godly sent into the red, made in the same situation. Both players are fighting their own in one. We want to see who's going to get the stock. And Godly goes down first. And there will be enough to do it. But Zen was able to make a couple 2v1 situations Whoa. happen yesterday. It's, he can make it happen right now. They're both deep in the red. Pogo pushing him down just to try and hover around that soft platform, hopefully to find some ground and maybe get back into this. Zen looking for that side air. I don't think he go for a down light opener. I mean, the neutral stick will be a great call out. Okay, oh, that friendly fire. Oh, the the save. save from Maid out of the what friendly fire. That was such good awareness, but Maid not going to fall yet. It's not experienced to make sure he doesn't get caught up by Zen. Zen maybe looking for a ground pound on Zen. The, no, the, the side air hits on experience. Zen somehow navigating against one of the best teams in North America. Takes down Maid. Experience now fighting a 1v1 against Zen. He picks up the weapon from experience. His hand in D-Light recovery. He gets it. Dude. And Zen opens up the day with a 1v2 clutch Wait. to take the Lead of the set. Talked about it before as all eyes will be at Godly because of how strong he has been. Zen has been the star to show. He's already pulled off a 2v1 yesterday, got close to getting another one as they were moving forward in that Acno Blaze set. It didn't matter though because they won out the match regardless. But starting off the day with that, that is a huge confidence boost as you go into uh, the rest of the set. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not very many times where I see it in the midst of a set with a team that has Godly on them uh, to pop Three, off like two, that and celebrate a one, win like that. But Godly's going to be like, man, I have made an excellent decision teaming yeah. up with Zed here in this situation because the team definitely came out of left field, but they are playing the best that we have ever seen Godly play on a doubles team. And now they're up 1-0 and oh against Maiden Experience here in the winner's final. And this international threat has been putting in a lot of work, including Zed doing double the damage of pretty much two people on stage. It was 618 collectively. Most of that, of course, coming off the spear. And he's to see if he can make that happen to get experience. And going all the way off stage, trying to catch, but both of them smartly waiting it Ooh. out. The double dive kick from Godly tries to get the reversal on experience, and Zen trying to get the down line on his way back to the stage. Now looking for a weapon as experience blasts him away with the down air. May tried to go in and interrupt that nair, but does not succeed. And now Godly looking for the ground pound experience, just cannon stares him right out of the way. As to being able to interrupt, that was huge because got the experience might have fallen soon. He might be able to double up on it. Speaking of double ups, we're gonna go for double recovery from Zen. This opportunity to maybe catch oh. Godly. That's gonna be one dude to get Godly as well. No Godly dipping down below. Yeah, that side is so powerful. The neutral stick interrupted by Godly. What a huge save. And then he goes down off the top of the stage. And now made an experience are up six stocks to four. A much harder uh, uh, comeback to make here for the red team. That team combo not going to work out because Maid getting hit away from Zen on that unarmed kit. And there goes Maid flying to the left, but still holding on. Lucky for the red team, they are on borrow time stocks. Oh, well, against the blue Ooh. team, there goes one. This is an opportunity to try and power play. Gets Maid, but that weapon toss actually pushing away. Not jumping up, but the recovery will find its mark. Yeah, excellent job that side of recovery. Knowing the dodge is gone, that becomes a true combo. Godly covered one area, make, uh, and then Zen was able to cover the ground. That recovery in the Nair will bring Maid even deeper into yellow, and Zen and Godly are making a comeback here in game number two. Looking very even so far. Experience going for an attempt at ground. Probably trying to push Godly a little low. We talked about it yesterday. He was very aggressive off stage. You always have to keep an eye on him. Oh, and Experience trying to get back to the ground. Puts on the ground pound. Zen has made up the left side of the stage. And Godly sent off while Zen ends up getting hit by Experience. And that sidelight, Sarah just takes Godly down to his last stock. Team combo to the end stick. And he's spiked off the right side of the stage. Made an Experience clean the field. Perfect positioning for Maid. As soon as they recognized that Godly was going to go, they jumped that spot right away. Still holding that same lead. This time, a little bit less damage compared to last time. Yeah, I was surprised that a neutral stick was active enough just to be able to hit. Very end of the move comes through, but main experience showing why they have those team combos on block. Godly goes in for the end sig and ends up getting punished for it, but Zen does take experience down, and that's a huge stock to take. Onyx is usually so tanky, does not go down that early, and Godly's trying to do the same to Maid. A good defense as well from Maid, just jumping around that stair, which was perfectly lined up as Godly made him have to hop over. Right now, Maid just trying to stock tank, as he's done quite a bit throughout the weekend, and maybe go back up experience, but it wasn't worth it. The soft platform was not a safe spot. Ooh, Maid's gotta be careful here. If he gets hit by one strong hit, and he doesn't go down. Experience has to nav navigate a 1v2. Okay, Maid goes down, and Experience cannon dares to be able to save himself from getting caught between any combos. Godly goes for the ground pound, blast away by the Nair. And in fact, the blue team turns that 2v1 into damage for themselves. And Godly is now a strong hit away from just going down here in game number two and putting Zen into another 1v2 situation. And sweat beads around everything Experience tried. He was able to sneak his way back on with that stare. Experience has uh, been hunting for Godly as much as possible. Might be able to close it out this time. No, Zen getting uh -oh. in the way. They tried to get a ground. He got the right stuff recovery. He, he gets the ground pound. What a great position for Godly to steal that back. And now Maid in a 1v2 against Godly and Zed. He does get the dealer recovery. Okay, it's back onto Zed versus Maid. And Zed certainly has a deficit here. But if Maid can't land and he keeps getting this damage, it'll be evened quite soon. Sider misses. Can Zed do it again? 
then was able to outplay everyone with the spear, but the spear has now been knocked away. Maiden needs the weapon starve as best as he possibly can. Tries to go underneath the stage, maybe see if he can grab the... Uh, goes for it early. There's Garlet's the gauntlets. Two nares in a row. Goes for the weapon throw. Maid dodges. Zen waiting for that weapon spawn. Comes through the spears back into his hands. Dodges back. Maid not going for anything. One pogo. Doesn't get the sair. What's going to be next? The recoveries from Maid might knock out on its own. It's close. Oh, you got to Oh, down six punish. Gets the dare. Here's the right. light. Gets, the gets the recovery, but, but he doesn't get enough. a jumping recovery. It wasn't a true combo. The follow-up doesn't come through. And that unarmed recovery just barely doesn't knock out. Send us one more chance. Bade wants to stick with the gauntlets. Does not want to have the bow as the last option. Instead, oh. he's now stuck on arm because Zen was able to sneak the weapon away. He's waiting for the weapon spawn, but where's it going to be? It ends up not being at this side of the stage. So he has to come back to the dealer. Recovery comes through, and Zen does it again. The clutches the light like, call up. He knew that was the time he tried to finally jump in. How do you do that back to back? Now. Tough position here, Zen. Once again, another 600 plus damage game. Godly only putting up 275 on the board that game. Wait, that number went from 616 to 687. Yeah, yeah it went up <laughs> again. They were just continuously jumping Godly as often as possible because that's the main target for them. Oh. But they need to shift their focus over the Zen because that has been the main problem. Yeah, and in the replays, we got the team combo highlights coming out for me and experience. But at the end of the day, when it comes to that scramble, experience found himself off the side of the stage. And when you put into a 1v2 against Zen, it looks like he's just always going to be winning. And he started off that stock in red against Maid, who was only in yellow, being able to win so much, being able to get those punishes, the spear nair on the down zig after avoiding it. Everything was played so well up to the point Three, where he was able to get the deal Light, recovery, uh, having the gravity cancel that D-Light for the recovery to even be true afterwards and getting it on the very first try. They're going into game number three here at match point. You know, Godly as uh, much as has been put on his plate with finally getting that first dream hack win not too long ago. It does not have that two's land win he's been looking for. This international threat has been amazing, but Maiden Experience had two times yesterday where they brought it back to game five in spectacular fashion. If you got a game, there's still a chance. Yeah, and I want to highlight that those last two games were definitely clutch by Zen in both of those situations, right? Playing with a deficit, barely being able to take down experience, and then putting Zen in the situation where he has to carry that final stock, and he succeeds, but it is close. So if main experience, there's a very good chance they can bring it to this game five again, but if this game starts like this, it's a double knockout for Godly, I mean. It might just be a 3-0 in the Grand Finals. Hey, you better have, uh, if you have any strats left, start getting them now. This is the time. You cannot... You just can't relax from this point forward. The Godly and Zen have been looking so good. Zen is in the middle of every fray, and it doesn't matter oh. that time, though. He got beast up as he takes the ground pound. Now Godly forced to fight the 2v1 only for a moment. Yeah, experience and Maid both trying to set up with the Gauntlet Nair to be able to get a 2v1 onto him, but he navigates that space perfectly around the platform, gets that side light, and then Fake's out going for the Nair, so he's able to avoid getting punished by the blue team. Downlight knocks him to the side, and more damage is going on to experience his second stock. Can they get Godly here? Godly playing really good on defense. It's been a huge thing. Oh. It took his own teammate to get scrambled up, and experience already on his last stock. I am usually an eternal optimist in many situations, but this time it is looking very rough. Yeah, seeing Godly on three stocks to experience his one means that experience might uh, okay, he does get the Nair, so he still has his head in the game, waiting for those follow-ups against Maid. If they can get Zen here, it is technically an even game state by stock numbers alone. Maid, however, severely close to going down to that last stock, potentially of their winner's bracket run. I think they've done very well, is they've always had the team combos on lock on the blue team side, so they can definitely sneak one away. The problem is getting stage at any point in time right now has been so tough. Oh, recoveries from experience, and experience is in a mode right now where he's been holding on to the side of the stage, letting Maid do this front line, and he hasn't lost the stock yet. The neutral to come through from Zen, though, and experience oh destroyed, and now it's four stocks to one, and I've seen some hero 1v2 comebacks, Ajax, but this is, oh, the delay to recovery tries to chase stocks up for the Nair, and Maid can't even get back to the ground. Maid is in the worst possible position. You can ask for four stocks down to one. It would take a miracle to make this happen, and I don't know if it's gonna, as we find that side weapon toss down, you just go all the way down there, you chase and you catch him, and that is a 3-0 victory with basically a head shake. That, that was always going down that way. <laughs> Seeing Zed give Godly the fist bump there and being like, I guess I'm just that good. <laughs> That's one of those situations where I guess made experience being able to win two games in a row from a constant deficit. I'm constantly losing yeah. those first two games and ending up in a victory due to Zen's performance. Having, this was, what, oh, this was the first game that he doesn't do over 600 damage. Oh, a measly 481. Yeah, uh, just an uh, average 481. Always in the midst of it. Always lining it up as we saw in those uh, every combo when he had gauntlets there was one point they actually lined it up he went so far into the skies godly was waiting with the axe recovery to follow up off of a nair that looked like there was nobody to get a follow-up their team co uh, coordination for only playing together so short like like so shortly it's been crazy and i actually want to be able to hear from that in a moment on what have they been doing lately to be able to prep for bcx well let's find out we'll send it over to glitter to be able to talk to zen after an amazing performance 
Thanks, guys. I managed to steal Zen before he escaped off the stage after that incredible 3-0 performance to kick off the day. And I actually had some questions for you specifically because I feel like all weekend we've been watching you absolutely destroy in your 1v2s, completely unfazed in those pressure situations. So talk me through that a little bit. I mean, they're just easy. Everyone's nervous. I'm not, so. Do you think that's what it boils down to? It's more like a confidence thing? Like you're just, you know every time you go into that 1v2 situation that you're going to be the one that wins? Yeah, I'm fine. Everyone's like freaking out. I'm chilling. I know how to win, so. All right, well, I love that. Then I also talk to me a little bit about the synergy with Godly because you guys have looked pretty untouchable so far. We practice for like two weeks because he can play on NA servers and then I mean, we're just both good at the game. We understand each other, so we just know how to play with each other. Well, if it's working so far, obviously now you have solidified the first spot in Grand Finals. You'll be competing for that championship. Are there any other doubles that you are looking at as a potential threat to go against in the Grand Finals? No. Nice and simple. So you're telling me you're taking the whole thing home then? We should be. All right. Well, then we'll have to see if that comes true. Thank you so much for chatting, Zen. Congratulations on making it through to Grand Finals. Back on over to you guys. And Zen there with the absolute confidence saying that, hey, even in these 1v2 situations where all's on the line, I'm in Winner's Finals at BCX 2023, I am not nervous at all. And he has that confidence. He's actually It actually sounds like it gives him that confidence to be able to, like, the fact that I know that my opponents are nervous makes me play that much better. You know, we talk a lot about how Godly's tag kind of fits the bill with how mm. incredibly good he is, but that name is also fitting oh. Zen mode purely calm, no stress whatsoever. That is a key factor being able to play at a top line. Championships are usually won by defense, but the offensive position that he has had, he is not scared of anything. Everyone else is playing afraid. It's a good strat to go into it, and it's pretty impressive to see off of a team that has only practiced for two weeks. As you see, that dominance factor, taking a look down at those early stocks, especially gets experience. A lot of that was hard to come back from. Yeah, and just taking a look at the progress from Zen there as the game goes on, you can tell that his experience is getting more and more beat up by Zen's performance then is just lasting that much longer, taking that much more damage and outputting all that damage. And this is the graph from the previous game that wasn't even the one where he was at that 600 plus damage number yeah. from games one and number two. He was absolutely a carrying force there. And it's actually so fascinating to me that at every single land, this is usually the the the, um, the narrative where whoever's teaming with Godly, it's like, man, Godly, you're really good at singles, but your teammate, <laughs> you're yeah, making them look really, really good. It's a net like plus three buff to all stats. I don't know why, but they just all pick it up a ton. Yeah. And it's impressive to watch because like we said, everybody's eyes are usually on Godly in that team comp, but mm. it's not been the case. It's usually been Godly supporting someone else. And I'm glad that we have to put respect on Zen's name as that team is looking like the team to beat for the entire event. Yeah, and that is exactly what we were talking about before getting here on this, this desk where it's like, wow, there's some really awesome storylines with these teams that have been together throughout the entire year, innovating their own team comps and going crazy. But this international team that was able to practice before BCX and go, wait a second, we understand each other so well that we could potentially win this is now sitting in grands. And so on the elimination side, Ajax, we've got three teams that could potentially be challenging Zen and Godly. And the first two that we're going to be seeing is Radish and Meg D against. Acno and Blaze, oh. who are down there because of Godly and Zen in the first place. And when Acno and Blaze were finally dethroned for a moment from EU, where they were dominating for years, Godly was the one who showed up and pretty much played with kind of whoever he felt like. But at that point, it was also with Fozy and kind of taking that away from them. This time in winners, when they looked untouchable, the number one overall seed of the bracket got knocked down by Godly and Zen. And then the yes. team that you've been really looking at, who have won five straight elimination bracket matches, who beat multiple people who we all assumed would win the whole thing. Yeah, that's Raiders and Meg D. And so what's, man, I'm so fascinated by how the doubles meta is actually shaped up here because we have four teams that have done four completely different ways to approach playing 2v2s and they all think that their way is the best, right? And we're going to be seeing two people that basically innovated a team composition that you'll see a bunch of other people playing and ranked and playing in this world championship because they did it first. And it's going to be Radish and Meg D on, uh, or this is going to be Akno and Blaze actually coming out first, where they're doing Kaya and Olgrim. This has been a staple for Akno and Blaze. This is what they've been doing over in EU. I've seen a lot of other players from the region basically mimic this because of how much success that they get with it. And they're really going against the grain of the idea that Double Gauntlets is supposed to be winning 2v2s this year. Yeah, and I mean, when you look at this core, you're always looking to see Blaze on the old Grim Lad. So a big part of why so many people were able to shift over it for so long. Lance covers so much space. Axe is such a great finisher. You blink and you are at red damage. And Kaya refuses to not only get knocked out, but she's such a great setup character. And then Akno is just 
just doesn't get hit. We think back to that 2v1 that he pulled off last year at BCX where he was able to do a very similar thing. And the only ones who were able to stop that this weekend was Godly and Zen. So I'm curious if that Friday nerves of that set is now gone and if they can now bring that back here in this finals. Day. Yeah, they've had a very long run for the elimination bracket, not quite as long as Raiders and Meg D, but being able to do that so well with the team composition that they play better than anybody else, uh, I'm sure that they're gunning for that rematch to be able to get the double elimination that they would have to on Grand Side if they're able to get through Raiders Meg D, made an experience and beyond. Um, on the other side, though, their opponents, right? Raiders and Meg D, I was talking about how there's this really unique uh, composition coming from them that was the Olgrim and the Kaya. Yep. Radish has basically invented how boots are supposed to be played in 2v2s. This is a team that only started last year at BCX. This is a new team on the, on the block as well, with their most recent performance getting second at Autumn. So they started to pick it up a ton, but there was still a big question mark around them because their individual singles performance wasn't as strong as we were used to seeing at the earlier years. But the run that they have gone through has one of a c category for potential best run in twos. Yeah. Posey and Sarman. What, was the, what, 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 were the score, what was the set scores for those two matches? Game five each time. And oh. then a 3-0 over Luna and Snowy. A 3-1 over Boomstorm. And then a 3-1 over Wes and Ventanquilo to be the other half of stopping South America to get into top four. In the and to be game. able to do that, they fought against two teams that were trying to do boots better than them. And Radish and Magdi said, no, we're actually the best at this composition. Um, and so this is interesting. You mentioned that second place over at Autumns. And watching Radish and Magdi develop as a team over the year has, has given me so much faith that what they're developing Developing and what they're trying to do is actually going to make them into the best North American team in 2v2s going into 2024, if not at the end of this tournament, if they're able to take the championship, right? Because them as a team came together at the beginning of the year. At first I was like, is this just pairing two players that are good at singles together into something? No, in fact, they've taken doubles so seriously that I feel like their singles results have paled by comparison kind because of. they're focusing on the game mode so much. Which is a very good point to, uh, to kind of put in the spotlight there because Meg D is someone we've known for the defensive play style mm -hmm. amongst all players, who is one of the few we can see that timer maybe drop down, but he's actually pretty aggressive overall here in 2v2s. I'm so excited. It, he's leading with the Red Raptor. We were oh, talking about this right before. It's, oh. been a, it's been a lot of Tesca coming out from Raiders, but he is literally like, if you look at the stats of how many weapons Three, have won every championship, two, Orb has been four. won by one player in all of the major regions, and that is Raiders. He has been known for his Orb play better than anybody else, and this character that came out is something that I feel like he has been so perfect with, but he switches between the Tesca depending on the matchup. So we've got the Chun Li and the, and the Red Raptor going up against Kaya and Blaze here in this elimination semifinal. Also, Weebs Unite. I am a massive Red Raptor fan, so I am glad we get to see it at least once. Megdi would like to see the stage if he could. Don't drop that Ooh. early. That would be bad. A giant fist coming through. He has a good amount of coverage range. The biggest mm -hmm. thing is that you don't want to do it too often because you're going to get a massive punish from Acton Blaze. Yeah, and that punish comes through with that side signature, almost taking down that opponent off the top. The D-Lake ground pump is connecting. Acton gets a reversal with the down air. Radius does get the ground pump, but Blaze stops him from getting the finisher there by neutralizing him in the midst of his ground pound, and they take a lead six to four. Everybody should want to have someone like Blaze who has their back. No matter what the situation is, Blaze will always be there to back up Akno and sometimes be even better than Bakno in the game because back back no back <laughs> blaze and echo yeah uh, the way that he is always covering them the communication is just phenomenal they've been playing together for years it's always the most difficult thing to get back on stage when you're hunting after but the favorite thing that i have about asking either of them about each other is that they always tell each other they, they always go to interviews yeah he's the better player yep. <laughs> and they both firmly believe that and they will never agree to disagree on that situation so it's really fun being able to watch them play and you're absolutely right blaze one of the best supporting players if not the best supporting player in 2v2 in the business acno uh here on a fresh stock on his second stock. He's got Meg D almost to the point where he can get him knocked out, but the team combo from Radish and Meg D almost get started there, and if they can focus on Blaze, they might be able to take the lead away from the red team. Yeah, Radish looked like he was trying to line up for a D-Light to send them back over to Meg D, but because Blaze was around him, he couldn't really afford to try and combo extend that. But that's the big key of their team. They need these team combos to be unlocked, but that side air is going to put a bit of a stop to that. And then the pogo from Akno with the weapon throw catches Radish off guard. The D-Light grandpa could knock him down, and Meg D goes there to be able to help Radish get back to the stage, and that side air means that Radish actually gets a ton of damage into the down sig, has Akno take way more damage than he was bargaining for, and now holding on to that stock may give them a chance that Neutralite will disarm Radish off the boots. But he makes it back to the stage and picks up a fresh bear. Meg D has been uh, gaining frequent flyer miles over by that soft platform, but the ground pound is going to be enough to separate them. Get rid of Blaze. Akno will get rid of Radish in the meantime, but Akno is not too far off from being knocked out himself. Yeah, and if he goes down here, it's a dead even game. There's a nice downlight slider from Akno. Oh! He dropped the down there, doesn't quite get it. Goes for the Nair instead, picks nope. up the bow, and Radish now makes it back with that orb recovery. And Meg D tries to get a combo of Blaze, and Akno just saves him. 
notice Zach Noah has kind of pinpointed targeted Radish as often as possible, especially off stage. He kind of understands oh. the platform, but Megdi was ready to follow up. Okay, Blaze has to run for his life. He's looking for the team combo starter, and the thing that's dangerous about Boots, the thing that Radish has basically popularized among all Boots teams is that you don't have to have a sandwich to start a team combo because of the D-Light pivot side air. You go off the side of the stage, you get up a Blaze, oh. takes Radish off the top of the stage, and that combo starter is nowhere to be seen, and now Megdi is trying to make it back down without a dodge, and Blaze gets the down to send him right back up to the top of the stage. That was like the third time he looked for that same situation too, and it finally cashed out, but now, like you said before, that DC covering over if he hops in too early. Akno could go for a ground punt or just wait for him to hop away. There's only so much time you had to play over there. That cider will get the job done. So Ajax, the game plan that I have been highlighting time and time again from Megdi and Radish was nowhere to be seen yep. in that game one. Blaze and Akno are refusing to give them their combo starters. And what makes Radish and Megdi such a terrifying team is that they'll probably lose neutral four times out of five against the teams that they fight against, but that one time that they win, it leads into a team combo, and then they just wipe the stock off the board. If they're not finding those team combos off of the few neutral wins that they're getting, Akno and Blaze are just going to barrel over them. And that's why I think we see that 600 plus damage coming in from Akno, because his main primary target Whoa. was Radish. He if did hunt him down, If yeah. you stop Boots from getting the party started, if you keep Radish locked Three, down, two, how is Meg D one, supposed to finish the combo? That is absolutely right. And we talked a little bit before about how Meg D had started that reputation off as the defensive player. It works very well because of how aggressive Radish is. But when your front line literally can't get any initiation started, you you don't have any team fights afterwards to be able to win the game. So we're going back to the Fortress of Lions here. And Akno, as long as he's keeping the pressure on Radish, Radish isn't getting anything started here for Meg D to be able to follow up. And Blaze does such a good job at stopping Akno of getting out of trouble that they can't find the team combos for the few times that oh, it works unless... Here we go! Here we go. Comes in the and that's Akno. the first one that comes through. And when you catch both of your opponents, how are they going to save each other? And that was so close to being a clean double KO, but they put so much damage on the Akno that the job was done. And they are looking to try and close it out here. Akno going down, but Blaze once again getting in the middle, popping out that cider to say, back off, you're not getting the stock. Oh, and Radish misses the recovery there on the gauntlet. Nair from Meg D could have taken Akno down and Meg D sends flying to the right side of the stage. Now Akno trying to cover Radish's landing and Megdi fighting Blaze off the right side of the stage is at risk of going down to Akno's ground pound. Does make it back and Akno fights back over to Radish. Then that's going to be the pivot stare to the recovery from Megdi. I wonder if he just did a regular stare if it would have knocked out. I, I, it might have knocked out if he just decided to keep it off the side. Yeah, like he really, just did his combo. Yeah, like I was like, oh yeah, he's closer to the last zone, right? Radish ends up going down and Akno actually holds down holds on for a little bit longer until Megdi gets that stare, and the blue team barely has a lead. We talked about that defense from Megdi before. Not only did he get around, he finally gets caught because he put out the neutral light, so uh, Akno is there ready to punish, but it took a very long time for Megdi to finally fall. Right now, both of them just looking to get some ground positioning. Megdi looking for the weapon spawn, but you're not getting through both Spear and Axe in the way. Oh, and now that weapon picked up for Megdi, but he doesn't get the follow-up. Right, okay, Radish actually caught everybody there and hesitated on that follow-up. Nice job stopping off the side light, going to the down tip, but then Akno right over the stay, pivots the end sig. Doesn't quite hit it, and Megdi's trying to make it back with that side light. Side air doesn't quite hit, and Radish still can't get anything started here. Did he get the pivot side air? No, he goes for the down tick and Blaze dodges right through. Can't get any of these finishing blows onto Blaze or Akno, and they are starting to bring the lead back into their favor. Meanwhile, Radish is right in the middle, like right in the fray of everything once again, looking for the recovery, gonna catch Akno at the tail end of it, and Blaze just hunting for a weapon spot oh. anytime soon. But Akno, so good on defense, sneaks his way through, but there we go, the recovery to take one. Do Team we get the on Akno? Pot potentially here, no, Akno oh. waited, did not get caught by the GCD light. Neutral it comes through, Meg D jumps too high for the Nair follow-up, however. Another opportunity here to get some more damage onto Akno, but he dodges down, avoids the Nair from Radish, and Radish can't get anything started here with the down lights. So as long as Akno and Blaze keep playing around that, that side air from Radish is not gonna be able to lead into anything from Meg D, and you can see him posturing, getting ready for the follow-up here on this last stock, and he just can't find it, and that's gonna be a beautiful stock from Akno. The side stick catches Megdi, and Orange takes him down, and Radish goes off the left side of the stage right afterwards, and now it's three stocks to one. I feel like that was one of those situations where you actually tried so hard to get that follow-up. Like you said, Megdi hang oh, was hanging out there that whole time, it ended up leading to a detriment. They had no positioning, and Akno said, well, I'm up a stock. I have no problem chasing you right now, and now I'd be the end of Radish. That's gonna close it out with that side, and they go up 2-0 in the set. Radish and McD can't crack through the defense of Blaze oh. and Akno. I mean, they had that team combo at the very start that almost led into a do double knockout, almost gave them that six to four stock lead, and then they just never found it again. It was almost like Blaze and Akno were like, oh, oh. That was a mistake. We won't let that happen again, and they didn't. And now we're going to be going into game three with only one team combo to see, and it's that here in this highlight. An interesting thing at, beyond this combo, too, is the other team combo they attempted to go for. When that pivot side, are you Save mentioned, Kaya. Uh, get the KO? Three, yeah, two. that 
the GC neutral heavy wasn't enough to do it, but if they got rid of that, they would have been able to pressure Blaze and maybe go up two stocks. Rain is just so team combo brained that he's like, wait a second, it would have been just optimal for me to finish <laughs> the stock, but he really wanted to include Meg D, and much to Meg D's detriment, actually, because uh, Acto ended up making more work with that stock, and Meg D followed down shortly afterwards. Yep. So here we go, game three, Rage and Meg D have to win three games in a row to stay in the tournament. If they're out here, they're out at fourth, then Blaze and Acto will get into top three at the World Championship, and Radish has taken a ton of damage going into this game three. No change of scenery either. We're going to stay here on Fortress Alliance. The Lance recovery will not be enough to do it yet, but they need to figure something out as that's going to go ahead and get rid of that stock. Oh. They're going to get both of them right off the bat. Taza, it's not looking too good. It's not looking too good. It's not a great start. And if they can't have that lead from the very beginning, they have not shown that they have the comeback potential to come against Akno and Blaze here at the World Championship. Lots of damage coming in from Radish. If all that ground pound hits, he gets the end sync. It does blast both of them away. d in the end sync. Saved by Blaze. He's ready to cancel side light. He does go down, but that was the biggest brain save I've ever seen. That save was so good. And then Radish to position for the save as well to get the follow up was also incredible. And to avoid the sidelight afterwards, both teams playing around each other so well. It's still a huge lead for the red team, however, because Blaze did manage to hold on to a stock after that save went through. And Radish and Meg D have both been taking a just Hits here and there as Acto and Blaze fight for the extra credit. The recovery comes through. Okay, team combo opportunity. If he gets that D-Light pivot there, that could be it for Acto's stock. Radish looking for that setup, but Blaze manages to kick him away, and they can't get anything good started past that two-piece combo. Or if you got a game, you got a chance, and they could definitely make it happen here, but they got to play immaculate lead. There we go. This team is combo to neutral light. Gets the side again. Gets the end up, end sync, Acto. Sync. That's going to do it. That's such a clean that stock coming up for the blue team, and that was Acto's fresh stock. Okay, and he almost had the boots recovery as well to get rid of Blaze. They were about to go up, so by no means whatsoever, they added this just yet. All right, Meg D gets hit by that neutral light, and if Radish and Meg D can find more of those trained combos, Meg D goes down to one, but it's still an even game. Radish hits Blaze off the right side of the stage, the grab hook connects, and he gets his stock during the 1v2. If Meg D can find this weapon, perfect spawn, Radish can get the starter. Good what can he do? For Radish to re recognize too after that weapon toss to get back in there. The down air? The, the ground pound? The, the down one. air goes to the ground pound oh, again. He flies off the stage and now he's down to one stock. Yeah, all right, he wasn't deep in the red, so it was he was looking for the trade off. Acto makes it back. You just got to make sure that doesn't get to you. Neutral light. Okay, Mekdi doesn't follow up, but Akno has taken a ton of damage. He did make it back from that edge guard, but, you know, Radish still did a lot of damage getting him to that position. He and, and Radish have been doing really good at sandwiching the two of them. They're constantly getting positioning. They're just looking for that one starter, and Akno and Blaze are kind of looking at the caves that they've been trapped in regularly yeah. here on this last stop. This is the first time that I've seen these two actually be a little shook in this game state, right? Akno staying on the right side of the stage, not wanting to initiate, waiting for Blaze to get something started, and really the red team isn't finding anything, and Radish and Mekdi are just looking for that sandwich like you're talking about. A little bit of a burn there on Mekdi, but nothing afterwards. And that slider will send Ekno off stage. Blaze now has to cover his way back to Ooh. the alley. was so close to hitting. That was so close to catching that slider. That might have stole all this momentum. They have a wave. Ekno has great positioning. And we're going to oh. go through lights there, pushing Meg D back. Been recovery. Chance to jump Radish. Radish is not gone yet. Meg D has to hold his own in a 1v2. The down stick avoided once. Goes with the down stick there from Meg D. And he gets Pogo sared. Meg D has to make it back to the stage. But the bike oh. from Radish runs right over Blaze. And now the edge guard from Meg D does whiff. Can Radish get this edge guard? Down air avoided. Ground pound avoided. But the stare comes through. And now Acto has to make it back into an edge guard against Megdi and Radish. But you don't give the young man a license. He drove right through him. He's going to go ahead and try and close it out with the cider, but he has to back off because uh, the recovery was not in position. However, Ooh. Acto has won many a 2v1s in himself in the past. That might not happen as the cider will close it out, and we still have a set. I love that that's how they're able to win that game because the biggest criticism that people had to give Radish's Red Raptor is like, bro, you got to stop grabbing and canceling that side stick. And he owes the first leg that he throws it out. It not only clutches that stock, but brings them to a game four here in the elimination semifinal, stopping the 3 0 and giving them the momentum to potentially bring this to a game five. That's one of those options where it looks awesome if it hits. He looks so goofy if you Three, mess it up, but it's one of the coolest one, options that he pulled out as a one trick pony at the last second. If you could have them not prepared for it, it works, but now it's going to be on their mind as the set progresses. Yes, and now they're going to have to play around that quite a bit as we're going back to the Fortress of Lions. This seems to be the stage that they want to play on for the entirety of the set. Blaze and Akno have Radish on the right side of the stage, and he avoids narrowly the neutral signature from Akno. That could have been a 30-second stock. Akno's always ready to pull the trigger on it, too, so you have to be careful at any given time, especially on recovery as well. Blaze sandwiched between the both. Akno actually kind of hitting him to prevent him from maybe getting followed up. Either way, though, Akno and Blaze constantly getting put between the two, and 
not controlling Sage as well, but they've been getting Duke their damage where they can. Yeah, because the Saren to the Nair, they want to get those grounded combos started here, and Rage has been keeping them in the air with these recoveries. Meg D playing on the platform as well. No sideline starters here. Finds one. No. Ends up getting sent off the side of the stage by sideline Sare from Blaze. That's going to be the lead for the red team, and Meg D tries to get a sideline recovery and fails. Akno with the double recovery gets punished. Radish following his opponent as he chases after his teammate and getting a great revenge knockout. Yeah, great awareness too, chasing after that, not letting him let that rock, because that could have been an opportunity for Akno to just freely fall back to stage. Mm -hmm. And now Raiders sending Blaze into Akno. Akno stops the knockback from beginning stronger. Gets the down air there. Accidental friendly fire as he's thrown over that side air. And Radish actually can't get the D-Light side air because Blaze comes through with that side air, puts Akno back onto the stage, and Meg D can't follow up with an air afterwards from what would have been a really great combo starter. And Meg D been struggling just to get an opener against Blaze. Blaze Whoa. Is always paying attention to Meg D's positioning. Here we go again. The satellite coming Ground pound, down air. Dead ground pound. Is that it for Akno? Blaze double. goes up to the save and he gets a double knockout. Meg D with the clutch edge guard. 1v2 brings it to a huge lead. Happy birthday to you. That's the the best gift I could have ever asked for. That was one and two. The team and combo. The pivot there. Here. The down six DI downwards. Akno taking a ton of damage on this fresh stock, and he could be out of the game here while Radish and Megdi have four stocks to play with. You know, we talked about it before with that maiden experience lineup. This is also a team that went through multiple game fives against multiple of the best seeded teams throughout this tournament. It seems like they're able to play the long game and their stamina is kicking in, but is it going to be enough, Taza, to get the job done? I don't know. Radish and Megdi look warmed up. They're hitting more of those team combos that I told you about that they have so much success with an Akno and Blaze are struggling more and more to be able to keep up. Puts down that, that side light. Blaze put off the right side of the stage. Has to go to recovery to get back to stage. And Akno's in that mode again where he's holding on to the right side of the stage and he's not really going for any starters. That side that catches. He has to interrupt, but look how much damage he's taking in the meantime. Radius has been refusing to get hit over the last like 30 the seconds. There. Like, yeah, catches the back. both. That's one. And it comes through and Blaze goes down to one stock. Akno takes a ton of damage as that Sare kicks them both towards Meg D's neutral signature. We are ever looming towards a game five. We have five stocks to two. Radish refuses, excuse me, five stocks to four. Radish finally falls. Meg D has also been very elusive. Let's see if we can try and avoid that to make sure they have this big lead. Yeah, red team has one out to stop this from going to a game five. And that is focusing Radish down while Meg D gets knocked to the side. Sidelight Sider, however, means that Radish is still tacking on a ton of damage here on this stock. And that Nair into Sare from Meg D means a ton of damage is going to go back over to Blaze. Akno, is that the stock from Akno? It is, and the sidearm on Blaze follows shortly afterwards. All the weapons from the stage flies through, and Radish and Megdi bring it to a game five. Perfectly line drive toss right down to them. It seemed like they were down and out at a few points, especially when they went down so early in that game, but that is not how it played out all the way through. They've been able to keep themselves composed. A lot of damage coming in from Meg D. Although Radish only put up 400, it doesn't matter. The big crucial factor is from that 600 he was doing before, only 261 done by Akno that game. They shut him down. Yeah, the edge guard Three, there was two, devastating for Meg D when Blaze came down to save him. All it ended up doing was giving Magdi the opportunity to take two stocks instead of one. And now we're on Fortress Alliance for game number five. The loser of this is out at fourth. Winner of this goes on to fight. Made it experience in the elimination final. Let's see who's going to take it. Radish and Magdi are on the verge of a reverse 3-0 against EU's finest doubles team. This is also EU's pure final hope because Godly in that international team. So this is the only Ooh. team that they have left here in the bracket. And they trying to send one of their last hopes out. And the team combo to make these a really great start. Gets that uh, follow-up with the D-Line Sider. Ray just trying to fight Akno at the left side of the stage. And the reversal from his Pogo is going to give them a double knockout. Four stocks to six here for the blue team. Minimal damage taken at that two. Last time they were able to bring it back, it was in a similar spot. But can you do that two games in a row against a team like Akno, Akno and Blaze is the big question that yes, they have to answer. That is the big question to answer, right? And the only chance I think they have is this. Ooh. Is the Sarah both of them neutral? Like them through down to get the neutral stick. And Radish and Meg D show them why they are so dang good at this doubles combo, right? Having the Chun-Li and the Red Raptor, all the setups from any situation, and the Sair from the boots. Radish, I don't know how he does it. He magnets Blaze and Akno together, and he makes those team combos always work. Have to be smiling as a team after something like that when you just got stomped your first stock, and they answer right back so quickly. We we're back to an even game. That kind of felt like the, you know, the steam was kind of taken away from him. Absolutely not. It just takes one good Radish side air, and Megdi knows exactly what to do. Blaze with the recovery, though, catches Radish. Radish off guard, sends him down to tournament stock. Agni has been very difficult to hit for a good amount of time, so he's going to keep playing elusive just like before. That's going to allow Radish to try and look for that big combo starter because Blaze pretty damaged himself. They could definitely get rid of that pretty soon. 
Akno going for that recovery. Oh no, oh! Magni with the stare, and Akno gets the reversal. That DLI recovery is gonna take Magni down to one stock, and now it's four stocks to two. Oh, can Radish and Magni do it again? Ah. The, the stare comes through, and he doesn't catch Blaze. They, they need a miracle team combo. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, you, you used it once, can you do it twice? That's gonna be the big question they have to answer, and that has not been too easy of an answer to catch. Blaze looking for one of them, does not get the axe recovery he was looking for. It. Falling there comes through, Blaze takes more damage on the, onto Magni, gets the recovery, follow up from that boots down there. Blaze could go down here, but the new stick is avoided. Recovery does hit Akno out of his recovery, they need to take a stock now, Ajax. And they, they're trying to get that same sandwich position we talked about pri uh, previously, but there goes one. It's an opportunity to try and go ahead and get oh. Akno. They need to catch him on the soft platform, but Akno, weapon toss through, sneaks his way to the other side long enough for Blaze to get back. Okay, they're not too concerned with who they get caught by the combo starter here. It doesn't really make a difference if it's Blaze or Akno. They're going to get their damage through. Sideline and recovery stopped by Akno's wake up uh, Nair, but the weapon is sent out of his hands from the gauntlet's recovery. It's crazy how even with them having the lead, you can see how afraid and like like respectful they're playing, because yeah. they know if they make one mistake, they're getting Ooh. team combo off to the side, and that boots recovery getting close. Akno's gonna catch Meg D. Meg D has to be very careful about how he comes back. Akno going for the edge guard here. If Akno goes down, while Radish makes it back to the stage, the 2v1 combo on the Blaze could be huge. Okay, Blaze has run for his life. He goes to the platform. Radish doesn't have the boots, though. He can't go for the reversal on the D-line side air. Okay, Akno makes it back. And deep breaths going all throughout. Hold at the moment, because even with that red damage they have, we've already seen all they need is one mistake, but that D-Sync will get rid of it. It's on Radish. Radish and he, gets down, and he gets one. Does he finish it out? The back thing of Blaze's recovery ends up hitting Akno, but the recovery from Akno gets them the win, and Akno and Blaze stop the reverse sweep and get a win for EU here at BCX making it in the top three. What an incredible job from Acto and Blaze to answer right back after they had such a hot start. They got team comboed. That'll kind of mess you up a little bit mentally. And then they took another huge lead right away. And they did not let Radish get that 2v1 because he was looking very good at the end there. But this is why this is such a strong stable team for so many years, our number one overall seed. And they want to get back. How to remarkable to it was for Radish to be able to find Acno and Blaze in the same position to get them with that boot sider multiple times over the set. And that team combo, that team synergy from Meg D and Radish nearly won them the set over the best team in EU. They go down in game five at fourth, however. But man, what a remarkable journey from Radish and Meg D, considering that the length, the the length of time that Akno and Blaze have been teaming with each other over the past few years, uh, Radish and Meg D as a team that formed for 2023, that's going to be a terrifying team. You mentioned it before it started, and you are so right on that. I think we are looking at potentially NA's future best twos team. Their coordination has been so good. There, are, there were moments in time where it felt like they did just overly didn't want to engage, but it's so hard to do against something like Acton and Blaze, but their team communication gets better and better. This run they went on this weekend was so impressive. Even though they're not going to be happy with falling here, you know that's going to feel good when you think back on it going into next season. Oh, and look at the, the team combos there. That was the game state where it was six stocks to four. They were like, what are they going to do? They need a miracle. Oh, and there it was being able to get that knockout, but they are out at fourth. But man, Radish and Meg D, absolutely a fan favorite after today. I mean, they, like you said, having that second place in the Autumn Championship and then being able to bring that performance here at BCX, no less, beating all those teams in the elimination side on Saturday to be able to bring it here. Uh, was such a fantastic run. We look at the stats of that last game, and it was just a remarkable performance coming out. Yeah, the, back now. the kid is good, and what a different like cooperation of play styles. Like you said, what a very aggressive player in Radish, a very passive defensive player in Megdi, where they have both meshed together very well, but it wasn't enough against the team synergy of Akno and Blaze, EU's strongest defense that they still have. Uh, they were dominant for so many years for such a good reason. It wasn't until Godly showed up that really kind of changed things up, but even last year at BCX, they didn't get to be the ones to hold the trophy at the end of the weekend. If I remember correctly, I believe that they actually fell at third or fourth. It was around that spot and it was Boomy and Snowy ended up taking it all. You know they have a chip on their shoulder. They do not want to be in that same spot staring at someone else hoisting that trophy up. Yes, well, the World Championship team from 2022 is no longer a threat here, and a new champion team is going to be crowned, and only three teams remain to find out who that's going to be, and the matchup that we've got coming up next after the break is going to be Blaze and Akno versus Made and Experience. Speaking of that, we will be going to a short break. We'll be right back with Elimination Finals after a moment.
Welcome back to BCX 2023. 2v2 Championships is underway as we just saw one of the teams fall in the elimination semifinals. That was the incredible run from Meg D and Radish that just went down to EU's finest at Acno and Blaze. Yes, and so that means EU's got two, a team and a half coming into this top three, right, with three players from North America and three players from Europe to see who's going to be able to take the entire crown. And Ajax, I believe we're going to be having a word with the two teams that are going up against each other. Let's go over to Glitter to talk to Acno and Maid before this head-to-head -head gets started. Thanks so much, guys. That's right. We're hanging out before we get into this elimination bracket finals. I've got Acno. First question for you as well. Obviously, phenomenal performance in your last match. Coming into, into this one now, are you on like a little bit of a high? Do you feel incredible after, after that win? I won't say incredible, but it did feel good. That was some good practice. Yeah. Good warm-up. All right, Maid, I want to ask you, obviously, now still have an opportunity to keep your hopes of making it through to Grand Finals alive, but it's not a lot of time to recover between these matches, right? So what is your kind of mental strategy to keep yourselves in a really good spot for this match? Well, we're just taking it set by set, game by game. We can't have to look, we can't look at it too, like, far ahead. We just got to look at it game by game, and that's how we're going to take it. All right, got to keep those vibes high every single time. Now, everything is on the line here for both of you, and you've had phenomenal runs throughout the entire tournament. Any words for your opponents before you get into it? Good luck, and let's see where this goes. Yeah, it's good luck, we're just gonna play our best. All right, guys, this is gonna be a match you do not want to miss. I'll let you go get set up and ready for the Elimination Bracket Finals. Back on over to the desk. That's Acno and Maid. Bit. Send them, telling each other, GG, good luck, have fun, right before the set comes through. They're in top three. It's like, yeah, this is the world championship, but if we, if we think about this too hard, we're going to get out of focus. We're going to get out of the zone. So they just want to be able to get down there, sit down, talk about their game plan, and get ready to go to the next game. And Ajax, that cheering that's happening over on the side, what's that about? Yeah, no BGs to be found, not up uh, stage, but also on the side stream as well, as there is go. Uh, that set was Sandstorm and Yu's going on over there. Make sure you check out twitch.tv slash Brohalla to see the single side of top 32 that is happening as well. Yes, but here back into the double side, getting the top three. This is going to be EU's best team going up against the last remaining true North American team here from Made in Experience because we've got that international team waiting in the grand finals that is Zen and Godly. And so we're going to find out whether it's going to be three NA players or three EU players here in grand finals at BCX 2023. And Made mentioned taking it game by game. Well, they have a lot of games to think about because they have run into Acno and Blaze in the past year at BCX. They were the ones who stopped them at fourth place. And then at DreamHack San Diego, they were double eliminated by Acno and Blaze. For that second, they were the ones who got all the way to Grants and looked like they were going to finally get that big dub and then they didn't close it out. But that means they have a lot of understanding of what they need to do to make that happen. So I'm curious on what their approach is going into this set. Even though they just fell, there's a lot of time to adapt. Yeah, and that lifetime score there, that 3-0 includes all the matches that you talked about, right? Because be being on different, literally different continents coming in here to be able to play against each other in the World Championship, the only opportunities they get to play are really at LAN. And so far, Acno and Blaze have gotten the upper hand every single time. So this would be a huge win for Maiden Experience to have the momentum to go up into that rematch against Godly and Zen if they're able to take down Acno and Blaze for the first time here at PCX. And they have a history of getting the upper hand on many people, as we saw. Those gold medals, primarily from 2v2s from Acno and Blaze, they would like to have a trophy to add to that case as well from BCX. Everybody getting prepped. Obviously, these scores for the chat are going out, and we are 70% in favor of Acto Blaze. It's looking a little bit rough, but they have been able to do it before. Maybe this is the time where they finally get that dub. Yes, and so they're going to be, like Maid said, taking that game by game, not letting that last set really get to them, just w trying to figure out how they're going to be able to fight against the team that is Blaze and Acno. We've got two, uh, basically the two team, we were talking about how Radish and McD innovated the, the boots and the gauntlets. This is the team that established that Kaya and Olgram is a staple twos team against the team that literally invented Chronix that turned into what is now the Zonix with the Zariel and the Onyx going head to head to see who's going to be going up in the Grands. And Blaze and Acno are the one remaining team here that's going to fight against the narrative that Double Gauntlets is the only thing that you can play if you want to win a 2v2 tournament. Yeah, and it shows this the uh, the, the ability for Made to kind of fold into any position too, because Experience has always had the strong cannon play. We've seen it from the Zolan company in the past. But with Made, he alternates to what he needs Final. to use. And right now, they need to alternate to a victory if they want to keep this bracket Three, run alive as two, the elimination one. finals of BCX starts now. 
And here we go, game number one on Apocalypse. We've got Acno and Blaze, of course, on Kai and Olgrim against Maid and Experience on Onyx and Double Jin. And the Dares coming out from Experience on the left side of the stage are being challenged by Acno offstage. And already Experience opening up with would have been a devastating combo if Acno didn't expertly dodge out of the way of that slider that followed. That could have been a very quick stock, as we saw. They were able to adapt very fast after that happened to them with Radius to make these. So they have the mental fortitude to play around that. But that is going to be a big play that's going to happen often. Experience is going to want to look offstage as often as he can. But right now, that's the only place he has been throughout this match. Oh, an experience falling down there with that down air. Tries to get some more follow up. The Nair interrupted by the down line from Akno on the platform. Stops that combo from going any further. And experience dodges one Nair with the Gravity Cancel Delight, but can't uh, uh, dodge the second attack coming out from Akno to be able to take that first stock off of the blue team. Can Maid make it back? Goes for a Gravity Cancel Ensign to make it back to the stage and gets the Alley Group on Akno's first stock. Aid is very difficult to knock out sometimes, so he holds onto a stock for a good amount of time. And speaking of, he actually gets rid of Akno first after dodging that GC Neutral Light and that Cider from before. Made is a big key staple to keeping the blue team's mentality in check as long as he can hold that lead. Neutral Light comes in from experience, goes out that ground pound, lets it go early, and Blaze takes down Made up the right side of the stage. Akno goes for the down <laughs> sync, and Blaze jumps in with a dashed up pivot side air to be able to get the combo off the wall and experience, and experience is still taking a ton of damage while trying to make it back. Akno with such clever offstage game plans. Blaze does fall, it's his first stock, and Akno and Blaze have almost got experience down to his last. Yeah, experience was in the middle of the frame, he's still back in the frame too, he's gonna catch that Nair, he's gotta get around the weapon toss, oh. so I, I, that weapon toss saved his life. It saved his life, Made trying to end that stock with that ground pound, but Experience is not able to follow up, and he goes down. Akno, however, out of jumps, doesn't keep track of those recoveries, goes down, and now it's even across the board. We take that every day of the week, hashtag we take those, because that could have been a much bigger lead for them, but now we're back to a, a purely even game. Yeah, Nairs from Experience, trying to catch the landings there from Blaze. Down line will keep him in the air, and doesn't get the side light onto Maid for the team combo, but instead hits Experience, and that down tick only avoided, because Maid stayed perfectly stacked. Again, Maid's, uh, Maid is just really Whoa. good at mental awareness right there. He catches Blaze on his way back up. They might be able to catch Akno here, too, looking for that Nair, but that weapon toss down again. Akno's been very difficult to hit overall throughout the set. The ground pound hits Maid as he holds, uh, hovers over the right side of the stage, and Experience gets caught by the team combo. No! Blaze Ooh. end lights the wrong way, and Akno ends up having to go for some friendly fire. Dodge forced out by the double weapon throw. Akno was looking for an opportunity to bow ground pound, and Maid helps Experience get back to the stage, but the back swing of the recovery plays so good at getting that sweet spot to get that knockout means that they're in a one be two against Maiden in game number one. Maid can make it happen. He's done it before, but Akno Blaze have the prime position here. This is what you don't want to see. Kaya on the front, Blaze on the back. You get out, watch out for that Axe DC at any time. If you get past Akno, for that matter, if you even can, as that's going to be the first game going to Akno and Blaze. Akno is precise and merciless with those bow down airs. That entire edge guard was just three well placed stairs back to back to back, hitting him to the side of the stage, knowing that the, no the knockback was going to be strong enough that he wasn't going to be able to make it back afterwards. And I see you like, taking a look at a few yep. particular stats from that. I always have to pull that up as quickly as possible because not only did Akno put up 600 damage, Three, but 279 for Maid roll. being shut down the whole time. Experience spent, spent most of that game kind of in the fray. It looked like he was going to take the most damage, but Maid, although he was getting being hard to hit, he wasn't getting anybody in the midst of it as well. Yeah, and now we're going to game number two with Blaze and Akno having a very strong lead, and we've seen before in situations like this where it looks like it's going to be a lead for the blue team end up falling short because of offstage exchanges. It can sometimes look a little rough for a team like Experience and Maid, who are so momentum-based when it comes to this far into the bracket. Let's see if Experience is able to bring it back, and he can. Look at that ground pound. Catches Akno sleeping off the right side of the stage, and that's an er super early first strike. That's what you need to avoid happening if you're the red team, because every time that they got those game five victories in the previous set, it was on the back of Experience starting to pick up, uh, pick up those situations. Whoa, and Experience seems to be playing with a lot of rage behind him there, because these team combos that are coming out after that ground pound are devastating. Akno already in orange. Maid can't make it back, but he's not getting caught, and he almost takes down Blaze during that 1v2. Blaze was some uncharacteristic friendly fire on Akno means that Experience holds on to this first stock and is only taking Axe sidelights for his trouble. Yeah, very on point with the uncharacteristic. He does not hit Akno very often at all. Team damage was minimal in that last game, and that is how they always succeed. May trying to line it up for Experience, not able to capitalize himself to try and maybe get rid of Akno, who's already about to find his last stock in a moment. Yeah, made sidering Blaze, sidering Akno off the right side of the stage. Let's see if they can get the stock here. Akno being the weak link in game number two. Experience just hits him with an unarmed neutral light, but he can't find the stock in the side six from Maid do go punished. That spear recovery bringing a lot of damage in. That D-Light Nair will knock him out. 
Neutral Sick dunks him off the right side of the stage. It's four stocks to three here. We needed to see this after what happened in the winner's side. It was starting to feel like the, the, they were kind of slowing down a bit, but that is not the case here. They've been picking it up a ton. Meanwhile, though, they've been struggling a little to get back on, but even on arms, experience is right in the middle of it. Yeah, Made going up for that recovery, goes to the Nair. Neutralsic does not catch him. Blaze goes back up to the top of the stage, picks up the Lance, looking for that falling stair, and experience blasts him on the way back down. Two downers in a row. That's a good amount of damage coming into Blaze's second stock, but Akno's done such a remarkable job keeping away, letting Blaze play that front line because he knows that what, a, what a huge deficit that he's at. That's an opportunity to try and get rid of Made, but that there's gonna come through, just kind of, excuse me, drop out coming through, just kind of shut down the Akno. And they're looking for an opportunity maybe to get some damage on experience, but look at oh. his play this time, though they finally catch Made by shifting Combo. focus. Oh, experience. I thought he was gonna get caught by that ladder combo there, but instead he goes for the gravity cancel end light and puts out a cannon ground pound to try to catch somebody getting back to the stage. Blazing off the left side of the stage. Does he go over with Made? He tries. The ground pound gets interrupted with the last recovery, and then the spear weapon throw from Akno allows Blaze to make it back on scale. There you go. There's a the recovery oh. up the top. Now they have a 2v1 situation, and although they do have experience deep in the red and he does fall it is going to be his last stock fresh against both of them being pretty much untouched yeah both of them being untouched made an experience here against blaze in the 1v2 now blaze does level up in these scenarios in a team combo situation a little too much knockback for that end to be able to follow through and once experience and made are able to clean up this stock i imagine that it's going to be very very tough for blaze on Olgrim to be able to navigate a 1v2 like that not the best uh, weapon combination exactly. for that situation yeah axe and lance both very committal and you're basically looking for straight hit run straight hit run and hope that they kind of hit each other in the midst of it so you could get both of them at the same time and carry them off stage and now here he is in the 1v2 looking for the nair to bring him back down to the stage so that the team combo can get started double gauntlets means they have to be careful about di so they can't stack two end lights in a row but there's still plenty that they can do with the signature kit cider ends up clicking uh clipping experience but another team combo comes with that neutral light and uh all right actually a few flubs there you know shifted target but was a debate <laughs> the ground pound for blaze did seem like a i'm buffering a get out yeah, of here yeah, yeah. Tool. <laughs> and then they ended up sidering him right as he tried to go for an immediate recovery and that's going to be the win so main experience even up the set one to one yeah it worked out for them because they did accidentally hit each other there could have been a free side air back on stage for uh blaze in that position but they ended up taking full advantage of that and for the first time in a little bit we saw them looking not only coordinated, but it looked like Three, they were playing much two, more confident, much one, like you said, where experience was almost playing angry in some of those team combos. Yeah, it was a really nice uh, a change of pace to see, where I saw experience go down pretty brutally in game number one, and then in game number two, he decided to play better uh, than Akno in his own game offstage, gain that early cannon ground pound, and then bring him down to one stock super early on as well. Uh, Blaze and Akno now are going into game number three with renewed vigor here. They're going to change their game plan to adapt against the fact that experience is playing much more aggressive than he did at the opening of this set. Now with that falling down, tries to get the Nair interrupt to Akno from being able to get any more follow-up on the Maid. They're able to save Maid from harm's way, but this is still looking rather rough for uh, one team member on either side. Akno on the red team and Maid on the blue team. Nice neutral stick, however, and it does combo into experiences already begun uh, gauntlet neutral lane. And Maid was uh, taking a little bit of time to be able to actually engage in battle, but at the uh, right where he needs it that time, though not so much the Pogo is going to not be enough yet, but they do have position. Blaze trying to sneak one down there, and Maid still having some trouble getting back on. Oh, side light comes through, Maid gets Pogo, and now experiences avoid the team combo. Okay, the end light comes through, but Blaze is punished with the side stick. It's not going to knock out, but all of that damage means that experience can't make it back to the stage in time to be able to do anything with that stock, and then he goes down shortly afterwards, and now Maid has to run for his life. Great job again from the red team. Anytime they go down with an L and it looks like things are a little rough, they rebound so fast each match as we see them close out those first two stocks. Blaze separating Maid immediately away so Akno can continue to pressure experience off stage. Nairus from Akno does connect. Maid sent into the yellow. They still have not taken a stock off of the red team. The sideline, a little bit of confusion there. Experience and Maid both didn't want to follow up off that neutral interaction and now they're taking some extra credit damage. Finally, Nair comes through. Blaze gets hit by that side okay the the nice job with the nair into the, to the chase dodge side air but acno stopped the team combo from happening there and yep. blaze is still holding off yeah the unarm and light just to go ahead and shut that down not let them jump them but they do get rid of both of them with minimal damage taken can they take it back now though experience looking for a side air maybe going for a chase instead going for the down air oh, this is brutal okay experience does get a really great combo actually on the blaze but the platform stops him from being able to get a five piece string falls a little low and acno doesn't want to challenge experience on the left side of the stage anymore he focuses instead all the way over onto maid Edge guard opportunity. Experience misses the Sayer. Blaze and flying from the top of the stage. Who's going to go down next, AJ? And no KO off the top. Instead, it ends up being Akno who reverses their entire misfortune they were having for a little bit there, taking out experience. Made can fall pretty soon, too. He has to watch out for Blaze as he tries to maybe focus on Akno. Blaze can't take oh. it out anytime. 
Made barely surviving after that side stick. Throws him off to the top of the stage from center. Blaze looking for a side air. No, just a neutral light. Almost knocks down his own team combo. Just gets to the little alley-oop. Akno got what he could from that positioning and experience. Possibly spikes Blaze here. No, he dodges past the Nair and he can't get the he can't finish off the stock. Well timed for Blaze, but as he falls so shortly, does made after Akno still holding on to that second stock. And like we said before, Akno can be very difficult sometimes in these positions to get a hit on. So maybe the focus is to start to go after Blaze. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting uh, following how these matches have been playing out, because I guess if Akno doesn't get hit by a cannon ground pound at yellow, he ends up having two stocks over everybody else, and now experience. If he gets hit by, a, what, unarmed D-Light Cider? Ooh, okay, the pivot Cider, there's huge. Akno can't make it back. Blaze, if he gets hit by this 1v2 combo. This actually changes the entire pace of the game. Akno falling in that position. Starter? They can definitely get a big combo no. here with the interrupt again from Akno. But he ends up hitting Blaze with the down stick, actually. The damage still coming through. Blaze goes for the wake-up ground pound, interrupts what Blade was uh, made was doing to him, and that Cider will take experience down, and now Ajax, this looks like match Point is going to go towards Akno and Blaze as a side to cuts through Maid's last stock. The moment you commit to getting any single hit on my teammate, I'm going to punish you for it. That's exactly what they needed to capitalize on. Maid has been able to showcase that his 2v1s have been pretty good throughout the tournament, but in that position, it's very tough when you're already in the red and Ulgrim is looming. And now, Maid and Experience are at match point. One more loss here, and they're out at third against the team that they have yet to be able to get a set win here. They want to be able to get this to move in to grand finals Three, with Blaze and Akno. Two, this is one, the BCX that they're looking to take for the very first time. And now we're going into game number four against Experience and Maid, who have, for the first time in a long time, changed up their strategy here. Going over with Experience onto the Rayman. Nothing. Off of the Onyx, it, it's no longer Zonix here. It has actually been stopped. I have, I have never seen a team switch off of Zonix. Yeah, I mean, not just that. It, something had to give. They, they, they've been playing the same strat this whole time, and it's been such a good core, but they have been getting shut down by Akno Blaze. It feels like the experience is feeling like the Axe matchup is the better play at this point. Okay. We'll see if that actually plays out. I mean, so far, experience goes down first. Maid almost goes down second. I'll narrowly avoid that team combo coming out from them. And yeah, this is really interesting. Maybe taking a, a, a note out of uh, uh, of, of Godly's book here because he was leading with this Rayman, but he, he's off the left side of the stage. He could go down here. Oh no! He ends up hitting Maid, and Akno is just destroying Experience here. Luckily for them, they were able to get back on stage somehow. But Experience has been getting jumped this entire set already oh. on the second stock. Might go down to his last one if that oh. has, that's going to find it. GC D Light wasn't even enough. It didn't matter though because he got the ground pound to follow up from Blaze, and now they are down three stocks to six. It is not looking good. Yeah, this pocket Rayman pick is ending up uh, costing Experience all of his stocks, and Akno and Blaze seem to be knowing that they've got this win in the bag at this rate. Let's see if they have a chance to be able to bring this back. Goes off the left side of the stage. Akno just recovers right underneath the Apocalypse, and Blaze holds onto center so that Akno can pick up the spear. I know Akno and Blaze playing phenomenally once again. Even sitting here in this lead, they're constantly interrupting, constantly getting in the way. They're going to at least finally see one fall. Oh, man, and Blaze goes down, but Akno, he might take down experience on the game completely before he would go down on the stock. The Pogo goes for the weapon, tosses the gravity cancel, D-Light ground pound. Maid does go for the weapon throw, Akno still holds on. No, D-Light ground pound will take him down, okay. A stock being taken here, and if Blaze goes down afterwards, this is actually an even game. Experience has brought it back a little bit, but that that combo might be too much. I understand agree. This is not as far what? now. It is very far off. Also, this is not as far off as it was before, but Experience going to fall already. Made left to his own. Two stocks to four. I have seen miracles happen before, but this one... The fully charged Kaya one. neutral sig from center stage. The chainsaw coming out from Blaze on the old group, and Akno and Blaze both sitting in there just waiting to collect their grand final spot against Zen and Godly as Maid is now in a 1v2 one stock to four. Let's see that team combo come out from Blaze and Akno. See if they can get the job done here. Maid is just trying to find ground if he can. Not looking too hot as that side comes through. Looks for the dare. Can he get around both of them? He does, but only for a moment. And we're going to see Akno fall. Hey, if Blaze does that as well, maybe there's hope. Bade them off stage with the gravity cancel side stick three times. Ooh, okay. Beat him. He actually catches Blade. Is Blaze done for? Okay, no. If he got hit by that spike, it might have been a problem. Akno, after that stock goes down, goes like, you know what, Blaze? Let's just neutral him on the other side of the stage. Get the sandwich set up. They've been in this situation before, but made fighting back quite well. Here's the thing. Don't let it be you in that position. You will never be able to live past this moment if Made is able to make this comeback. But what a, a miracle of a comeback it would be. I also feel like the end light must make it look like he could go get a punish and then jump in with the axe end light himself. And that's going to be another place. one. Okay. They're down to the last two stocks. He's taking two stocks on his own. Made fighting for his life here at this game number four. But he's one hit away. That pogo almost combos into something. Neutral light connects. Can Made make it back this time for one more chance. 
Joker at a window where any mistake will be in. The Cider will get the job done. Akno and Blaze secure their seat in the Grand Finals. And that's going to be a three, three out of four players in Grand Finals of VCX 2023 coming up from Europe. I know there's a lot of chatter about North America. There's a lot of chatter about South America potentially being able to get into this top three in twos as well. But Europe looks to be standing on top here with Godly and Zen on the winner's side going up against Acno and Blaze. We're going to get that rematch against them as this is going to be one of the greatest EU Grand Finals that we could be looking for here at the World Championship. And this is, uh, again, history continues to repeat itself for the team of Experience and Made. They were able to get back up to a close position to the top, but stopped once again by Acno and Blaze. I did ex my anticipation was them getting up to third, but they looked so good that it might have been a different case. But Acno and Blaze are now 4-0 lifetime against them. As you talked about, it's an international team lineup, but they have to do something in the future to figure that out. Right now, it's about taking those notes back home. They need a North American team to pick up uh, Kaya and Olgrim. <laughs> yeah. This team composition is not seen outside of Europe, and that's the thing. There's a little bit of a, a play with it over in South America. America, um, uh, specifically when Mems and Kilo plays the Olgrim, but he's been winning steaming with West, it just ends up being Oops and Olgrim. And then we've got Laura's on the Kaya, right? But we haven't really seen that combo anywhere else, and especially um, not in NA. And looking at this, this does seem to be the kryptonite when it comes to fighting in these ch land championships, beating everybody else, but always going down to the dynamic duo that is Acno and Blaze. It's, uh, it's been difficult for many to be able to say they can sport a W over them in the first place, but. Acno and Blaze are just that strong right now. It's insane to watch their stuff. I mean, just looking at the stats right there. Look at the graph at the bottom. The stocks flew away. The idea of switching over off the Onyx onto the Rayman to try something a little different did not pan out because basically Acno saw that said, you are now mine. I'm going to target you. And he took that out as we take a look back at what Sheepy thinks about that last set. I, can I be honest? Can I be honest? That amazing job for Acno and Blaze, for sure. Um, especially since they're going through that elimination side of our doubles top four. But I'm going to be real. I was actually reading for Maiden Experience. So I'm a little heartbroken. That's okay. It happens. This is, this is, this is it. This is Championship Sunday. So what can you expect? You're going to expect such intense games, close calls, and sometimes just complete domination because if I can quickly quickly here if I can quickly just talk about literally the matches you guys just commentated on I mean Acno Blaze versus Radish Megdi literally the, the match right before this one right in elimination semifinals oh my god the back and forth I, I, game five I was like what is going on I don't even know who to root for <laughs> I'm in the back being like I want Acno Blaze, but oh my God, Raiders and Meg D, wait a minute, well, I don't know. It was a heartbreaker set for me personally, just because <laughs> I've been a huge fan of what Raiders and Meg D have been developing in the double scene. It's been a while since uh, two players who are great at singles were able to just come together and be like, okay, we've got a brand new idea of how to be able to play this game mode and make it succeed so much that even even longtime teams like Boomy and Sansom are like, wait, that idea is so good that we want to try it. So it was unfortunate for me to see them go out of fifth, just like I was unfortunate for you to see made experience go down, but Acno and Blaze, but the way they're playing, who could not be a fan? I mean, exactly. Like, even with them going down in fourth place with that Meg Radish team, they were they have a case for the best tournament run throughout BCX, but or potentially Brawl of History in twos because they had to go through so many insane teams to get to this point. And then going into that next set, also, actually, just take a look real quick. Shout out to cosplayers, by the way. Everybody put in a lot of work. <laughs> that looked phenomenal. Uh, but it is not going to be either of those two teams, Acno and Blaze are gonna get that much closer to what they couldn't accomplish last year and taking home potentially those two trophies. Well guys, we gotta take a quick break. So up next is going to actually be our doubles grand finals. We're gonna see Zen Godly versus Acno Blaze go head to head and fight for the championship. Stick with us, we'll be right back.
体を裏切られた仲間よ誓うよ死ぬまでこの世界を守ってみせる失われた魂を見つけてやる魂を貸してくれカルダー最後の防衛ブラルハラへようこそ Let me catch up with you guys up here as we prepare to get into the grand finals of BCX 2023. I'm going to ask this very important question of both of you guys here. What would it mean for your team to take home the title this year? Everything. We practiced so much for this. We, we can bring it home, and we might as well just have to do it. Yeah, I mean, last year we couldn't take it home. I was pretty upset, and so hopefully this year. And Zen, Godly, what does it mean for you guys? It means a lot. I want to be a world champion. I'm just going to take care of business, really. Just going to do my best and try to finish it off. All right, now, we've watched both of you 
have some incredible clutches throughout your entire run here in the tournament this weekend. Not the literal game plan strategy, but what is like your overall strategy to keep yourself where you want to be in this finals match? Consistency. That's about it. You just have to be consistent and everything is clear. Say what's our strategy? Yeah. To no. win. Keeping it simple. I love it. I love it. All right. It's almost time to get into it. I want to hear your final thoughts on what it's like to just be on this stage and competing in front of this amazing community. Everyone's been so lovely. The crowd has been hyped the entire time. So if you have any shout outs to anybody you want to do, now is the time to do it. Shout out, Kingdom. Shout out to my friends watching at home. No one. Um, I think my previous teammates. The Kingdom and everyone supporting me down there, over there, and everyone. I love everyone. I love my fans. I love everyone. All right, well, I think they love you back as well. It's time for you guys to go get set up at your stations. Let's get into the grand finals. Thank you, Glitter. Wow, we have some of the like the best of the best teams literally sitting there waiting to go into it and go battle the grand finals. Ajax Taza, I gotta grab your thoughts on what do you think about this final outcome? Somebody is going to be the champion after this match, Ajax. Well, for one, no matter what, EU brings home some sort of trophy from this match because we got the international lineup versus EU's best, and EU's best fell to the international team in the winner's side. But they've been looking amazing in the limbs, and Taza, we're talking about it, it seems like Godly and Zen may be the team to beat, but Akno and Blaze have that history. Yeah, they've got the history, and apparently they got that fan favorite vote with nearly having a 70% chance wow. to win over wow. Godly and Zen, despite the winning record from Zen and Godly going into this. And you and I were talking about this. This is basically the best team in Europe going against a, a, a super force that is Godly here, where I feel like he not only wants to win singles, he wants to win everything that there is to win at PCX this year. And if he starts out with doubles, I'm looking at how he's playing today, and I'm like, okay, what's going to be stopping him from doing the same thing in the format right afterwards? So this is going to be a very crazy matchup. That is in full gamer mode, too. Every single answer has been, we're going to win, and that's it. There isn't is some mystical force behind it. We are winning because we are just that good and everyone else is afraid. And honestly, that's exactly how Zen has been playing because nobody has been able to topple the mental fortitude that Zen has had in multiple 2v1s throughout this weekend. Well, you know what, guys? We're going to find out really soon here because the match is ready. Get ready, everyone. It's your grand finals of the doubles competition, and someone's going to be the doubles world champions. Ajax, Taza, take it away. All right, Blaze and Akno, EU's best team, uh, going up against Zen and Godly, an international team that, I mean, a lot of people had eyes on. But not many people were talking exactly about how good this one was going to be, and they have destroyed every team that they've come against so far. Are Blaze and Akno going to be able to do it and bring it to a bracket reset, or are Zen and Godly going to go undefeated as the BCX 2023 2v2 World Champions? Well, it's time to see which one of them will be taken at home as we get the countdown going to what will be the last one three, of a three, two, two one. one. That's what we need to hear. It is Grand Finals time here at BCX 2023. All right, here we go. It's the double god. Let's go through the team combo. The other arm gets the gravity castle. Emily and Zen ends it with the neutral stick right away. Godly runs back to stage, tries to pick up the axe to be able to continue the damage. The instinct doesn't come through, and Acto and Blaze are trying to stabilize here by turning some damage back onto Godly. What was an amazing way to open up Grand Final? You know, when you say your strategy is to win and you start off with a 2v1 uh, t a team combo like that, yeah, you're kind of backing up your words really fast. When you have only one weapon to grab, and you're like, that's good enough. But Blaze with the neutral stick. <laughs> Oh, with the edge guard on the other side of the stage. The second that Akno and Blaze got out of the fray, they were like, hey, individually, we've got you both beat. And that was almost a super early stock going down to Zen. Look, you may have tried to cook, but you had no seasoning. It was dry. Let's actually finish the food here as the red team takes the first two stocks, and they're still refusing to go out. Akno was looking so hard for another kick off the top there, but it's going to finally fall as Godly puts one on the board. Oh, and then with the alley you coming out from Zen, gets the neutral signature after the gravity cancel. Unlike from Godly will mean that this, the board is cleared away. Zen only taking a little bit of 
of damage for his trouble. Back to an even game. And that team come. Well, oh, Acto stops the D-Light Sarah to Nair to cover his back. Exactly. Bro. He was paying attention to Zen sneaking around. It's like, I got my eyes on you too. He covered both with that Nair. And he's still covering with that recovery. Godly won't fall just yet. But they have not been able to play this game much. Whoa. That is that one but two. Yet again, red team running in hot from the elimination side. Plays with the double knockout again coming out on the right and left side of the stage. Dominating with the Lance on that Ogrim. Are now putting even more damage on the Godly stocks with side light. Nair falling side air. And Godly falls to the right side of the stage. Gets pogoed by Acto and the damage continues to go on to Zen. Acto and Blaze are looking unstoppable. They able to find the Nair in the midst oh. of all that. Accidentally hit Zen in the midst. But we are going to switch targets. You saw Blaze get one hit. But that he actually so changed good. target to Zen. And, and in order to be able to get that side light. You have to have a little bit of movement forward to stop yourself from getting stuck in the end lag of that attack. And then getting the side light right afterwards to stop the team combo that Kana came through. They're looking for a four stock here in game one. Can they make it happen? Zen does get hit by that neutral light. Godly goes in for that interrupt, but the friendly fire there is not worth it at this stage of the game. Sidelight Nair gets the recovery and plays, stacks it with his own. Can he get the stock here? No, Zen ends up getting the double knockout, but at what cost? It's, two, right. stocks, it's two stocks to one. It will not be a question that needed to be answered again, because Zen, every time he's been put in that position, has made people work for it. But that time falls immediately to the spear recovery, shutting down any hope they might have had in that. One reminder to anybody who may not be aware, this is grand final, so that means the elimination side team must win twice. They have to win two best of fives to be able to get it done. So even though Godly and Zen may have lost that one, there's a lot of data that you collect from that first game. Yeah, and this is crazy because this highlight right here of this edge guard, double edge guard on both sides individually from Akno and Blaze, was right after they had gotten caught in an amazing team combo at the start of the game. They did not let that phase them. In fact, they were just kind of like, oh, right, we'll start at a deficit and win anyways. Well, it was almost a four stock and a JV four at that at the very end when they were able to finally take this final stock off of Zen, right when Akno picks up this weapon. Look at As that spear recovery. Akno said Three, consistency two, is key. One, Practice one. is important. And making sure you keep yourself calm as we get into game number two here. Going to Apocalypse. On to Apoc, Blaze, and Akno starting off with a win here. And what would be their first of uh, of two grand final sets if they're able to get the win. Oh, but Blaze gets hit by that side stick and he's out of there. Bro, Zen is on fire. Okay? And we do not see a close off there, but Godly looking to maybe finish it. Does he get the side No, actually swifts, switches his target over to Blaze. Yeah, Godly and Zen not dropping the combos this time, and in fact, continuing them after the first one lands. Sarah will take him down. Endlight narrowly dodged out of the way, and Godly doesn't pivot the Endlight there to be able to combo into Zen, but still so much damage coming on to Blaze's second stock after he lost that first one so early. And very similar to that first game where they went so aggressive, and this time they actually got those stocks gone right away. Blaze just doing everything he can to try and allow Akno to get back to stage. He's gonna go ahead and get that weapon spawn, gets access to the bow, but in the middle of that, he was nowhere near to be Silent found. Silent Nair, neutral sick into recovery. got another one that recovery a little bit too oh. far away. Godly gets hit by the bow, ground pound at the very end of that, and Agno goes off the top of the sky to try to steal Zen's first stock. I mean, look at how damage Zen just now went into orange. How is he? Has he taken less than 100 damage? I, Zen, I, I, we've seen him play so well with Dog over the years and many other teammates, but this is just a different Zen. And oh. that's a ground pound coming through, missing the side air, trying to continue that pressure, but Blaze getting in the middle of that to make sure that he does not do any more. I'd like to think that after that game one, Zen and Godly turned to each other and like, why are we playing the strategy? Like, the strategy was just to win. And then they're like, oh yeah, you're right, let's just do that. Like we lost, just, that wasn't the game plan in so, the first place. Sidelight so Nair into recovery off the recovery is a huge amount of damage coming down to Godly. Zen still holding on to this first stock as Blaze and Akno are struggling to get this down to a somewhat close game. Gets the end right after that neutral light. Okay, there we go, three stocks, two. The comeback is actually starting to happen. Yeah, it's very much a possibility for them to get rid of that. They just need to focus Godly and they force the 2v1. However, However, the problem is forcing 2v1 against Zen this weekend hasn't oh. necessarily been a true win con. And we're going to see that couple up. We're going to go after Blaze. There's a side air, and there is a huge lead. Zen and Godly are beautiful in the team combo situation. The dare comes through, can't make it back to the stage. That's going to be a three stock, bringing this to a tight set. And that adaptation that time is they went for the same team combo that they tried to end in the actual recovery. And instead of Godly reaching for the actual recovery after the neutral stick hit, he instead falls right behind his teammates' back to get that falling side air, stop Blaze from being able to save Akno in that situation. And then they turned it into an edge guard as Zen was able to get that with the spear Sare. Really well played and a great adaptation from a team combo that we saw twice in the same game. Great way to put that first game loss in the bag too. Let's hear Three, the countdown. Two, one, go! That's what we want to hear every single time. We're going to run it back here on game number three. Godly and Zen, like we said, looked like that first game never happened the way that Zen was refusing to give up that first stock for so long. Yeah, Zen played that remarkably. 
uh, and Godly adapting quite well uh, just to be able to get those follow-ups that led into all of the leads that they were able to take. And now this is the first game that we opened up where we didn't have a devastating team combo onto the red team. And let's see what they're able to do with that as Godly has taken the most damage so far on the field and that Nair Sider will disarm him. Zen being put into a sandwich situation where he could have possibly on one to dude and it's starting. No, interrupted by Godly. Dropped. Huge interrupt. That could have been a stock bust, but they still finished the job. They go after him, chase with that recovery, so they don't let Godly get too far away. Zen once again dipping underneath. He's gonna get him getting a reversal. Well, actually, gets reversed himself. Godly does not, excuse me, Acno does not fall. Yeah, but Godly in the meantime does finish that edge guard onto Acno Blaze, thinking that he was safe, and he actually wasn't as Godly was able to get that ground pound. Neutral sig does get punished. Blaze gets the ground pound. Weapon throw forces the dodge, and Acno can't get the edge guard that narrowly misses that bow down. Yes, edge. that that missed by pixels on catching that down and maybe sending him back down towards Blaze. So Godly gets to hold on to that second stock a little longer. And speaking of stocks, Blaze always known as a stock tank, holding on to this one for a long time as the end light does not take it out. Ooh, down sig does not end up freezing his opponent's team combo. Goes for the neutral Ooh. signature, and Agno is just gone. I thought the defense was going to be enough, but no, Kaya. Now, even with that base seven defense, has enough to be able to survive that team combo, and it's now four stocks to three. Got no room to breathe, and Blaze is usually one to help out with that. The recovery won't be enough to get the KO. Looking for recovery himself. Do they get him as he falls down? No, Zen gets right in the way to make sure they can. Oh, and then the downlight sider to keep Blaze out of the way. Godly tries to go down for that combo starter. Zen's got his back covered. Weapon throw into pickup. Gets hit by the recovery. Still holding on. Can Blaze get the recovery? No, he can't, but Zen just armed. Doesn't have the jump to be able to get the reversal, and Akno's now looking for a weapon himself. Godly goes down to one stock. Blaze recognized that he was trying to help him out over by that soft platform, closing it out with that side air right now. Decides it gets interrupted. That could have gotten rid of Zen. Oh, the Sair does get rid of Zen. Now it's three stocks to two, but it's such a deceptive lead, Ajax. If Akno goes down here, Blaze will be stuck in that 1v2, which we've seen him in before, and it is so hard to achieve against a team like Zen and Godly. 100%. Oh, Akno gets spiked. The grab bar spikes him again, and he's out of there just like what we feared would happen. This is possibly one of the worst positions as Ogrim to be in when both of them have shown they could get 2v1s pretty easy. You are nothing but commitment behind every single swing that he has to play phenomenally and basically get them to kind of make a mistake, maybe catch a ground pound off stage. You got to make it look enticing enough to make them go off stage so that you can get that reversal. And Blaze does get one down air. Two down airs comes down, and Godly Zen pokes him away with the end light. The Sair hits. Godly off stage. Godly. He gets hit with a ground pound, stuff recovery, no way! Okay, oh. Zen goes in with the save and gets the poker right afterwards. Blaze goes down, but remember, Blaze had two stocks to play with, not one. Bro, Zen deserves a promotion. Get that man a raise. He's doing all of the work right now, and it has been so tough for Godly to try and play around Blaze at the moment, but Blaze gets pieced up. Here's the team combo on arm, send him back down, neutralized, but he doesn't have the weapon. Uses yet the DI. Yeah, the DI ends up making him go straight up. If you get hit by the same move, the same amount of hit stun you can do, dramatically change your knockback there. Goes to the sideline Nair, but Zen ends up getting caught by that combo there. Blaze taking a ton of damage, doesn't get the follow-up, neutral light, no, nothing comes right afterwards, and Blaze still has a chance with one more strong hit, but no, the Sair hits, can he make it back? Goes for the dodge, avoids the downlight, Zen gets the ground pound, and they brought it to match point here. One more game, and Godly and Zen will be your champions here at BCX 2023. Amazing supervising job coming in from Godly as he observed everything that was happening that Zen said, let me go ahead and handle this real fast. That could have easily been a one-to-one -one situation if that ends up turning out Blaze getting that ground pound off stage, but smartly from Zen, getting underneath that with that spear recovery to help him out, and then not only that, but reversing it with that pogo after this big lead they got, it could have easily still gone Blaze's way, but they shut it down. I love the humility from Godly with his reputation and ones to always make his teammate look like the best player in the world, and that's something that happens at every single championship that he's in, and he's no stranger to that with Zen as well, as they're playing off each other beautifully, and in those situations where Godly's behind, he's like, you know what, you're right, I'm just gonna act as the supervisor of the yep. situation, Then you go to town, because I think it's been what out of the last out of the last five games on stream, three of those were just carried entirely from Zen in those 1v2 situations. Yeah, every single time. And much similar to the fact of last year, Godly and Fozzie getting so close but not able to bring the trophy home. This time, Godly and Zen look like they are going to potentially do that. If you have a game, you have a chance though. Akno and Blaze have so many gold medals for good reason. This time, we're gonna see a switch up though, oh, no. as the Brin is going to make its way to the stage. Okay, Agno bring out the Brin. He's played with this competitively before, but I am a little uh, cautious after seeing what happened with made an experience when that pocket pick came through. So let's see what they've got. It's now double Axe going against double Gauntlets here from the red team. And that team combo onto Agno is already a pretty rough start. Ground pound hits. He manages to avoid getting edge guarded for now. And that Sider will make it back to stage. Blaze trying to make sure that Agno can get something started. I mentioned before that the team comp of uh, Agno and Blaze was meant to be kind of the counteractive to the double gauntlets. Everybody's been running lately, but that has not been the oh. case as the D-Sync gets rid of Agno. 
And Zen doing so well with that down sig on Aang. Now trying to go in for a side light blaze. Does manage to get through, gets the down signature to say, get off of me. Acno, however, down to two stocks, and Zen and Godly are nowhere near losing their first. There we go, the follow oh, up. He got all. the combo he, off of that. Perfect this position there. off stage. The, where the is gravity it? cancel, end line, the D-line slider gets the recovery. Acno takes a ton of damage while Blaze tries to get back to the stage, and Godly and Zen are on fire. You could have lied to me all the way through and told me that they have been playing together for years, and I would have believed you. They have been nothing but coordinated this entire time. Oh, and now that recovery coming through. Blaze goes off of that ground pound. Ends up getting clipped there, and Zen uh, narrowly avoids going down. Somehow, Godly holds on, and he gets the side on Acno. The ground pound Ooh. clips Acno. Can he make it back? He can't. He's down to one stock, Ajax. It's six stocks to three in the match point here in Grand Finals. Not only did they not get that Lance recovery to get the KO before, but Zen ends up walking away with one himself. They do finally get rid of Zen, but Godly also sporting no longer a three stock lead as Blaze finally finds the mark. Okay. They were able to clean up things before it got out of hand. If they're able to get this team combo to Zen or onto Godly, it's three stocks to three. Blaze starting off strong with the sidelight in the air, falls to the down air. Team combo gets started but interrupted by Akno's weapon throw. They are slowly but surely bringing this back, and Blaze is getting a ton of neutral wins. Akno dodges after that down light comes through, and they're playing much tighter than before. Be very difficult for Blaze to try and maybe make something started. Meanwhile, Godly looking for that ground pound over on the side, and uh, Akno switch over the Brent hasn't really made a significant difference throughout this match, and they need that to happen. But Zed oh. getting in the middle of everything, almost getting rid of Akno. The downsing hits, Blaze goes down. Akno has to run for his life already in orange. Some friendly fire from Godly and Zen. You can just see them not wanting him to touch the ground. Blaze comes through, picks up the lance, and now Akno has to basically hold on for dear life on the side of the stage as Blaze has to fight them one versus two, and then N6 sends him flying to the left. Is that going to be a stock? Oh, Blaze gets up with the right. same, okay. If you have anything left in the tank, if you have some type of strat, you better pull it out right now. You better try and get rid of Godly, but Akno smartly going to the other side of the stage underneath the APOC to get away from Godly. Yeah, holding on just a little bit longer. Goes in for that down air, trying to spike him on that stock, but the ground pound tacks on even more damage. Zen looking for that hit. They might just have to switch over to Blaze at this point in time. Akno does seem to be doing a great job avoiding them, and Blaze is getting more hits than he's not. Okay, NSYNC avoided. Right. Chase dodge after the side, like great defensive play. Sometimes it can be a little bit too uh, focused on trying oh. to find one target, but they do find Akno. The final hope of EU is going to be Blaze as he falls, and your champions will be Godly and Zen taking it home for BCX 2023 2v2 championships. And that's Godly and Zen winning undefeated as the international team here at the World Championship. Godly taking a 2v2 championship with a North American teammate, Zen. And they're Looking to me like they're in a sense of like, wow, okay, we did it. We, we Our strategy paid off, just win, right? Getting it through. Now we're dropping an entire set, and they're just talking a little bit about that right now, where it's like, okay, we did it. <laughs> we're BCX World Champion. They got up, they hugged it out, and then after that, they started shrugging, like, yeah, we were always winning. This was always going to be the case as Zen walking over for that final handshake. Incredible job. Congratulations. They give it up also for the incredible performance of Akno and Blaze throughout this weekend. Akno and Blaze, the EU's longest uh, lasting, actually just the world's longest lasting team when it comes to being able to be the winningest and sticking with each other for the longest. Getting here in the grand finals of BCX is such an amazing feat. Not being able to get the win here against Godly and Zen, but still what an amazing win for Godly. And now sitting at the narrative that one player could take both events this weekend because Godly is almost certainly a favorite to win singles now that some of his opponents that have taken him down previously have already fallen down to the elimination side. Hey, here's the magic moment. It's it's not about us, it's about them. It's about lifting up those trophies high above your head. Put them up and congratulations to Godly and Zen taking it all home this weekend. You could not have asked for a better international pairing. Everybody had to come together to try and take out the force of what everybody assumed would be South America clearing this weekend. The battle between NA and EU, wondering who is the best. But instead, it turned out they needed one from each to be able yeah, to Yeah, they it joined all. forces to make sure they could put down the encroaching region from South America for being able to take everything there. And that's going to be Godly and Zen winning everything. And let's hear from Glitter what our champions here at BCX 2023 have to say about their amazing performance this weekend. All right, it's time to talk to this year's two's champions. Now, you guys have been after this for a while. You are now holding these trophies. You have the title. You've got that first place cash prize. Tell me what this means to you. Let me start trash talking first. See, it was funny because when I started teaming with this guy, everyone started clowning me. Oh, you're not going to win with him. You're on NA servers. You're not going to win with him. 
God, he's not even going to place with, with Zen. They're going to get ninth, third. Now look. Now look. That's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. Now look. Now look. Now look. Now look. That's all I got to say. But this means everything to me. As I said, we was going to win early. I was so confident us winning. I got the best player in the world on my team. So I'm not even worried. Sadly, it's like half and half win because he's N.A., but... All right, tell me, tell me your thoughts on everything Godly just said and then how you're feeling as well. I don't even know what to say. This is like crazy. This is my first tournament win, and it's at the World Championship. So, that's insane. That is an impressive stat to boast about. Now, obviously, you guys put in a lot of hard work to get here, but there's some people that support you along the way as well. Is there anybody that you want to thank for helping you make it this far? Kingdom especially, Senketsu, Ohang, I love them. And other than that, just everyone in the crowd, all my friends, everyone here supporting, my family, of course, my people, even my friends, even Akno Blaze, I love those guys. And just everyone, experience over there, I love him. I know he's gonna talk to me later though, after what happened, but I love him, he's my guy, that's my little brother, but it's, yeah, that's it. And I love everyone. I love that, what about you? Just all my friends and my family as well. They're super supportive. All right, well, I think they'll be even more supportive after a performance like this. Can we get a little bit more love one more time for the champions? <laughs> Guys, back on over to you at the desk. Thank you, Glitter. Wow, yes, congratulations to Godly and Zen. What an electrifying match. In fact, let's take a look at it again. Tell me about this, Ajax. You know, Godly once said in an interview at one of the Royales, I will never forget it. Every loss is about practice. It's about practice. Everything that he does is practice. It doesn't matter if he wins at the end of the day, as long as he meet and wins the most important one, BCX. That practice paid off. And it was only two weeks worth, Taza, as they were able to dismantle Akko and Blaze in two individual sets after what looked like a really hot start from them in game. Yes, and, and, and I, while that was the, the practice that they were able to get together, I don't want to dismiss the amount of work that both of these players have been putting together to be able to get to this point, right? Because it became from both Godly and Zen's recognition with each other. Godly said that in the winner's interview. He's like, I won the 2v2 championship with the best player in the world. And he said that about Zen. He did not say that about himself. And that sort of confidence in your teammate is the only thing that I heard from teams like Akno and Blaze, who Godly then just went and been like, I love those guys after beating them in the grand finals. Uh, yes. they, they've certainly created a dynamic where it's going to be interesting to see how with, with the, with the uh, split between online seasonals and, and uh, in-person events, it's like, okay, Godly's now going to have to like juggle two different kind of teammate scenarios because you're not going to always be able to play with them, but I mean, he still seems like that's the teammate that he wants to move with going forward. I mean, gosh, I'm also just looking at these stats too, like, oh my God, Incre and yeah, I was watching it from the crowd and everything, and it's like, Agno Blaze, that first, that first game, I was like, holy cow, that went, I, I feel like if you had just, you know, took a little quick break, a little blink, you know, maybe a sip of your drink, you missed it, because they, they, they were so dominating in that first game, but then suddenly Godly and Zen just like that were like, no, thank you. If we had an MVB category for anything that has to do with this weekend, it would go to Zen. And the absolute most valuable player on the team, picking it up heavy, wouldn't give up a single stock in that situation, won multiple 2v1s throughout the weekend, and like you said, Godly said it himself, that is the best player in the world, and honestly proved that through and through. I mean, he got to see during winners finals in games one and two that it was literally like, oh yeah, I have the best player in the world on my team, he'll just win these 1v2s against Maiden Experience, and then get that 3-0. If there was the asterisk, it was close set uh, of the day. It was that winners finals match, despite that being a 3-0, and then afterwards, that momentum just carried them into an all-dominating victory. Yeah, and guys, I, I can't believe it because the, we just crowned our doubles champions, but you know, it's not technically over. I do want to grab some very quick final thoughts from both of you guys and just tell me how you feel about everything. Wow, it's kind of hard to not be excited after what we just saw, but it is not over yet. Like you're just saying, one's coming up, and I do truly believe that although they didn't make it here to the final four of this event, South America is still out there strong and ready to put in some work in ones as we move over. Yeah, it's terrifying to think about it, right? Because of how good Godly is playing right now. And now I have him up there as a favorite to be able to take the championship. But just because no SA was seen in twos doesn't mean that the best players from South America aren't here to potentially take that tournament as well. And I can't wait to see what's going to be happening over there.
All right, guys. Well, we have our doubles champions. Of course, congratulations to Zen and Godly. They fought long and hard, and they have battled it out all year long, and not to mention all weekend long, going through 600-plus competitors. And in the end, they come out victorious against their opponents. Once again, I cannot say this enough. Congratulations to Zen and Godly on their victory and being crowned the BCX 2023 doubles champions. Woo! Wow, what a crazy series. We couldn't have asked for a better end to our doubles competition, but not to worry, we're not done yet like we said. There's still more to come after the break. We have a singles player to crown and more as we head back to our singles competition. Stick with us, we're just getting started.
players. And we do finally get to see the lifetime history between these players, and it is 0-0. Zero zero. But I mean, just take a look, quick look at these numbers. 12 gold medals, 3 gold medals coming out from Paula. Fiend is a player that has a lot more experience and uh, achievements under his belt. But then again, I mean, we're talking about Impala. This is the Lana Beast. This guy, he might, his numbers might not say, but this is the land beast. And yeah, I mean, you can never don't discount show him. show everything, right? Because, yeah. um, you know, we keep calling him the land beast. He actually just does perform at offline events that much better than online ones on occasion, right? Um, and because this doesn't necessarily separate that, it might be a little bit difficult to tell that at the moment. Um, right now, Impala, um, he's got quite, he's building himself up quite a bit of legacy, especially from last year's performance, um, the BCX 2022 champion. And now we have Fiend from basically the most volatile and the most exciting region at the moment, South America. This is going to be an exciting match, especially when you consider that the two of them have never gone up against each other before in tournament. Yeah, so it's going to be fun to finally see these two beasts clash in tournament, and I see they are going into a quick button check, so we are slowly but surely getting ready. As you mentioned, the rest of the action after this set is going to be happening on the main stream, twitch.tv forward slash Brawlhalla, so make sure you don't miss any of that as well, because there's so much action left. I mean, we are, we are just barely wrapping up top 12, and we are going to be going through the entirety of top 8 today. I'm quite excited to see it, and for those of you guys that are in the audience who in for treat, as always, BCX, um, the one time I've been here, which was last year, I mean, the whole venue was exploding. It was explosive. It was, uh, there was like a lot of really good energy, and that is the beauty of a land, right? And then there's some players that are just, they, they, they get like a power up, right, from the energy, from the crowd, the excitement, and then there's some that might not do so well under the pressure. And so I'm excited to see how that's going to go today. The stage is beautiful, and it's going to be an incredible show later on today. Yeah, Godly did mention that in interviews last time around that he gets a buff whenever people cheer for him. So, I mean, if you're watching 1v1 later, make sure to scream out loud for him. Uh, but in the meantime, we have Fiend and Impala here, and I'm sure they also have some fans in the crowd as well. Yes, no, absolutely. A couple of favorites as well. So I'm excited to see how this match is going to go. And also, because I never got a chance to say it, his eyebrow piercing is pretty sick. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Fiend coming in here with a new kind of level of drip. <laughs> That's right. But how do you feel like this is going to go? What is your pre-game prediction? Oh, dude, I am such a massive SA believer. I am such a big SA believer, but also like Impala, low-key going under people's radar. Like people haven't really predicted Impala to make any sort of massive upsets or really break that far into the top eight. I would just love to see him to prove everyone wrong a second time and get in, I don't know, get some massive upsets. If he gets a second BCX consecutively, that would be I mean, hey, I mean, now maybe we're getting a bit carried away, I but know. you know, no one would have predicted Impala to win last year and still somehow he did it. So I mean, it, I guess it just kind of comes down to how he's doing today. I've been watching the games that he's been having. He has been playing very, very well. Mm. I don't know if I would say BCX champion, but maybe you have he something to add on to that. He has been playing very well. Yeah, and I was just thinking about it a little bit. I don't think a lot of people will think that he'll make it into top three but i have a certain intuition at the moment which is if he wins the set and he if he makes it into top eight winning side i'm quite confident that he has the ability to take it all um in my predictions i had him either as like first or second or something along those lines and if anything what i really want to see is the run back between him and godly that would be oh, an incredible yeah. set oh yeah gosh that's the thing i want to see more than anything so yet again this is going to be winner quarter uh, winner uh qualifier to go into top mm. eight winner's side. So for either one of these players, this is going to be a very, very important game to set themselves up for the rest of the mm. run today. Fiend, winner's side, would give SA just even more leverage in the top eight. They already have two winner's side representatives sitting in the top eight. Yeah, I mean, so far, you know, all of the games that have happened going up to top eight has been only South Americans. Yes, it's been used over Sandstorm, and it's been kind of over Skeldra, of course, right? Um, and now that means, if we were to take a look at the elimination side, Knees is going to be fighting the... Um, loser of the set, so being either Fiend or Impala, that's going to be quite the exciting one. Sandstorm waiting on the winner of Loras and Delta, as well, they're still in contention for everything. So there's some really exciting um, elimination side Delta matches. Delta is still in? Delta is still Delta in. Delta is still in, okay, dude. Okay, I see, I see what's going I see what's Delta up. Delta took it over Bunny, because Bunny had that absolutely ridiculous bracket path just yeah, knocking Bunny. down. Mm -hmm. 
Something's up with Bunny. Been having an absolutely insane run. I don't think anyone expected them to get that far into the into the bracket. But then again, Bunny, it would just seem, has a really good land factor. Yeah, no, no, no. She has been incredible this entire event. And Delta also took it over Vecina to be able to make it up to here. But that being said, everybody, we're going to be seeing game one between Fiend and Impala. I'm excited to get this started. Let's go. Three, two, and we are one, going roll. to be going into Small Fortress of Lions. Impala, of course, on that signature Queen Eye. And I'm seeing Fiend on that. I'm seeing Fiend on that queen eye and i'm getting a little bit i'm getting a little bit excited yeah always nice to see a queen eye representative and impala is still going to be left without a weapon and uh fiend able to get that weapon toss and now picking up the katars as well this is not the kind of opening that impala would have liked fiend is just continuing to deprive him of any weapons it's like 30 seconds dude super good start right now from fiend i mean this is bullying this is just straight up bullying impala finally able to pick up that spear he is able to get some damage on the board tries to go for that sideline into there as well Fiend's not going to be falling for it though, and Impala, I mean, you can see right here, this is why Fiend uh, didn't want Impala to pick up a weapon. You want to keep him on the hunt, you don't want any of this to happen to you, and Impala went for like the delayed GCD light, interesting, not able to catch that dodge though, and at the moment, holding on to the stage, not able to get the jump read with the side -out. Fiend getting the D light, and almost catching Impala on the way back down to the ground, unfortunately just a little bit too close, and now this is just about as even of a game as we can get until Impala finds that recovery, tossing out the weapon, and preferring to hold on to the bow. Going to be committing to that bow to try and find that knockout. He's able to pick up the D-line recovery to be finally able to pick mm -hmm. that stock off. Probably, yeah, going to be sticking to the bow. Picked up just the second one there. Fiend very quickly able to pick up that weapon. And the DC connects as well. Super, super good comeback for him. Okay, Impala now, once again, completely even game we have at the moment. Dashing and dashing out, looking for some on our neutralites. Picking up the spear now. Let's see what's gonna happen here. Impala just gonna try to zone and keep away Fiend. Fiend gonna be looking for an opening without okay. it, but Impala. what a huge extension. Super, super big to be able to pick up that dodge there. Incredibly satisfying combo to rack up some damage, but Fiend, he's on those guitars. He's going to be able to take that back as soon as possible. He's just not able to find anything. He can't find a sideline. This is such a ridiculously even match uh, so far, right? Both of them have been going back and forth, and now Fiend finally able to get the whip punish, putting him into the Katari's blender, dealing so much damage now, and now putting Impala offstage in a bit of a nasty position for just a second. The main thing is also, like, not only is the neutral even, but how much damage they get out of every single opening that they do find for themselves is also super even. Impala, if he finds an end light, if he finds a side light, he doesn't just go for that one hit. He keeps hammering in, going for as many attacks as he possibly can, and Fiend is doing the exact same thing on those guitars. Oh, and Impala is so bold offstage with no weapon, almost got that edge guard, and now picking up the bow as well, gonna be now looking for a D light to maybe combo it into a cover. Just backing off a little bit, popping out a D sig as well, and now Fiend offstage. With guitars? Oh no. Okay, I thought that got really scary okay. for Impala for a second. Impala did get that there on the way out though, and he is going to be, I would assume, sticking to that uh, uh, that spear, which he will indeed. Able to pick up a Nair, a Sayer, trying to go for the second Nair as well. Impala right now in a flow state with this spear out on the ground, picking up so much damage, and Fiend is just now finally able to get a little bit of ground beneath his feet. Yeah, we're seeing the Spirito come out now. Fiend, excellent desync just as a keep away option. Impala was not expecting it. That also does come out, and Impala... So early. Oh, no, no way, dude. That side signature sent him flying. You do not mess around with Queen Eye Spear signatures. No, not at all. Impala basically got hit by all of them. I want to see... Oh, man, I wish we could get the post-game stats on, like, how many uh, Athene signatures actually ended up connecting them, but I'm pretty sure it was they all hit of so them. so hard. Especially, I saw he was utilizing that Qatar neutral signature a little bit. Something that you only really see from the best of the best Queen Eye players, right? To be able to line that one up. Spear side sig at the end of uh, at the end as well. Hit super hard. Not a lot of players use it. Fiend definitely knows his way around them, and you can see Impala trying to get composed. We're moving into the next game, speaking to himself Three, a little bit, two, and we are going one, to be seeing the same four. stage with the same legends. Yeah, that was kind of the X factor of that game, wasn't it? Because it felt like Impala and Fiend were super evenly matched. And that was the only thing that Fiend had over Impala in that moment because of how much damage it dealt and how nasty of a position it actually put Impala into. That being said, they seemed almost completely evenly matched that game one. 
They were very, very evenly matched, yes, but, I mean, Fiend, he did really just have that. You mentioned the X-Factor with the signatures. I was talking about, like, in the second stock, how both of the players were able to get a lot of damage out of their interactions. Impala kind of lost that magic towards the end of the game, and Fiend was just able to pick up a lot of damage that comes out in quick bursts. I mean, we're oh. seeing it right there. Fiend finds one there. He doesn't stop there. He goes for the side, he goes for the DC. He goes for anything that he might be able to get. He's getting a lot of damage now at this point. Impala just whiffing a lot on the ground, whiffing that delay. It does not matter. He's not able to get the extension. That's the neutral light. Fiend jumping out there just in case Impala decided to dodge out. And now, Impala, what do you do with the situation? Catching the landing, catching Fiend, sweating yeah, on the way good. back down. That's the confirm. And now Impala has a tiny little lead. Catching those landings against some of these best players is so tricky, but Impala able to do so. Now also getting a really nice combo started on that bow. Double double recovery. Mm -hmm. Silent on the ground as well. Wanted to find what is going on. Impala is just dominating the neutral right now. Fiend can't get a hit. Fiend is not able to find that opening up until that neutral link connected. But trolling out off stage, the neutral link didn't connect. And Impala getting the ground pound. That bow ground pound is a menace. That that, that's a menace to society, if it's a menace to anything. Impala with an amazing stock, going into an absolute flow state. And Fiend, it looks like he has finally got himself back on his feet, able to find a little bit of balance as he's able to get that stock off. He's still in a full stock disadvantage, but he decides to stick to those Qatars. Right weapon for the task, the he gets that first read. I really thought that was going to connect onto more, but unfortunately it isn't. And Impala immediately with a spear spring to answer back. Yeah, that felt like it should have been more damage for Fiend, right? Because as soon as you catch that kind of a dodge with Katari's and you come back in with Downer, you usually expect to have like a three second long cutscene. But it didn't pan out that way. And now, at the moment, Fiend is in a bit of a cutscene himself, taking a lot of damage off stage. And Paula connecting a neutral light, looking for the D light, because had that connected, that would have been a nasty side in. Impala going for the egg drop as well, but it's not going to be connecting. Fiend with the side signature, going for the ground pound, able to respond with the ground pound, and that should be it. Impala, as he finds another there, but he doesn't get the GC D light. That must have been a misinput. Okay, but right now Impala getting the neutral light. Let's see what's going to be the juggle here. Fiend holding on to the stage at the moment, just keeps on catching Impala's attempts to juggle him on the platforms. Oh, the D oh, I'm seeing some desperate signatures, man. That, that end sync, side sync, though, able to connect. I mean, I said desperate, Fiend said, nah, these are calculated, bro. He's able to make that one count. Impala now still on his last stock now. Only one, only needs one or two attacks to be able to find the knockout. That spacing was crazy. He just barely avoided the down and he almost got spiked. But is this going to be it? And Paulo got the dodge. He, he positioned himself for the lines. But he backed off and didn't actually commit to it. He positioned himself perfectly to punish it. No way. Feed. Oh. Barely no options. In Paulo, he goes for the recovery. There's still a chance. There's a chance. The chance is not gone just yet. Fiend has been able to get so much of, uh, so much of this damage back. The Nair is not enough to knock out yet either. Yeah, it's Kaya. Kaya is a neutral light on is not going to KO anytime soon, but that's going to be it. That's a D-Light into the good cover lead. And Paula holding that game down and holding that lead. But I've got to say, that got really scary at the end for Paula. Fiend was picking up a lot, of, a lot of momentum. He was picking up a lot of steam. There was a really critical moment off stage where he was like, hey, if I get this down here with Katari's right now, that's the stock. That's just Katari's off stage. Impala didn't get hit by it. He got back onto the stage just fine. But man, that was so scary for Impala in that moment. Fiend also, you know, getting ballest a little bit. Queen Eye, we already know. I don't know how much defense Queen Eye has. Seven or six, something crazy like that. Kaya not being a super strong legend either. Able to survive off of so many of those encounters where realistically, most legends, I mean, you would have gone out there. He had a lot of new opportunities where he could try and strike back. If anything, this game just shows us that, you know, this is still anyone's game. This is still anybody's game, and so I, I don't exactly know how it's going to go. I will say, though, the majority of that game, too, was in favor of Impala. That was a little bit different from what we saw in game one. In game one, I felt like the signatures are really what got Fiend over the finish line to secure the game. In that game, too, Impala was in control of the neutral. You talked about it. You touched on it. He was just keeping space away um, and then just found a lot more consistent follow-ups. But then Fiend just ended up picking up a little bit of steam at the end. Yeah, Fiend. Super, super good. Final stock coming out from him. I don't know what kind of beast we were seeing from Fiend there, but whatever it was, I hope to get to see more of it moving into this next game as we are loading Three, in. Two, we are going one, to be going on four. the same Legends. This time around, though, we are on the Miami Dome. Okay, 
Paula just backing off to the ground now, looking for the side of and able to just catch Fiend, pressing aggressively on the ground. And Paula, really good advantage shade. And I mean, I've got to say, we already know what Fiend is capable of. He can easily match that with one Valdry with Katarus every single day of the week. And it's interesting. He's opting to go for the Katarus for the majority of the game. And I feel like the most spurious usage we see out of him have just been the signatures. Indeed, Feeds, go, Feeds uh, Katars have been doing absolute magic so far. Very, very close offstage encounter though. Neither of the players are able to pick up anything massive there though. Feed able to get that side light. Still already going for the Reeves, but Impala, his, his, his uh, defense options, he's mixing them up well enough. Okay, that's a side light, that's a neutral light, and that's gonna be the recovery as well, but Impala still holding on to that stock. Fee not picking up the spear, backing off a little bit, the D-Sync doesn't come out, but Impala, no whip punish on it. No whip punish is going to be coming out. Fiend looking for this knockout now. I can't believe Impala is already all the way down into red. He is going to be charging up that D-Sync, and Fiend, that was so close to connecting, man. I swear that signature is magnetic, but Fiend seems to be resilient. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> he, he just stayed away from that thing. He looked at it and was like, wait, can I come back onto stage now? Wait, wait, maybe now? Okay, now is my opening. Yeah, it's like V8, you know, the, <laughs> it's like the old, uh, the old 90s internet booting up sound effect. But you know what, a little bit of lag sometimes is exactly what you need. Fiend at the moment though, let's see what his next opening is gonna be. Tries to go in with a side light. Impala finds the good recovery and that's gonna be the KO without taking too much damage. And now the game, once again, is about as even as it could possibly be. He has that weapon advantage. This is the same bow that we were seeing just a game ago that was absolutely dominating Fiend. And it looks like he's trying to keep something like that going as he's constantly trying to read these escape options coming out from Fiend. We are kind of going back into neutral here though. But this time around, I mean, Impala's dominating it. Okay, holding on to the ground yet again. Gets the side light, gets the D light, but then runs off the stage with that side light a little bit too committal and now finds himself in a uh, disadvantage and Impala is more than happy to take advantage of it. Nice little combo there, backing off. Doesn't get the side in and Fiend is able to finally get back on, but he took a lot of damage uh, when he was just stuck off stage. Yeah, took a lot of damage. Also, you know, considering this is Queen Eye, Katars is a weapon that's supposed to, you know, you throw out a lot of attacks that slowly build up damage. Queen Eye just kind of makes that irrelevant, you know, considering they have like seven strength or something crazy like that. Impala able to throw him off stage, so and that D sig, the second part of it is actually going to be connecting, taking Fiend out. Impala with an even better lead then in the blue stock, getting the recovery, looking the neutral leg follow up, holding back onto the ground. Nice air. Going to be trying to follow it up as well. Impala, amazing there to be able to get back up. But Fiend, he's trying to commit to this. He's going to be going back up to pick up that weapon though. He has the spear in hand. I smell that end sig. I smell that D sig. I thought a side sig was going to take it out, but Fiend used every single other signature that I thought he was going to. Impala's not falling fully as much as he used to. He's just actually slowing down and playing a little bit further back, so he's just not running into it as much as he used to. And we'll see if they actually do come out and connect um, at the end here. Just, oh my oh, god, no, that could that be was crazy. With the ground pound, 2-1 and out of nowhere. It was looking like Fiend's game. Impala said, hold up. He goes for that offstage play, and that's 2-1 on the scoreboard. Okay, this is something I noticed the last game as well. Fiend is going for some offstage plays. That's a very nice way of putting it. I saw a spear ground pound last game that I was like, hmm, that was a little bit interesting. That GC unarmed uh, down strong was also like a little bit interesting. It was also quite a bit of a commitment. I'm surprised that wasn't like a GC D light. I don't know why that was a decision um, as opposed to just doing that. I'm not sure if that was actually nerves that we were seeing from Fiend because it, it was either, I mean, doing what Impala did there was either like, all right, you are fumbling the bag, I'm gonna punish you hard, or you are feeling a little bit too comfortable throwing out stuff that shouldn't be connecting, I'm going to punish you hard. And it feels like Fiend at that last couple of uh, interactions, Fiend was a little bit more insecure about his options. We were seeing a lot of signatures that weren't connecting. We were seeing he wanted Fiend. that KO, he was hungry for he it. Was, he was a little bit hungry, he was a little bit desperate. And uh, you know, when you have, such good fundamentals that Fiend does. You, it's fine being a little bit desperate because you're still going to be able to connect the dots, but uh, Impala doing an amazing job at maneuvering around, especially that GCD seg that we saw at the very end, and also in moments of struggle, able to turn around those situations so quickly. Yeah, he was a little bit more patient. He wasn't really rushing in and trying to steal space away. And then also when it came to offstage, he was just really cognizant. It was like, okay, cool, you did this. Not only am I gonna get back onto the stage, but I'm also Three, just not two, gonna let you get one. away with 
with this. And so for me, that is a wake up call. Now, what is this? We have the Taros. We have the Taros. A lot of screen feed. I mean, he's seeing the vision. He knows what he needs to do. Impala, though, already. I mean, we can barely talk about this legend pick because Impala already in the very start of the game. We're 13 seconds into the game, and feed, he's in orange, man. He's in orange, but you know what? It's Taros, so you only need a couple of swings to be able to even that one up. And there it is. There's the three piece, and Impala is ba I mean, he's basically even it out. Still, another side light near, and that is going to be completely evened out on the board now. As Fiend is looking for even more damage here, Impala kind of lost a little bit of that magic that he had in the first couple of interactions, but he has the bow in hand. Still has a slight damage lead, but honestly, against Taurus, you don't really have a damage lead ever, especially when he evens it up just like that. Now, when it comes to being off stage, oh, Impala, that was quite the commitment with the downer. Are you going to make it back on? Fiend is going to make that as difficult as possible. Oh, no, not again with the DC, Fiend. Going to be able to get back up though. He has been blessed to be able to make that back up without Paula brutally punishing him this time around. Side light, sorry, D light Nair is going to be knocking him out though. Fiend, that's the second time he's thrown that out. He it just let doesn't the work. intrusive thoughts win. It's He'll like, let the intrusive thoughts win, man. It's like, hey, you know what? Didn't work last time. Would it be funny if it hit this time around? That being said, Fiend is going to close out that full stock on Paula. Didn't take too much option. damage. Oh, yeah. D-Light into the weapon pickup, you love to see it. Some players know Some players know the tech, most of us don't. <laughs> okay, ooh, a little bit committal there. Impala with a nice little punish. In fact, a nice, pretty good punish, in fact. Okay. Going for multiple dares. Impala putting out so much pressure with that Grandpa. Tries to go for the dare as well, but Fiend is ready this time around. Grandpa is connecting. Impala, there's so much offstage interaction for all this time. Fiend has kind of been avoiding it, but Impala oh. now pushing it more and more. He's one stock away from going in to top eight winner side for the second time. Yeah, he is cleaning up this Terrace at the moment. Finally coming back on with the Spirit Cavalry Axe on hand. What is Fiend going to need to do to even this up? Fiend is so hungry and so desperate for these KOs, and Impala is taking full advantage of every single signature. Feed now. He has a lot of work to do, but it all begins with taking this stock off. He needs to find it. He's on that hammer. Impala able to throw him off stage, though. This is not where Feed likes to be. There's are connecting. Impala gets that side. He's looking for the reads. Fiend getting a little bit shaken up by now. Paul is playing fast. He is not giving Fiend any space. He is constantly getting into space, and Fiend finally able to connect that down. And anything is possible at this point. You last stock a piece. You need one dodge read. You need one good, solid advantage state. And the question is, does he have that? As Impala getting so aggressive, even with no weapon in hand. No weapon in hand. Fiend, this is what he needs for the Game 5 Dream. But Impala, he's so close to already wrapping this up. Gets that ending, and it's going to be it! 3-1 on the board, and Impala makes top 8 winner side yet again for the second year in a row. He keeps the NA dream alive. I'm calling it right now. Grand Finals is going to be godly, and it's also going to hey, be hey, Impala. Impala can hear you right now, man. Don't jinx him. I'm sorry. <laughs> my apologies. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Congratulations to Impala once again making it into the winning side of top 8. Now, this is not the um, end for the Fiend. Of course, he's getting knocked down into the elimination side of things. Um, yeah, no, no, Impala, like, toils the end. He actually just made it so difficult for Fiend to find any consistent KOs. In game one, that was the thing that was really working so well for Fiend, and the thing that really put him above Impala. And then as the set went on, it just seemed like Impala just got more patient, got a little bit more evasive, and he had a very no-nonsense attitude in treating a lot of Fiend's off Man, Fiend committed off stage. Yeah, Fiend, lots of mistake in the offstage. We are going to take a quick look at the head-to-head. -head. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, in the game stats this time around. Impala, again, we were talking about this bow so much, but what is that I'm seeing on the unarmed? I can't believe we didn't pick up on that. 152? That's crazy. Wait, that's like ridiculous. That's like that the most like, I've seen in a that's, long that's time. That's quite literally really ridiculous. I've not seen that, definitely not, you know, in in out of BCX, you know, this deep into the bracket. I don't think I've seen that all weekend. 152 damage on unarmed. I don't know, it's the last time I've seen the yeah, numbers that high. That's actually pretty ridiculous and all, even across the board. And of course, Impala always favoring the bow and all of its combo potential. And of course, the signatures that Kaya grants you with it as well. So congratulations to him. I think he played beautifully. Man, Impala's adaptation is just incredible. Um, 
anything that you do that works against him in a game one consistently will not necessarily uh, be present in the rest of the set, right? He is cognizant of it and he knows how to slow down his game plan and he knows how to not let you get away with options that you should not have committed to, especially off stage. This is somebody that you should not sleep on still. Um, and I'm excited to see how he does for the rest of today. But as we have mentioned previously, this is not going to be the end of the run for Fiend. He is mm -hmm. going to get knocked down to the elimination side, but he still has more. It's time to get back into our singles competition at BCX 2023. Welcome back, everyone. And with me now, I got Flambo, I got TK. Guys, how are you? feeling about Championship Sunday. It's already dang time. Championship <laughs> Sunday, I mean, Godly and Zen able to wrap it up in the two spear, but me? I'm trying to see where that singles action is at. That's what I'm really here for. I'm trying to see if my prediction can still become true. That's what I want to know. Now, I do got to give it up, obviously, to our uh, doubles winners, Golly and saying Golly saying, you know, it was, wasn't a full win for EU yet, and that's okay. That's fair. However, you still got that W. You still walk away with a nice purse. You know what I mean? It's time for him to see if he can keep continuously doing it in a, in a singles, too. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's actually the next match we will be seeing, actually kicking off our singles co competition, is Godly versus Meg D. I cannot believe he went from just winning the doubles right straight into singles. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> no, literally, I came out from backstage, the first person that I saw was Godly watching that match between Fiend and Impala. And I walked up to him and we made on eye contact. And he already knew. He already knew. We just dapped each other up. He was like, yep, I just got to do it again, bro. And I was like, all right, fine. You got it, man. Let's see if you got the chops. <laughs> I'm winning this bomb. <laughs> <laughs> just immediately. <laughs> well, yeah, we're going to see if you actually uh, can back that up. He will be our first match. Uh, also, as you just said, you were talking about Impala. And pa uh, I got the, the cool stat of knowing that uh, every person who's ever won BCX has won the one right after. And Paul is still on his way to being able to do that. So oh. it is it is possible. That's you know, right. It is possible that he that could be the back-to-back -back champion again. Because I will say, uh, I believe that match that everyone just saw when we were on break, Impala versus Fiend on the Pro Brahala stream, BC stream, that qualified Impala into top eight. And so this match upcoming, Godly versus Meg D, this match qualifies one of them into top eight, of course, on the winner side. It's a really important match here if you really want to make it kind of a little bit easier on you. Mm. Now, I do want to get your thoughts on the outcome, possibly, of this match. Flambo, I'm going to start with you first. Okay, so I think when you look at the numbers, when you look at just the history between the two competitors here, Godly very clearly, I think, has the upper hand in terms of what people are expecting. But Megdi is someone who, especially on LAN, seems to get this power up that makes me look at this matchup and I'm like, this could actually go either way. Godly is favored, but I'm going to see what Megdi has to say. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the stats here on the screen, and I do uh, have them at 1 1, even down the line. Four games to four games, one match to, or one uh, set to one set. So obviously, it's possible for both of them to win it. I think, uh, you know, you have to bring in the fact of the play styles here. You got Godly, who's from EU. EU is known for intense neutral, as I like always say. So they know how to play that passive game. Uh, Meg D is a passive player. So, I mean, that's that's going to kind of put Godly right back at home. So it really depends. I mean, I, I want to see how this all shakes up. I didn't get to see either of the matches of how they won or how they lost. So I'm very, very interested to see if, like, my theory about how the, this match is going to uh, shape out actually comes to fruition. Now, another question here is that do you think maybe per, per chance there's a advantage that Godly's going into this? Because he literally just... He literally just won doubles. He must be feeling good. He oh, yeah. Like, he must be like, I got this. Ain't no way I'm losing. It depends what type of player he is. You know, some people, he might be, he could be gassed out. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you might have expended all your energy in that finals. It, however, it was a 3-1, so. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, he got a little more, <laughs> he does have a little more uh, gas in him. No reset, nothing like that. Or he could be the type who rides that momentum. He's like, you know what? I'm feeling good. I've already won one thing. Let's go ahead and win the other. I, I'm just feeling like a winner today. Yeah, I feel like there's kind of that shift you have when you're going from the twos landscape back into ones, that there's some level of refocusing that you have to do Three, before two, you get right one, into it. But whoa. it looks like these guys are getting started. No, man, all right. Yeah, they said, I don't. I have no time to waste. I want to win. That's what Golly says. Out on the Rayman, and then we got Meg D pulling out the valve. Let's see how this one plays out. 
Okay, Godly already with that Rayman has that Axe. Megley, of course, on the patented battle. Definitely excited about that new meta div, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But trying to see just how this intense neutral, as we like to call it, is going to shape out here. I mean, Megley loves playing that neutral. I will say, though, I mean, I feel like as of watch, oh, wow, what a catch. You can't jump over this. Check this out, man. Got the hard read on that neutral sig and sends him packing. No damage also, by the way, here on to uh, Godly. I mean, he got hit once or twice, as you can see. He's starting to hit into an actual yellow. But that boy, man, was an eggshell white when he got, took that stock. Uh-oh, watch ahead. Yeah, this is starting to look pretty bad for Megdi already. I think winning that twos championship definitely gave Godly inspiration because he is playing with so much fervor. But Megdi finally starting to strike back here, has the gauntlet in hand. Godly actually returns a three-piece of his own. This is going back and forth, but Godly already has has so much of a lead. Where does Meg D find the opening? Okay, Meg D. They, they both swing and trying to get some neutral airs. Nobody finding it though. Right back to the axe. The axe has done uh, godly big or like huge favors right now as far as the first part of this match goes. They're chasing him down right now. Godly just or Meg just Ooh. trying to find some space. He's like, please, sir. I need, I need some stage. Godly not trying to hear none of that right now. He was like, what happened to social distance? <laughs> He's like, he just back off for a second here. Godly just going absolutely wild on Megdi. Megdi trying to still get this first stock off of Godly, and Godly gets yet another with that gravity cancel D-Light recovery. Uh, Godly, I can't allow you uh, to exist here, fam. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you must exit, bro. Like, yeah, stop for real. <laughs> stop he looking good. Cleared him out. He's, he's feeling way too comfortable up there, oh, yeah. right? Like, he looks like he just, ah, uh, yes, he's reclining back in the chair. He's just clocking into another day at the office. Megdi needs to find a way to slow down this momentum. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is definitely not uh, the way I think Megdi wanted to start this set by any means. He is now down a full stock on his last stock, and he's continuously still playing that, like, I have to run away game. Godly has been on full attack mode, and Megdi has not been able to play the uh, evasion mode. Oh, wait. Is that going to be enough? Yes, it is. Good stuff to Godly absolutely running that first game like it was nothing. He's definitely running with that momentum from doubles. Yeah, no, nah, he... he took it and blitz, bro. <laughs> like, definitely sacked that QB the way he was moving. Godly absolutely looking way too comfortable in that game one. Uh, that He's playing like someone who already feels like he got the singles belt under him. You know, <laughs> he is way too chill. And yeah, looking at these stats too, man, you could definitely tell Godly was on absolute uh, offense mode. We got 33 attacks coming out, or light attacks coming out from Meg D, 36% accuracy, 60 attacks coming out from uh, Godly. My man was throwing out some buttons. And then also, 7-6, Hit, hit half of them. So, I mean, man, he's, he's definitely hitting some moves here and really uh, running away with this set if he can keep this type of momentum up. Yeah, no, Megdi really has been struggling uh, just dealing with the offense from Godly. I think the movement from Megdi hasn't quite been tricky enough for Godly to feel like he doesn't know when to swing. Every time Godly's swinging right now, he's pretty reliably connecting with Megdi. Megdi can't seem to break his ankles enough with the movement. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see where we get, go for this next game. I don't think we're going to get any type of swaps. It's also nice to see Godly to be able to, to uh, pilot, you know, such a... I, I just like seeing Rayman. I like seeing, obviously, the Dowson crossover, too. That's what he was using in doubles. But I just like seeing Rayman, too. That character is funny. Just yes. <laughs> That's a funny character, bro. And I like the swap over as well in the double spear. We saw a lot of the, the Dawson, but I guess he said, you know, William Singles, this Rayman time now just Rayman, decided Rayman to go ahead and get a little bit of a skin swap. But I mean, I do like the taking of some time here before going into game two, because honestly, Godly kind of ran through Megdi in that first one. So hopefully taking some time, trying to just think about what your game plan going into the second game gives Megdi a little bit of a better shot as we load up into game two. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as, as you said, man, that uh, <laughs> that first game was definitely a, uh, a, a slaughter on the side of Godly. Three, now, two, see if we can one, get something ball. different going as we swap stages. But is it going to be enough to get Meg some space that the space that he needs to really be able to play this game he wants to play? It? It's it's really just been Meg. This is a horror film, bro. I mean, yeah. <laughs> my man Golly is Jason, and he's just, <laughs> just chasing <laughs> Meg around. You know, it, Meg finally actually starting to put oh. a good fight. Wait. Oh, okay, that was a great weapon toss to go ahead and protect his head to get back to the stage. I like that, though. That's the type of uh, game that we need from Meg to finally start making some things happen. Ooh. You are getting boxed up, sir. Yes, talk to him. Megdi saying, hold on, that last game was a little bit of a fluke. I was just taking some time to understand and learn what your patterns are. Hey, Megdi, 
Okay, now, now, all right, it's, it's definitely cool fisticuff hours right now. Both of them with the gauntlets in hand. I like Megdi. Try to try to starve him out a little bit, or at least, uh, you know, force Golly to try to do something to get that weapon. He got the weapon toss and got the gauntlets back in hand. It seems like they're working a little better for him. But Meg still doing a really good job of getting these hits, these twos and fuse. He's got him in the position where he can throw out a sig and go ahead and take the stock, but can he find it? Hey, Magni still trying to find these neutral lights. At this point, so much damage racked up on a godly. He just wants to shove him off stage. From there, Magni can really enforce that positioning, but he keeps trying to wait for godly to run into him. He's doing these stationary neutral lights, and godly just kind of looks. Hey, godly, once again, now starting to get a chance to uh, patrol that floor, but it looks like Meg is going to be able to get him off the stage still. Fine position for Meg to find a stock. There it is. You cannot jump past me. The Sarah's going to do it. Okay, now we have Megdi with a lead. Not the most sizable, but honestly, Val, a fair amount of defense being in the orange isn't that bad. You can take at least three more hits here, and I'm sure Megdi's gonna try to get as much damage as he can in that time. That's very true, I see. Okay, Megdi, a lot of the evasion up here, all time high Ooh. right now between both Meg, finally getting another hit here, but just a little, uh, just a slight one. Still, I mean, I feel like Meg's sitting in a good spot unless he gets caught with like a hard read, uh, you know, side sig or something like that. I think wow. he is good. Well, not anymore now. I think he just lo lose to any sig. Oh, there oh. it is. <laughs> <laughs> show you, show you. He just, just said, oh, watch your chin, bro. <laughs> Knocked them off clean. Man, that's got to hurt a little bit. But Godly still trailing behind by a little bit. I mean, it should be okay for Megdi. Still has a little bit of a lead. Doesn't want the sword. Gets it and immediately throws it away. And Megdi has proven time and time again across different sets that he's great with that sword. But I guess against the Godly, he wants the gauntlet ditto. Yeah, man, I, I, I think... Look at that last game. He, uh, yeah, he wasn't really like uh, operating too much on the sword in that last one either. Yeah, it was a uh, gauntlet, 56% sword for 28, and he definitely took way more damage on that sword than he uh, did dealt. So I definitely understand where he's coming from. You got to try something new, see if you can kind of uh, throw somebody off kilter with the fact that we know you to use one weapon a little more, and now you're kind of swapping it up. Might uh might be a little diversionary tactics here against Godly. Okay, but now we have Godly on the axe again. Almost gets that read with the neutral sig. The dodge was just good enough, but Megdi now in an even spot. Had the lead before Godly has brought it back. In fact, has snatched the lead here with that disarming neutral light and looking for the down sig. No, actually tries to go for a down air there, but a well-timed unarmed recovery gives Megdi some breathing room, but not a whole lot. Snap that back for sure. Thanos that lead. You say, I'm going to go ahead and reset this now. Can he actually turn this into a big lead by getting this stock? They're dancing around yet again. Ooh. Honestly, you can get that good, solid hit to Sayre, but from uh, left, right side, middle to the left. Not going to do it. However, dragging him down to his demise with that neutral, uh, light, uh, neutral air. Good stuff to Godly. Managed to get back into the lead. Meg definitely has a really good start here, but it seems like Godly has now kind of steeled himself and got back into this game. Yeah, we can see Megdi's really trying to answer back here. Where's the weapon spot going to be? It's on the right side. Godly's able to starve out Megdi. Megdi's still taking more damage, waiting for this weapon to spawn. And Godly's doing such a great job of holding the space here. Finally, some gauntlets on Megdi. But can he hit Godly? That's what we're looking for. Yeah, Godly's definitely kind of hit that ultra. Nice. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I was like, he was hitting little ultra instincts. He's like, nah, not enough right there. Caught him with the ground pound, super quick with it. Now, got himself back into the game. A slight lead here for uh, Godly, but still, that damage can definitely start racking up. He gets one good read. Oh, okay, trying to get that three-piece going. Nice. Godly also, they're starting to throw some hands. Quite literally. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be tough here. I mean, Megdi gets that nice. down sig. That's actually a great start there. I thought he might go for the ground pound after seeing that dodge from Godly, but instead recovers back to the stage, trailing behind by a fair amount in damage. Nice fastball to not get hit by that recovery, though. Megdi starting to cook up a little uh -oh. bit. That's a free dodge. Okay, I like that. Gali just gonna try to take some sta space and maybe uh, stop him coming in with that anti-air type uh, D-Light. But this is still looking uh, doable Ooh. for Meg. He's actually got the stage advantage right now. He's nice. got the weapon advantage. Good weapon starve going on here. Ooh. Oh. Now what else? Godly fastballs barely gets that wall touch. Megdi still starving him out. Has a sword here for the first time, really, in this game, too. This weapon spawns. We're going to go ahead and throw that away. Get those gauntlets primed. No, we're keeping the sword. I think we're fishing for D-Light recovery now. Oh, yeah. I was like, I, I, normally, I, I, the way he's been playing this. Oh, that weapon toss. He's one more. Enough. Oh, get ah. off of me. The, re the exhausted recovery gets him back to the stage. But Megdi has really... Ooh. Okay. Trying to, get, trying to get him the YI auto right there. <laughs> 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 oh, I, 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 <laughs> no great stuff <laughs> coming yeah, out there. I just yeah, unfortunately though, uh, I, I've got to give it up to Meg. I, I was I was not sure if uh, playing on the sword 
at the end was going to be the play. But again, normally, if you are looking for a very, very reliable confirm, downlight recovery is always going to yes. be there for you. So understandably so why you try to swap over to it. Regardless, though, looking at the stats, my man was on gauntlets for 60% of this time and did uh, some sizable damage on that. 421 damage on these gauntlets to the three, uh, 386 taken. Now here on the other side, Golly kind of down the middle, 43 and 42% uh, on gauntlets and axe respectively, and pretty two, much did uh, one, equal damage. So he's being able to play both his weapons. It seems like in these matches right now, Meg D wants to favor one or the other depending on uh, you know what's working well better for him. So right now the gauntlets are doing him some some, uh, some justice though. Yeah, now this one's going to be a little bit more interesting because we are on Demon Island. And when we go to Demon Island, we always got to talk about how short those walls are, especially when you have characters like Rayman with that axe down sig and also Val with that sword side sig and gauntlet neutral sig. So there's huge potential for some early stocks to fly. But just in me explaining that, Godly has had the most immaculate axe play that I've seen in a short span of time. Yeah, and also, I mean, like this the stage is, as needs uh, limbs very well to just kind of carrying somebody off to the side and just letting them go. I mean, we called this Costlix Island earlier because, like, if you let get him beaming, he's going to make that happen. Mm. So, you know, we, we got some pretty good side sticks here from, um, oh, okay, my man is absolutely swinging from Rayman, too. So, you might be able to see some uh, stocks like that if Golly is not care or Meg D is not careful about how he comes off that wall. As of right now, though, he's doing a good job of avoiding these things that Golly is throwing out, but Golly does sneak in that recovery to get that first stock. Okay, now Godly looks like he's going to opt for the axe here. Had the choice of either weapon, but seems like he wants to play the neutral with the axe on this stage. And honestly, I get it, especially when you don't have that soft platform as something that you have to deal with. Hold on, Megdi, starting to cook. I had to wait for a second. I was going to see if he was going to let it burn or not. But looks like Godly gets out of that one relatively scot free. What is Megdi going to do for the edge guard here? D light into the dash jump side air. You don't get to see that conversion every day. Godly didn't look like he was ready for it. But Megdi definitely capitalized on that situation. And Godly was like, you know what? I'm definitely hit way too far away. I'm not even going to try to make this way back. Gives up that stock. Luckily, not Weapon Star for too long. Back onto the gauntlets. I think so far, I think the gauntlet did as much more went into the favor of Meg D. So I think that's why, kind of probably why you see so much axe play from uh, Godly too. Meg D has kind of really been outclassed him so far on the gauntlets, but he's doing a good job. Swats back over to that axe. It's like, you know what? You, you got the hands today, boy. Yeah, he's like, you know what? It's time to chop. Yeah. It's that down air into the D light. Good damage here. Gets caught yet again by the gauntlets from Meg D. Meg D goes for the dash. <laughs> Jump, a reverse ground pound, it's not gonna connect, and Godly gets back on the stage, smacks him with that side air. Gonna go for a D-like ground pound here? No, actually just goes back on the stage, goes for a little bit of starve, and says, you know what, I still have positioning. Okay, they get a good starve going on there, but unfortunately not long enough. Immediately one hit from uh, Meg D is gonna get him a weapon. Right back onto the gauntlets too, they've been uh, his, uh, uh, it's been the star, the star of the Meg D show this time around. Yeah, no, it's definitely a good turn of pace here, especially considering how that game one from Godly went, right? We almost forgot it at this point as we're into game three, but Godly had a pretty convincing game one. Man, just to pick up that stock with that slide charge neutral sig on Rayman, and it's gonna keep the ax yet again. So I think you're onto something about Godly not wanting to play the ditto anymore. Yeah, I think, I mean, and honestly, I'm not sure how the matchup has went uh, with his gauntlets into the sword yet either, but I just have noticed that when they both have gauntlets, it seems like Meg D is getting way more hits than Godly here. Godly though, the ax is looking pretty pristine. And it looks like he's going to try to keep that in his hands for as long as possible. Meg D going big, swinging big right there, trying to maybe catch Golly touching that wall. And again, you know, with this stage having such a small wall, it is a little scary for you to uh, be trying to get back to the stage, uh, you know, so haphazardly. Oh, there it is. D-Light recovery from Meg D brings things down to the final stock. Now, granted, Still a slight lead damage-wise for Godly. Needs to get a weapon. Megdi's not trying to let that happen. Beautiful execution to have that starve continue. But another spawn on the left side does give Godly a chance, but not without taking some extra damage. Okay. Megdi. Ooh. Nice. Okay, nice. Yeah, nice little step back. Uh, D light right there. anti is looking good from Godly. Not allowing you to land on him. Not allowing you to jump in on him. You definitely get some good uh, jump in stuff too with uh, the, uh, the sword in hand. You know, landing that first down there could be something major, but not getting a chance to do such. Now we do get to see that that gauntlet versus. Oh, oh. hey! Oh, well, we all we could have gotten a chance to see it, but it ended so quickly. Godly, honestly, so the gauntlet. It's, he just wants the the reverse matchup. The sword's out. He wants gauntlets. If the uh, the axe or if the gauntlet's is out for Meg D, he wants the axe. I see it. Yeah, no, I mean, especially with the way that he was able to snatch that third game. I mean, I think we were all kind of taken aback because it felt so quick. It felt so abrupt. Mm -hmm. But that kind of goes to show you that when you have the ability to be efficient with finding your KOs, you go for, you know, 
maybe I, I don't think I saw Magni dodge there, but you know, he just went for the option that was going to KO. If he just went for a regular Nair into Cider, it would have been good damage, but it wouldn't have gotten the stock. He said, what if I just did this sideline recovery and boom, it was enough. Right. Three, two, one, brawl. Okay, boom, and here we go. Right back to Demon Island. Let's see if we can uh, get a swap of gameplay here from Meg. He's got to keep himself alive in this winter side of things. Let's see, Godly, once again, still on this ring, man. Megdi has been piloting this Val the entire time. Gets a scoop there with that neutral air, gets the hands on him, and beautiful backdash on that, knowing exactly when Godly's gonna get off from the corner of the stage, but not really able to capitalize as Godly swapping out weapons and getting a bit of extra damage. Here we go, a three hit piece string from Megdi, but it doesn't lead to anything. Megdi, nice. Over there, Godly gonna find his way back down. Uh, to the ground, that neutral light creates some space, does it uh, yet again. Oh, I like the attempt on the mm -hmm. double side light there from Meg. He's not going to work, and Godly says, you know what's even better? What if I hit you with the exact same string that I got you with to end the last game, and it leads to yet another KO? I do like that disarming, uh, you know, disarming uh, VFX that they added to, because it makes, it, when you get the disarm and the KO, it makes it just look so much juicier. <laughs> You gotta let them know. It's like, hold on, like, I took away your weapon and I'm beating you. Okay. Got the axe out yet again. Nice, good, great, great uh, empty land right there into the neutral light. Get some space. Uh, Meg D. Oh, just kind of marking his prey there on the. Oh, okay. Trying to get, trying to go and one with it. Right? No, for real. Yeah, the pump fake. We haven't seen that in a while. It used to be something that we saw all the time in North America from players like Hardy MJ, and then it kind of fell out of style for a while. So it's nice to see Godly whipping that one back out. Really great tool to try to bait out a spot dodge. Nice big box up. Stuff yet again. Godly is gonna uh, whiff of a down sake, but regardless, you know, is gonna go ahead and make it back to that stage. Meg D, they are now boxing yet uh, for sure, and I think Godly's got a better handle on this Gauntlet versus Gauntlet matchup. Is gonna still swap out, get this axe going, Ooh, just for one hit. That's all that he needed. The Sair from the middle of the stage, mad power on that. Now we have Megdi back effectively against the ropes here. If we lose this match, that's going to be the end of Megdi in the winner's side of bracket. And it will be Godly guaranteed on the winner's side of the top eight. Megdi has to bring out all the stops now to secure that winner's bracket life. Megdi, nice. Oh, okay. He was looking for a lot right there with that side air. If he happened to jump, though, that could have been something. Man, Godly is absolutely running away with this last stock, though. Meg D might have been gassed out right now. That's what it looks like. Went for the wild auto, but no one home for it. Oh! oh. <laughs> the pump fake into the ground pound. Oh, man. Yeah, Flashy man. finish. Screaming right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My ACL. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's done on that one, bro. Nah, Godly definitely cooking him out for that final flashy finish. Great stuff. Securing a winner's side spot into the top eight. You know, Godly has to be happy about that. Yeah, man. I, again, you know, he said, I, if I can do it twice, I can do it twice. My man said, I won, I won doubles. All right. And I won doubles pretty. Uh, Pretty handled too, you know what I mean? A 3-1 victory. I didn't really see the, the winner's finals, but I imagine they, it was probably just as good. And then, uh, yeah, and then he's like, you know what? I could do it again here in singles. And he's on his way. He's now into top eight on the winner's side of things. So only really needs, th what, three more sets? Back I mean, please. if he could do it. If he could, if, if, if he doesn't lose anything, it's three more sets. Remember, semis winning finals, grand finals, boom, I'm the winner. I'm the champion. And let's look, look at some of these highlights. Get to see exactly how he piloted himself a victory and his way into this top eight. Yeah, we have a lot of great plays that happened in that moment there. I mean, it Godly just seemed to have the right reads at the right time. It would know exactly when Megdi was gonna jump, found those axe side airs, and especially that pump fake you were talking about right there. We're seeing it in prime time there. I mean, look at the crowd. Woo! We all got a little excited watching that one. Yeah, that was lit, man. You know, my man Godly, he's gonna handle his business up there, man. He looked like he's actually only up there for business with the way that like, you know, he's got the, the straight face. You know, we got to smile out of him after his W, but he's like, you know, it's not over yet. I, I got to win the exact the whole tournament before I can start smiling like that. Look at this last game though. You know, my man was on full domination, 527 damage to 273, full domination mode. 
Oof, yeah, no, that's actually, that's, that's, that's kind of tough. I mean, taking a look at even the split here, only 52 damage coming out from that sword from Megdi. Really wasn't able to get too many openings there. Meanwhile, Godly on both weapons was just piecing them up. I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Y'all see the numbers. I see the numbers. It, yeah. it speaks for themselves. Yeah, and I mean, what earlier, you know, we were talking about the fact that, like, it seemed like the Gauntlet versus Gauntlet uh, matchup was working well for Meg D, but even in that game, clearly not. <laughs> clearly not. It looked like uh, Godly definitely figured out what he needed to do to get around these Meg D gauntlets, and he did that quite well, actually finishing the game on gauntlets. Good stuff. Yeah, and I've always been kind of someone who thinks that, like, you know, on Saturday when we had singles, you know, you can be playing very well, but then when you go into a different day like Sunday, even if you were hot on Saturday, sometimes competitors go into the next day and they're just cold. You know, they yeah. just don't seem to get it. Granted, we tried a top 32 on Sunday now to kind of give people that time to ramp up, mm -hmm. and I think Megdi is playing very well. I want to see if he's able to kind of get the Jets going on the elimination side of bracket. I really do think it could be a long run for him. Yeah, man. So uh, with that being said, we will be getting into another match. Very, very uh, hyped for that. We all getting into top eight, actually. And that's what yes, we like to see. So top eight is up next. It's going to be using Kaina in our first match. So I, I want to see that. But before we get there, let's take a look back at the BCX 2023 singles competition. Throughout that entire final game, it was destruction. Visit to the ground, how connects. Anime clutches game five. I want to call out like what he's doing, but then all of a sudden he starts doing something else. What? what are we doing? That? And give it up for Sarve. He needs an axe. There it is. He's got it. Full finish. What? Oh, do it. No. It could be in there. Oh, there it goes. No. no. You it know out. what? Hug it out. Hug that's it the best out. way to decide. Yeah, that's a good game. All right, and we are here at BCX 2023 Top 8. We have the head-to-head -head in front of you between Kaina and Yuz. We're going to have a bit of a team knockout here from South America. This happens every single year, TK. There's part of me that's like, can anyone beat South America outside of South America? I'm saying when you have to do a team knockout this late, that's how you just know your region is strong, bro. They had the way all the way up into Top 8 winners size to be like, I guess we got to fight now, man. Uh, we've been farming the bracket so hard, but at some point in time, we got to run up against each other. Two Titans going up. Seems like it's uh, people are believing in Kaina right now here in the viewer vote of things, but that doesn't mean that people aren't believing in you. It's not that bad of a split at all. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're viewer voting, if you're, you're paying, you're a betting man, you're on the you side of things, you know, you might get a nice payout. It looks like, hold on, man. As I said it, the people were... <laughs> People saw the kind of was like, y'all y'all fair weather fans right here, bro. Man, I think Sparky's out there rigging the chat. <laughs> there is no way. I mean, both of these players absolutely phenomenal. I think Kaina especially has been the the front runner for South America for a lot of people. I mean, granted, Loris did have that amazing performance at the most recent Royale, mm -hmm. but Yuz also has a Royale dub. So really, there's so many players from South America that could potentially make the deepest runs into this bracket, but Kaina has been the fan favorite for a little bit now. Yeah, no, I, I get that. You know, the PR is, uh, when you're this high up on the PR, I mean, unless you're like the dominant number one, like an MKLeo type for, for two years straight, genuinely like one to five is all like, that's honestly one to 10 in, in this game specifically all feels like they all could have been one number one at some point in time. So, you know, really at that point in time, it just comes down to a uh, player you know, matchup versus matchup. And as of right now, Kaina actually does have a positive record on use at 8-5, 29 games to 15 games. So, you know, there's a little variance in there. 62% of the matches going the way of Kaina, but 66% of the games, that's a, whew, that's a lot. Ooh. Well, you know, me, whenever Yuz is on the screen, I end up getting a little bit biased because especially this weekend has been piloting the great sword, but I'm wondering if he's going to use it against Kaina. We've seen quite a few different legend picks come out from Yuz in the past. Uh, the fan favorite pick, of course, is that Vector that we saw that won that Royale earlier in the year. But 
these guys have played a lot in region. I mean, you were just talking about their head-to-head. -head. I wonder if he has a different legend pick in the pocket for this one. Yeah, I mean, looking at the stats things, there is... The, their whole legend thing is just filled up. <laughs> we have to, so they've got they've got some options. They got some pockets they want to uh, go deep into them, but more often than not, probably will end up seeing uh, the Taros definitely come out for kind of, and then after that, use. I mean, I guess it's like kind of a wild card of what he decides to pick. Who does he feel is going to do the best against Taros at this point, at this juncture of the tournament? We're going to find out as we set up for our first match of top eight winner side of things. Use kind of at the South America showdown. Yeah, and I remember when I was watching the South American Autumn Championships, I saw uh, a bit of a different kind of style coming mm -hmm. out from Kaina. And I remember because it was so different from what we expect from South America. You know, we always say, oh, South America, they're going to be running at they each other. They're going to be throwing hands. They're going to be bruised and battered, and they're going to be having Band-Aids over their nose. <laughs> you know, they were really ready to go. But at that championship, it was a little bit more laid back. There, there were parts of me where I was like, am I watching, like, peak blue? You know, like, simple? Like, they, they were really getting it down to the basics, and I think they've just kind of figured out some of the best approaches one can have to this game. Now, granted, we'll see how much that works out here. LAN is always so different than those online championships. The way you're able to react, the feeling, the vibes, it, it makes a huge difference. And so I'm, I'm just curious, man. I, I just need to know what they're gonna whip out. Do you think that like the mantra has like changed a little bit? Do you think that South America is starting to like kind of learn how to, uh, I guess, appreciate defense? Or you think that was just like a one-off thing? I think, Honestly, I feel like it was kind of a one-off thing. I, okay. I, I think they were like, man, I really need this bread for something. <laughs> like, a niece's birthday party is coming up, and they just really, really needed to do whatever they could to get a little bit of extra bread. But I think they still got that fire in them. And granted, we're going to see how it pans out here as we get right into game one between Kaina and Yuz. And Yuz is actually going to rock the Jayun, that great sword. You know what time it is. Oh yeah, no, you guys are. I know, I know you're you're hyped for it, bro. This man loves him some great sword. Also, though, when it comes down to great swords, man, I mean that Jay Young great sword is it's mad cool. That was it's that, true. that was a great start. That was a great character to start with on, on some great sword stuff. So here we go. Got the Jester great sword out, but it has not really bode well for him yet, as he has not been able to grab a great sword and really much damage. Finally finds himself a great sword, but kind of still just oh, really controlling the pace of this match, the area. Oh, okay. My man, I got the Steph Curry step back on him. <laughs> no, for real. <laughs> About to hit the fadeaway jumper. Yu's finally getting a chance to rack up some damage here. It took so long to get a great sword in hand, but immediately upon picking it up, was able to get some strings of offense. And we see a beautiful read right there. Yu's could have gone for a five-piece string there that might have led to the KO, but instead goes for a little bit of a safer option, saying, you know what, I don't want to mess this up. Got a little bit weird on the spacing on that sidelight opener and said, you know what, I'm just going to take what I can get. Nice. Okay, just immediately scoops him up and sends him packing. Quick uh, quick one right there with the down air. I mean, a lot of damage was added up, though, so it only needed, uh, you know, one good solid hit. And when you have the weapons that you're holding, Taros is definitely the Mr. One-Hit Man. You know, I got two weapons that eventually <laughs> you're just going to die. Like, yeah. <laughs> the, my, my side air is going to hit. You know, the down air is going to hit now uh, on both weapons, really, depending on where you're at. Really, oh, my God. Man, the stocks are getting dropped here. Rumble Reigns is like, back in full effect. And this is, can be kind of one of the struggles that you can have with the great sword is that, you know, other weapons, you someone like Kana, you throw out any move, it's gonna find that KO. Mm -hmm. But when you have that great sword, you gotta go for those gravity cancel finishers or get a read or maybe a stray recovery. And those can be hard to find sometimes. And so Yuz was searching for a while. Meanwhile, Kaina was able to lap by two stocks there. We'll see if this great sword is able to do anything. So far, Yuz is not having the best time. I'm wondering if he's gonna swap immediately after this game. Kaina is farming him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's Unfortunately, you have to say it like that, but that is exactly what has happened. And Kaina has been nothing but on Ooh. the advantage. Okay, Ooh. hold on. Ooh. As we say that, my man found a nice uh, actual six piece right yes. there, but can he turn that into a stock? Okay, another step back. He is definitely moving. He's start, starting to control some more of this ground. Ooh, and Yuz is starting to cook here. Ooh. Looks for that yeah. dodge, and he gets yeah, 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 it. Yeah. And that's going to be Yuz immediately answering back there, finally getting some of that great sword juice cooking. And honestly, that's what makes you a believer of the weapon. You can be behind by so much and you can see just once you start cooking like that you have to play this little mini game of is kind of gonna dodge yes no like right here every time he hits him he's like are you gonna press the dodge button and he doesn't know he has to react or guess and kind of is using that health lead to go ahead and smack him off stage oh yeah but let's see if kind of oh wait oh. 
Okay, yeah, I Scoops man, had to get out of there, man. <laughs> I was about to say another ground pound. That could have been it. The reversal of Fortune for Kaina is going to do it. Good stuff to kind of make sure that game did not escape him. But yeah, in the middle of that game, I mean, Gordon Ramsay was proud, bro. Yeah. Ab absolutely delicious meal of impact of great sword play. <laughs> No, for real though, it was he was really starting to figure it out. It's, it's a momentum-based weapon, you know, it really is. And so like once you really get the feel for it, you can really go. But I mean, we saw the end there. Like Yuz was like, dang, I'm behind. I gotta do something. I mean, it's very rare that you're gonna see someone do unarmed ground pound into a hammer that's recovering. Yuz mm. wanted that game to be over. Oh yeah. All right. So did he swap? Three, he said, I didn't two, get a chance to see. One, We're gonna find out four. right now. And no, he stayed. You know what? With the way that he started to get and pull it together, though, understandably so. Yeah. Like if, if the game ended when we were first talking about it, when he was getting cooked, would totally understand if he swapped. But got it down to one stock. Had a great second stock there on, or second stock on Kaina. So we'll have to see how that uh, works out. If he's able to get things cooking a little faster, is the oven preheated now? And that's what we want to see. I mean, these side lights are going to be the openings. And every time Kaina gets hit by a side light, you can see that these two have played so much and that Kaina knows how to play against Greatsword. Because every time he gets tagged, he never dodges. He's like, there's nothing that's going to KO me from the side light. I'm going to wait and see what you do. Ooh, he moving. Ooh, he moving. Wait, it's definitely moving right now. Unfortunately, though, it only takes one. You know what time it is. The, the hammer may be very simplistic in its gameplay, but it's very effective. Yeah, and especially when you're using a weapon that wants to be grounded like the Greatsword, right? Mm -hmm. Neutral light, stomp, all very potent options in stopping a Greatsword that's trying to approach on you and use having a very hard time finding a way in. But we're back on the Greatsword. Let's see if he can get a read. I think I accidentally thrown that weapon away. Maybe not in the way that he wanted to, but still managed to find his oh, weapon quick. Man. Oh, get scooped up. Watch yourself. Man. Oh, you see the uh -oh. ball fake into the throw that actually hits, and then the reverse scoop as well. Use is getting absolutely dominated here. Tries to go for the gravity cancel and light. It doesn't connect. Kinda is looking left, right. Which way? Where's my glasses? Doesn't need it. And gets the stomp there to close it out. This man kinda is on a rampage. Again, I, I look, I had him winning this tournament, and the way that he's playing right now, he said, you know what, me too, TK. I did I had myself winning this tournament. <laughs> look at my predictions. It's okay. me and then I don't care. <laughs> Oh my goodness, and Yu's still trying to find the final blows here. He's been having a really tough time landing the finishers, and those are the ones that give you the meat and potatoes, man. You can rack up all the damage you want, but if you're not finding the final blows, securing these knockouts, what's the point? Oof. Oh, okay, that was a great down there, actually. He said, you know what, I'm going up and around, managed to turn that uh, situation around now. You know, Luck finally able to find a stock, but he is hurting again. He was kind of in the same position earlier, though, so can he cook on the second stock like he did uh, in the first game. Gonna find out he is getting a couple more hits here. Oh, got baited on the spot dodge, and that's one of the mix-ups you have to play against Greatsword. Every time they whiff, it's like, are they gonna dash back or are they gonna spot dodge? And Kaina already knows the answer for you is to spot dodge more often than not. There it is again. My man has been getting disarmed. That's how you know he's taking damage. I'm not, not even having to look at the damage, uh, you know, numbers. You can just, the amount of times we've seen those disarm sparks come out. Ain't looking so great here for use. He's now sitting in the deep red, barely has uh, damage here onto Kaina. Okay, nice. Oh, Dodge is coming out from Kaina. He's like, I have so much health and stocks to use as a resource. He doesn't have to be scared. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at that. I'm fighting my way out of here. You thought I was gonna give up a Dodge? No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not afraid of nothing. He's so good at playing against Greysword. It's rare that you see the weapon's been out for a long time, and so many people have never bothered to learn how to play against it. And the counterplay is there or watching it in real time, kind of just waking up with a neutral light. Because he's like, what, is that? what do I have to be scared of? I got two stocks, bro. Do something. Stats wise, if we're talking about counterplay, the hammer definitely did it. Uh, we got 57% time on hammer with 450 damage dealt, taking 137. And if you look at the Greysword, he spent most of his time on that Greysword. Only 264 damage put out, 429 taken. So you are, I think you're hit uh, on the money about the fact that the hammer has such good anti-ground approach tools that you might have to actually lean on the sword or lean on a different character. Yeah, no, I think now if you're used, you, you've tried the Jaehyun, mm -hmm. you know Kaina's never going to let you go to Demon Island. Right. And so <laughs> you got you to gotta probably try something else out or make some Omega adjustments. Maybe we see the plane come out for one last ride or something because mm -hmm. we need something to change. I will definitely be down for the plane. I think it's always going to throw people off. Vector is not a very common used character, very unorthodox SIGs, uh, very interesting, uh, you know, set of weapons too so it's one of those one of those things that i think that you may you may be able to sham out at least one game or make one like close but i don't know how he's gonna be able to take a whole set reverse 3-0 yeah nah at this point you're 
kind of against death's door, mm -hmm. right? Like you, you re whatever play you make here has to he's be staying. the right one. And he's sticking to it. He's sticking okay. to his guns. He's saying, I can piece you up. I promise we're going to see where Three, they ended up going. Two, it's Western Air one, Temple. I one. think this stage sucks for Greysor, bro. You got two tall platforms <laughs> on the left and the right. They're high enough where it's annoying. If they want to circle camp you, they can. But Yuz is saying, you know what, bro? I'm going to win here. He probably has a different plan in the bag. I think on the reverse here, although I think everything you said about the stage is, uh, you know, uh, valid. I think that really it's probably you who needs the space because, like, you know, he has not been able to make these approaches well against Kaino. Kaino's been running use down. So maybe you just want a little more space out here. That could turn into his favor, but it doesn't seem like that's working too much just yet. We've got a pretty even game uh, between them. But again, you know, you got to think about, you got to remember the power that's behind Taros. This is probably a stock still in danger. Yeah, and at this point, I think I'd actually like to see some signatures coming out from Yuz as well. We've mm -hmm. watched two games at this point. I actually don't think that he's pressed the SIG button, like, at all. Yeah. So this would be, like, a great chance to maybe, you know, let a few of those rip because you need to be doing something different. He definitely did not let any rip in that last game. We have one SIG on the side of uh, Kaina and then no SIGs at all from Yuz. So nice. might be his time. Okay, the sword actually going to come out and make something happen here. That's what we love to see. We uh, been I've been wondering if maybe the sword is the answer, if he can get more into that sword play. But it still seems like he really wants to try to play that great sword does have a sword in his hand now. Maybe he's going to turn that, uh, turn this, uh, the thought process around. Never mind. I am just swapping. I am weapon starving. Yeah, he's like, whatever weapon comes near me, I'm just going to use the one that I have in my hand because mm -hmm. I just don't want Kaina to have one. And I get it because when Kaina has a weapon, he tends to do really well with it. I mean, he didn't get this far playing unarmed. And right. so we'll see what Yuz has to say about that as he has this axe in hand now. Ooh, and guess, man, that was. <laughs> Lord's weapon spawn, bro. <laughs> Just came down, summoned it, bop, and got that side air. Odin has blessed you. <laughs> Here is a weapon, my son. Here we go. Speaking of, another weapon going to be now in to the hands of you. It will be that sword. I do want to see if the sword is going to start making plays. That's what I'm more interested in seeing right now because the great sword has proven two games in a row that, like, He's just not been able to operate well, at least against this hammer. So maybe the sword can make something happen here. He's starting to get more hits, starting to avoid some of these hammer startups. Right, he's got the uh, stage advantage. Okay, nice read on the jump there from Kaina to force him back off stage yet again. Doesn't really want to play against that hammer, though. So you see Yu's waiting patiently on stage, trying to fish. When you do that jump around like that, it means they're looking for D-Light a lot of the time to see if they cross up on you and you get that gravity cancel. But Yu's managing to find yet another stock with the recovery. Despite all the gripes I have with Western Air Temple as a stage for Great Square, we've seen Yu's, as you said, lean into that sword quite a bit more in this game. Nice. Okay. Nice. Now that this, I mean, again, there's always, I feel like there's just some time in here where he just learns to start cooking. And he's like, he's, he is here, man. He said, you know what? I've, I got to cancel my Dash Pass subscription. It's time for me to cook. And you know what I'm thinking here? Just based off the gameplay that I'm seeing, I think Yuz actually is looking more for the juggles with the great sword here as opposed to, your, you know, your left-right kind of standard mix-ups. He's mm -hmm. like, all right, if I get you above me and I start going for neutral air, neutral air, maybe I throw in a recovery, it makes it a lot harder for Kaina to get down, and those platforms mean that you have to fall through the middle, which makes it a lot easier for Yuz to get these extra hits in. Kaina, oh, 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 okay. Friday. Could have been a big neutral stick <laughs> right there, to be honest, but still, though, kind of... He is hurting. He's living on borrowed time, and I think this might be it for him. Going wow. up. Okay. Still living. All right. Now one more here. Use gets a recovery. Should be enough. All right. Man, just to sneak through with that weapon thrown to the unarmed recovery. Gets right by. Man, just to bait out that neutral light from Kaina and comes in with the slide kick recovery to get that game on Western Air Temple. Yeah, I mean, like, as I said, I mean, it may just maybe needed a little more space to work with, and it seems like that uh, did kind of work out for him. Still, bro, buddy is throwing no cigs, though. He's like, I don't yeah. do that. <laughs> like, I think that button just might not even be on. <laughs> well, he's got he's to have it for the recoveries, but he definitely don't like it, uh, like the sig kit or something. I don't know. I'm like, Jay, you, bro, you, got, you got some demonic signatures. Yeah. I think usually just waiting for the right time is maybe what it is as we hop into the next game in the set here. Use on game four has managed to finally put one on the board, leaned into the sword a little bit more, got a lot going based off of juggles, but now only one platform to worry about on the side of Kaino when coming back down. Oh, man, and I do want to uh, know. I do want want to see some stakes here from Yuz, but two, uh, I want to see if the sword become a bigger uh, asset in his gameplay. Weirdly enough, you know, he still didn't have the sword in his hand too often, but the damage uh, that he gave on it and took on it is pretty good. Ooh. You know, 198 uh, given, 92 Ooh. taken. 
My man is uh, still believing that great sword though, and the great sword is kind of kind of alive right now. I'll give him, I'll give it up. Definitely kind of alive. Yeah, I mean you can see Yuz is going for nares and down airs, right? And because it hits you down and then sends it up, he's really going for that vertical game plan now. Because something that people don't often realize is that the best moves, arguably on the great sword kit, are actually the aerials. People see the flashy Ooh. strings. Oh, we got a sig. 100% accuracy, my man. That's all. He, he won't throw another one out, bro. He won't throw another one out. He needs the stat to be absolutely. Pristine. Mm -hmm. Okay, not, nothing in hand here for Kaina. He's just kind of dancing in the middle. Nice. Okay, that was a. You know what? I'm Odin drop. Like, <laughs> you, you deserve this weapon for that weapon starve. He's just giving it to him. I mean, Muse is feeling so comfortable here with the sword. Gets the extra starve as well. Gets the recovery. He's going to be looking for these down air nares probably. Okay. He's getting, he's getting a little something something done while being unarmed, but use. You know, I mean, I, this man really woke up in the uh, second half of this set. It was looking like an easy 3-0 for a second, but kind of just not been able to close much out. And uses uh, now uh, if very much controlling the pace of this game. Oh, yeah. Use definitely leaning into that down air now. Just kind of wobbling around. Throws out a down air if it doesn't hit. Dodges away. Throws out a side air sometimes for a mix-up, but it really is down air city. If he hits kind of, he's going to go for recovery. He's going to go for side air, or he's going to go for an air. And now he's forcing him to play this up-down game as opposed to a left-right game. And sometimes it is that simple, right? The adjustments yeah. you have to make don't have to be major all the time. It could be as simple as where we fight on the stage. Oh. Speaking of where we're fighting on the stage right now, that was a, a large start right there for uh, kind of almost turned that into some, some uh, crazy amount of damage. But luckily, he was able to get back with that recovery. Nice. Okay. Yeah, he's starting to find some. That would have been a great uh, side air. Would have put Yuz in a terrible spot. However, unarmed him with that and now just trying to mark him, looking for a way to finish this stock off. That recovery wow. would have been great. And one, again, the, the hammer, very basic in its play style, very effective. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing from Muse, like, he was on the sword for the entirety of that last stock and just wasn't able to open up Kaina in the neutral game. Something about the sword into this hammer from Kaina is just proving difficult. So now, swapping over to that great score, he's been able to get straight hits here and there, but even finding the KOs has proven difficult. Went for a 50-50 there that works on dodges, but guess what? Kaina didn't dodge, you yeah. know? It's like, I either cut the left or cover right, and he said, what if I just wake up? That's one of the things that we've definitely seen from Kaina a bit, too. Like, nice. He's fine. He got to dodge this time, but, like, for a lot of the, uh, of the shrink where Yuz is looking for one hit and then uh, dash out to the rest of the string. Kind of just hit a button. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm down to hit a button. Really effective strategy. Waking up kind of similarly to the, like, the, the Scythe matchup where waking up is a big part of having effective defense. And we get a nice little dodge read right there. Yuz waiting. Kind of not burning the dodge button. But Yuz says, I'll keep pressing attack. Ooh, Ooh combos in and gets the recovery afterwards. Yuz making West Coast custom combos on Takina to secure game number four. All right, man. That was, look, I don't know how we got to this game five with the way that those first two games. <laughs> For real? But the but Yuz believing in himself, believing in his great sword. He is continuously still keeping that great sword out. 499 damage on that great sword this game while only taking 105. And Yuz, I mean, taking two, a big one, sigh ball. of relief after getting that game four. You can tell that the pressure is on. Both of these players want this so bad, but only one can be the victor here as we start game five on the Fortress of Lions. All right, and now. I gotta see if Kaina is able to stop the bleeding here because the Great Sword is getting maximum cuts on him. So this man is, well, he's doing a good job right now at the very beginning. He's finding his, uh, his, his, his combos, his two pieces. Nice. Ooh. Ooh. And disarmed him. Yeah, use man just gets a turnaround neutral light there, a chance to get a weapon. This sword hasn't been doing too great, admittedly, into the hammer of Kaina. But against the axe, I think Yuz actually has a pretty solid head-to-head -head matchup here so far, keeping Kaina in the corner. Goes for the ground pound, wanted a quick one, but Kaina doesn't give it to him. Nice. Okay, ow. Is he gonna keep, yeah, he's gonna swap over this hammer maybe? No, not gonna swap over the hammer, keep the axe in hand. Hey, my man is catching some D-lights. He is not catching that Blast Zone just yet, though. Nice. Oh! 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. Bullseye. He got it. And you know, it's wild because there was a moment there where Yuz was in disadvantage for a little bit because we got to see one of the rare interactions that can happen in this game where you go for sword, D-light, and axe. Neutral light has a little hop that causes the hitbox to just jump right over it. But despite all that, Yuz able to answer back, kind of sending a response in tow, and now we have a tie battle. 
Kind of going to go ahead and swap over to the hammer. The hammer Again, these, this hammer, I feel like this has been doing a little uh, better than his axe. In fact, looking at the last game, he actually dealt no damage on the axe. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. Insane. But yeah, we got the four, uh, 370 dealt on the hammer, taking 409. But you do have to remember there's 599 given last game from the Great Sword. So he was kind of taking the beats there. However, you know, I think if he's winning, he's going to be winning on this hammer. We'll see. I mean, use historically in the last game, kind of had a tough time playing into the hammer, but mm. this time doing a little bit better of a job. We'll see if Kaina is able to turn things around here using his one D-Light recovery, potentially if he can get back to the stage. Kaina is oppressive right now. This is like, it's, it's funny seeing the use now start to use some of these six. It was like, it, it felt like maybe he had the power. He's like, I'm only allowed to use six after I win. Yeah, so, I know. So he's like, I won the first game, I can use one six. He's like, okay, now I won the second game, I can use two six. All right. Ooh. Wow. Oh, Kaina does not fall for that one. That is the ranked special. <laughs> but Kaina's like, nah, bro, I played enough Jayuns <laughs> to know about that one, bro. But sometimes you got to let it rip. It works usually at least once a set, but mm -hmm. Kaina's just a better player sometimes. All right, man. We are last game, last stock. Whoever takes this will be moving on to the winner's, side, winner's finals of things. The other person has to fight just a little harder in the elimination bracket. Right now, I mean, again, use looking like he's on the way. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, okay, he's starting to throw out some moves we haven't seen at all today. <laughs> Getting juicy. He's like, I try every button at least once, use mm -hmm. every option, leave no table or corner unchecked. As use here, trying to rack up a bit of extra damage, goes for a safe follow up off of that down air. Kind of not pressing dodge, bro. Use doesn't know what to do about it. Hey, there he is. So where you going? You oh. can't run away. Oh, went oh. for a big swing. Oh, oh they're both. Going oh, oh. It hit. Okay, he's still living though. Oh, and he goes for the neutral sink. 100% accuracy. He don't miss. What a comeback here from you taking it reverse 3 0, believing in himself, even after getting absolutely de decimated in those first two games. He says, you know what? I just got to warm up. And well, when the oven was on, my boy was cooking a five course meal. Jeez. I'm thinking about it. I'm like, actually, I think he missed one neutral zig. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 75 percent, man. In fact, he do miss sometimes, but rarely. <laughs> yeah, we got we got a five count on the six, 40 percent accuracy of the, but the ones that he missed, uh, you know, you missed the trying to jump over the ledge. Missed yeah. The, oh yeah, I forgot about that one too. One a neutral zig a little earlier, but when it when it when it hits, it counts. When it came down to getting it for a stock, well, <laughs> I got the stock. Man, uh, on the N6, he was he was doing it, bro. Yeah. He was doing it. He was doing it. That that great sword side stick looked a little bit hail mary, but you know what? Despite all of that, you made the adjustments, man. And I'm happy that one of the adjustments was press the heavy button more. Yeah, press the heavy button more. And then on top of that, the other thing that you were pointing out, which was I, I felt like actually did uh, come to full fruition, the fact that man just decided, you know what? Well, instead of playing this horizontal game, which you know that the uh, the great sword is good at, that's the whole point of the combat weapon. What about just play a more vertical game? Down there, neutral airs, all that coming out. Looking for a couple of recoveries as well. My man uh, definitely had a different, a more unorthodox game plan than what you probably are normally used to seeing from the Great Sword, but it worked. Yeah, no, usually it's a game plan that you kind of lean into more against like weapons like Blasters or Rocket Lance, where they kind of control the ground with relative ease, despite the fact that the Great Sword is this huge weapon, mm -hmm. still gets outranged by those. But kind of taking a bit of that gameplay, that style, and saying, what if I apply that to Kaina and see how he's able to adapt? And the answer was not very well. Yuz did an immaculate job of coming alive in that set. I mean, making the complete turnaround. Yeah. So, I mean, that was, again, if you guys had watched the first few games, or the first two games, and you would just turn your stream off, you would have, you were going to be surprised at these results right here. But kind of just not able to close out that set, leaving that hole open for Yuz to come through with the reverse 3-0. The great swords are doing work here in this match in particular, uh, where I thought the hammer was going to be a good option for him. It seemed like it was not. The axe was definitely doing some work with the 394 damage, but where he needed that hammer to do what it was doing earlier as far as like thwarting the great sword it just not did not seem to happen in the later half of that set yeah no i mean kind of you know definitely a heartbreaker for sure I, so many people wanted to see kind of get so far on the winner's side of bracket mm -hmm. um you know still has that elimination side to get some things going of course but use not too surprisingly to anyone, I think. That was obviously an either way matchup, despite the viewer vote being a bit skewed in the favor of mm -hmm. Kaina. Mm -hmm. um, that Yuse can make a deep run. Yuse can win the entire thing. We're at that point in bracket now where all the people we're going to be seeing on the stage 
have as equal as an opportunity as others to go ahead and get that trophy we're looking at right now. Yeah, man, uh, they will be all trying to fight here for this trophy that you see, but we're going to get into the next match. This is going to be one I'm super excited to see right after this break. Golly versus Apollo will be coming up. BCX 2023 will be right back.
we are back with more BCX 2023 Championship Sunday as we whittle down our top eight to figure out who will go home, our champion in singles. And you already know I'm super excited for this match, the run back from a grand finals of last year. These guys might even get a chance to do it again, depending on how the rest of this bracket shakes out. But right now they're meeting each other in winter singles. Man. I'm, uh, I see the people are on the side of Godly, and after looking at his last performance, I can definitely see why, but I did see Apollo's last match on the side stream, and just his matches throughout the day. I understand, man, it's like, you know, I'm just kind of here for vibes, but it looks like he's playing for the glory, for sure. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, I mean, you guys are seeing in the viewer vote that, like, even last year, I think there was this huge expectation from the populace that, like, oh, yeah, Godly's going to win this one, right? I think a lot of people had Godly winning BCX last year, and then Impala came and proved otherwise. And so this is definitely going to mean a lot to Impala if he can get the run back as well. But for Godly, he wants that revenge. Yeah, and Godly, here's a couple highlights from him. You can just see exactly how he was piloting that Rayman to a victory over Meg. D. Those first two games, too, I mean, absolute destruction on the side of him, but was able to close it out, uh, you know, very handily, too. I mean, I, the, the games that make D was like, he was getting a little closer, but my man, uh, Golly, was like, you know, I'm just going to make sure we can get this thing uh, over and done with. On the other side of things, obviously, Impala, man, you know, BC X World Champion last year. We have that, like, slight buff of, hey, I won last year. I can do it again this year. I've been seeing that quite a bit, but we'll see if he actually is one to make it happen one more time. Look at the earnings again. Man won BCX. So that's what you know. That was yeah, that's where he came from. <laughs> but he got, that's one of his gold medals. Of the three gold medals he's, uh, he has, one of them is a BCX 2022. On the other side of things, Dolly obviously has been around for quite some time. He's got a lot of good placements, a lot of gold medals, a lot of silvers uh, as well. So my man is used to seeing that top two. Yeah, I mean, for Godly, like, especially on those online championships, was kind of farming you yep. for a while. Impala, on the other hand, kind of struggled a little bit in terms of the online championships. But on land, seems to get the power up. I can't even say on land. On BCX, yeah. in particular, seems to really get that power up. I mean, you guys are seeing two absolute legends of the game sitting before you. One of them already has a BCX title this year. We're going to see if he can maybe perhaps get two. On the other side, though, Impala looking to see if maybe the belt can be retained. Yeah, and so looking at their matchup history, the last time they played was DreamHack Valencia, and uh, that was a 3-0 in the way of Godly. Over the uh, over the Kaya with Wu Shang, but this time, obviously, probably going to try to pilot the, uh, the Rayman, uh, at least early on. Outside of that, though, Impala's won every, uh, every other match. So I think that's definitely something you're going to think about. Six to nine on the game. So obviously, even the matches that uh, Impala has won, we got some W's here on the side of Godly. But a 3-0, man, that's a, that's a dominant way to go ahead and, and, and get that get back, you know? Yeah, there's part of me that's like the head-to-head -head seems to really matter here in terms of like... I'm sure for Godly, I mean, he's a competitor, so he's ready to be anyone he comes up against, but just looking at the bracket and the way it can shape out, sometimes you'll watch people win brackets and never have to defeat the person that beat them in the tournament prior, right? right. And that's kind of, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it was an easy win because you never had to fight the person that beat you before. But Godly, I think, loves this. I think he needs this to really feel like he's going to be the champion of everyone, right? You can't be the best and never get the dub over the dude who beat you last year. I was like, I thought he was in the Discord for a second. Now he actually texted for some help. Like, <laughs> SOS. <laughs> Godly looking serious over there. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. So Godly, though, yeah, is going. I mean, my man is poised up there. He said, I only have one idea, and it's to win this tournament. I've already won the first one, but being the singles and doubles champion winner, yeah, bro, that's... I, I, that's, that's how you know. Like, no one can take any type of win away from you. Like, I came to BCX and farm both brackets. Like, come on now. I'm really, really, really interested to see how he deals with the Kaya, just because when we were talking a little bit earlier, and everybody knows me, I, whenever they say, hey, Flambo, what do you think the best weapon in the game is? My answer has been bow for years, right? And so I pull up on Godly, and Godly's like, yo, when people do dash bow delight on land it, it seems impossible to react to and i'm like yes i've been saying this for years brother so i want to see how he's able to deal with impala on that kaya because you know he's going to be going for those dash delights okay here we go we're getting into an all miami dome our first game between godly and impala in the run back of last year the bcx champion 
Going against the man who almost became the BCX champion. Ooh. Uh-oh. And I think he's got something to say. I mean, a great start there for Gali. Almost turned that into a very early stock. And he, I mean, he is Jeez. putting the beats on him. My man can't get a single weapon right now. Can't even get a hit. Finally finds one. Oh, oh the last the one. Oh. Sniped him. He's out of there. That's a hot start for Godly. I, I I don't even know what to say. That was, he got pieced up. Impala gonna have to shake that one off. Godly so easily able to make quick work of that first off from Impala. But Impala, no stranger to kind of getting hit really hard in the beginning and slowly adjusting over time. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's one of the resilient things about this uh, player, just top players in general, man. Sometimes you're just going to lose a stock like yeah. that. Sometimes you, you you may just start the game at a, at, at a stock deficit, bro, you know, but you got to be able to, uh, you know, be reserved, steal yourself back down, and get that W. And he's uh, doing a good job. Hasn't taken a crazy amount of damage on the second stock yet while putting Gali in the position of being able to uh, be taken out if he can find himself. Nice. Good Ow. weapon toss. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, though, Gali. Not seeing any type any, any type of blast zone right now. Uh oh. Another end light burns the recovery to go high, put a little bit of additional aerial pressure, and Impala finally with some stage position here. Needs to get the first stock off of Godly. Won't be able to get a chance here as he gets this arm by these neutral lights, and that might be the stock. Not quite enough. Kaya, of course, with so much defense, gonna have one more shot here. Oh jeez. Yeah, where are you going? Only to the blast zone yet again. Impala is struggling right now in this first game. But Godly, living up to his name, that's exactly how he's playing right now. Oh, for sure. I mean, absolutely showing no signs of stopping. And Paula just trying to break up the monotony a little bit. And that weapon throw is going to create the opening that he needed to get that first stock. But uh, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> that's a, almost an understatement with the way that has been playing. Took this long to finally get a stock off of Godly. Whenever I get to look at that chart, I know it's going to look a little lopsided for sure. But, oh my gosh. Yeah. Godly, once again, just doing a really good job of controlling space. Also, not a friend. Like, he, take, he takes hits, and then he was willing to throw that button out. Like, he just understands his disadvantage. And when he's actually at disadvantage right now, he's not really been at disadvantage for much uh, too long. Looking for that jump read. No one there, but it didn't matter. Give me your weapon and give me your stock all in one hit. What a first game from Godly. Two stock in the yellow. Look at that graph, bro. Jeez. 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 What? <laughs> that buddy was living. That second stock, I mean, he actually had a, almost, a, almost a full minute stretch. Actually, more than a minute stretch where he just did not get hit. Wow. Man. I mean, Godly. You said it earlier, right? Playing to the name there, making it look so tough for Impala there. I mean, for the vast majority of that game, I feel like the only sound that I was hearing in my headset was do 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 Like, you are getting pummeled, bro. Like, get out of here. Get up. Definitely got pummeled. We did get a swap. Uh-oh. Is that a swap or is that a background? Two, one, no, we, got, we got the same dude. We got the same dude. Oh, okay. I was going to say, hold up. Sight. Oh. It looked like Kaya because I saw the hat, but actually we have Ember. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we did get a swap. That's the Ember, the Ember swap right here. We're going to bring out the Katars. Going to keep the bow in hand. And from looking at this last game, uh, well, I guess it really didn't matter. I mean, we got 82% damage dealt on the bow and 96 damage dealt on the uh, on the spear. So neither one of those weapons really doing him crazy favors. Uh, honestly, it felt like he just what didn't get a chance to swing at all in the first place. So. Oh my goodness. And before the set even started, we were talking about how is Godly going to have to deal with the dash D lights from Impala's bow? They have been a non factor in this set so far. Godly's just been doing such an easy job of controlling the neutral that Impala's felt on the back foot pretty much the entire time. I think genuinely you can't really dash, uh, you know, yeah, you definitely can't dash bow in if you never uh, get that space anyway. Godly has been keeping this super close quarters. Uh oh. Looking for, looking for a hard punish out Ow. there, but he demands the sound. Just the sound. Ding, ding. Oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> really getting peace up here. I mean, Impala trying to hang on. Gets grabbed. Uh-oh. In the corner here against Gauntlet. You don't want that. Has no weapon as well. Almost gets scooped. Man, can Impala make it back here? Okay, that dodge through is going to give him an opportunity to pick up a weapon. What is he going to do with it? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I actually feel like I've never actually seen his guitar, so I'm very interested to see how this one plays out. Uh, and if this is going to work out for him, or did he just want a different set of bow sigs and, uh, you know, obviously stats as well. But he's stuck on this weapon. Can he make it work? Throws those away. Unfortunately, the, the Odin's uh, drop is going to give it directly to Gali, who does end up losing that stock regardless. Okay, it's, yeah, he wants the bow. For sure wants the bow. 
Yeah, I want to see, you know, at least a side like D-Light convert something to get something started. That's a nice little start here with the side like gets the dash forward, dash back, trying to bait out the dodge from Godly. But Godly very confident in his wake-ups today. Yeah, all right. He gets the dodge out this time around, but Godly so oh. far has been so aggressive. I think that might have been... Oh, the weapon toss trade. Unfortunately, you were at the blast zone when I threw mine down. And now Godly with a very, very solid lead yet again. Ooh, Apollo's yeah. still looking kind of lost here, but you know, sometimes I think Apollo, he's definitely one of those players that ramps up, so I don't want to count anybody out until the, the set's actually over, but Godly, for sure, is trying to make short work of this set. Yeah, no, you can tell by the way Godly's playing that he is tight about last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there is no way I wanted you to win that one, and so definitely on the run back, he's trying to make it look convincing, and convincing he is making it look, because Impala maybe gonna lose the stock here, actually gets a chase dodge and a turnaround, maybe? Oh, and he touched wall, just barely touching wall, getting back there. Surprisingly, both of our competitors are going to make it back to the stage. But still, I mean, yeah, Apollo definitely needed that. Otherwise, that was going to be the end of this second game. Watch your head. All right. Get back to the stage yet again. Swap up positions right there. Oh, the wall cutting that short, though. Recovery goes into the wall, drops a little bit there. Godly tries to go for a gravity cancel, neutral stick. It doesn't connect, and Paula forces Godly off the stage yet again. He's the final blow. Not going to be a punish on that gravity cancel. And Paula is being patient, tries to get the sig out, and then. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Not enough yet, but I think the second one God, is going to make the wall, but Godly's going to be right there to pick that up super quick with it. 2 0 in the favor of Godly now. The swap over to, uh, to Ember did not work. I don't even, would, would you say it even helped? It helped, it helped. 526 to uh, 570 damage, yeah, no, it definitely helped. I, I don't really know what to do if you're Impala here, right? I mm -hmm. mean, clearly you're doing a little bit of soul searching in terms of your legend pick. I feel like most people would concur that like Kaya is a strong legend in just the overall meta right now, mm -hmm. and I don't know that necessarily swapping off was, was the play, but as you said, switching to the Ember did help, but by how much? I mean, these games are still looking brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd say Golly, you know, just looking at him, he is locked in, okay? Man, I'm surprised he's even blinking. Like, no, for real. I'm surprised he's even blinking. This is going to be a hard one for Apollo. And now has to make the reverse 3-0 to two, have a shot one, of remaining oh. in the bracket on the winner's side. We're going to Miami Dome this time, but maintaining that Ember pick. So I think he has some belief in this guitars, or maybe he just wants a different set of bow signatures. Yeah, looking at the the, uh, the uh, breakdown yet again, the guitars, I mean, they were out for 28% of the time, which is like, all right, that's all right. But the damage and the damage taken were pretty negligible, 83 to oh. one and 104. He really is still that boat uh, train, but uh, he's really on the on the damage train or the pain train, really. <laughs> My man is not able to get any hits. Finds a little okay. creep. Okay, here we go. Fighting back. Get back to the stage aggressively. All right, he's ready to chop a little bit with these guitars, but gets hit by that neutral light one more time. The gloves get thrown. He lands on the stage, tries to get a turnaround there, and gets hit by a side stick from Godly, but still alive here. No. He's coming in. Swinging with that Nair, and wow, that end light is gonna be enough from Godly. Just racks up the damage so fast, especially against a low defense legend like Ember. Those end lights are gonna be that much more potent of a KO option. Nice. Oh, okay, wow, looking for the big swing. Where are you going? He's, he's actually been able to avoid that every time so far. The, yeah. uh, the neutral sticks have definitely not uh, hit for Godly at all. Or uh, Impala. Impala just seemingly, I mean, you do have this new set of signatures on this Ember, but can't seem to have the accuracy. That grab cancel D like ground pound, though, on a punish, I believe it was an axe recovery, is going to put Impala back into this game. Wow, wake up again from Godly. Nice. We are starting to get some signs of life here from the Godly, uh, or the Impala Katars, though. You know, I'm sure we're all used to seeing uh, the bow and oh, like, oh again. keeps getting clipped by that last one. And yeah, just Godly just so surgical with the way that he's placing these edge guards. He gets the hit to push a little further down, knowing that your resource is pretty out, and you know exactly the time to jump off that stage and drop a ground pound on you. All right, let's see if the former BCX champion can go ahead and come back into this game. Trailing behind by a stock has to do some fancy footwork here to get back into the game, but Godly has proven pretty confidently that he's able to show why he's Godly. Man, God, Godly straight up in his gameplay is calling Apollo a waste man. Like this. <laughs> You're rubbish fun. <laughs> this is actually crazy the way he's been able to take this. now. Not enough, though. 
Apollo not too far behind to be uh, all things considered here in the, uh, this third game. Still can't get Golly off of the second stock though. And there it is. Finally finds himself a neutral sig. A is going to be the one to hit. And now back into the game only in the yellow. He can definitely make this comeback. All right, it's time for Impala to look alive here. This could potentially be your final shot in the winner's side of bracket. Godly yet again waking up with Neutralites out of disadvantage. Impala having a chance here to get some damage, but not enough racked up on Godly for it to really be threatening. Has to find something else here. Gets scooped up. Godly looking for potentially the final blow here. Impala needs to make sure he doesn't get caught by the final glove again. Uh oh, oh wow. that is just it. I did not expect the power off of that, but Godly knew as he moves on to winner's finals. Man, it just that lower defense on that Ember in comparison to Kyle really showing itself there as they hug it out. And Impala is going to go ahead and take a moment to recuperate himself as he prepares for his next bout in the elimination side of bracket. Yeah, man, he's going to have to do something. You know, you, you're going to have to fight your way back to the top if you want a chance to be the BCX champion yet again. But the man who feels like he should have been BCX champion last year is definitely putting up the fight to show you that is absolutely accurate. Yeah, no, I mean, Godly, I, I wish I could say that that set looked more close than it did, but Godly very convincingly was able to make Impala feel like a non-issue. Mm -hmm. He definitely gave him the respect that a former world champion deserves, but Godly always has this mindset, this approach to the game where he feel like he can beat anybody and he plays with that level of confidence. There we go. I say, like, cleaned him up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Let me wash my hands real quick. Yeah, no, absolutely did it there. Uh, looking at the stats here, 497 to the 454. So the games were ramping up, and like, yes. I kind of expected that from uh, Impala. The first game, it was like, you know, 500 to 250 or something, right? Now we're getting closer games. Could have potentially turned that around, found some opportune uh, edge guard play, but he just was not able to do that. So the 3 0 on the winner's semis, leaving Golly now in to winner's finals. Just waiting to see what happens. Who's going to meet him up there? That's what he's looking for. Man, what a solid lap. What a solid set just all together. A solid two sets we've got to see of Golly so far, but a solid set of this one. Look at the damage chart, man. You know, my buddy was, uh, he was living. He was living. You look at that middle section right there, that long yellow line, his buddy was just living. He was vibing. <laughs> Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at the top 12 bracket, just so we can kind of get an idea of how we got to this point. You guys can see it in front of me. Godly, 3-1 over Megdi. We just watched the 3-0 over Impala. Has to fight Yuz in the winner's finals. But meanwhile, looking at the elimination side of bracket, we see Akno versus Knees, Blaze versus Sandstorm. And then the winner of that Blaze and Sandstorm match has to go up against Impala. It is completely stacked here. I don't want to be any of these people. Not at all, man. And I'm, I'm like happy to see that uh, Sandstorm is definitely still in, you know, that's, that's my guy, you know, that's my guy. But we got uh, some very, very hard matches to have in the bottom side of things, which I think we'll be seeing soon. But Acno, Knees, Blaze, Sandstorm. And then the bottom is still full of killers with Kinda sitting down there, with Impala sitting down there. It's not an easy match for anybody. Yeah, man. And this also kind of reveals to me that Skeldra didn't make it into that top eight. Definitely had a great run with that great sword. But of course, some people have to go home for us to crown our victor, but want to give kudos when this crowd though, like, everybody's hanging out. Make some noise for yourself, crowd. We love to see you out here having some fun. There we go, man. Look at that. I mean, come on, y'all definitely love Brawlhalla more than that. Y'all can get louder than that. Come on, give me some energy. Yeah. There we go. That's what I need. We need to see that right there. If you came, if you're sitting in the Brawlhalla of this Expo Center, man, we very much appreciate you for coming out. Because, man, BCX, nothing without the crown, man. You know, we got all kind of great things to do here. We got the merch store. We got the uh, the gaming pit. We have the, the arcade. And then we got people we can just hang out with. Yeah, and especially for that new Legend 61, if you are in the venue and you haven't gotten a chance yet, please make your way over to give that new Legend a shot. Okay. Yeah, there we go, man. So here we are looking at the head-to-head, -head, though. You saw that was big money on the on the screen. And it looks like we're almost, I mean, we're pretty down the middle with the Acno and Knees. People, uh, you know, kind of split on it, 59 to 41, nothing crazy right there. That's a regular matchup, 60-40 right there. Yeah, I mean, this is like a, a tale of old money versus the young bucks, right? Like, Acno clearly has put in the hours, has put in the work, has so many titles. Knees, on the other hand, has been playing the game for years, so I don't want to say old money in terms of, like, like, he hasn't been around, but he just started so young. He was, like, 12 or something when he first started competing in Brawlhalla and has, over the years, only gotten better. More recently, making it into that top three consistently, it's going to be 
one of the harshest battles, but a European Team KO. Yeah, you know what? The Team KOs have been happening already. You know, we saw the obviously the kind of uh, drop in to the to you use. Yeah. It had to happen though, man. You know, after a while, you guys are just so good that you're going to run into somebody that you may have practiced with. You know, you want them to do well, but you don't want them to do better than you. So. Yeah, for real. Here we go as we're getting everything set up. Knees over there. Back on the other side. It's going to be a good one. And it's been a, a good year for Knees. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I got the pleasure of interviewing him for the Winter Royale and kind of getting a, a clue into his mindset. And over the years, not only not even the year, over this year in particular, not only has he routinely made it to Royale after Royale, even just as a character and a comfort as a person, we've seen him animate more, really come to life, start talking more trash too. You know, I love it when the players start talking trash to each other because that means they are confident. But we're gonna see how that confidence Three, matters as two, we go into this one, top one. eight elimination match of Acno versus Knees. Here on Apocalypse as well, you know, they got the two characters that you saw on the screen out it's gonna be the more X and it's gonna be it. That was actually super nice right there. And it's gonna be the Ragnar. I know Ajax is in the back right now, hoping for a W. That man loves himself some Ragnar, but every time he had compensated one today, that Ragnar lost. So my man was <laughs> <laughs> my man had a clean, clean tear down his eyes right there. Hope this this Ragnar though is putting on for Ajax. Acno might uh, might break the curse here with the way that he was able to sauce up knees on that first stock. I mean, granted, Ragnar, a legend we haven't been seeing pretty much at all. We saw a little bit of Viper earlier, but in BCX, apparently it's time for him to make the comeback. Will this be the end of Ragnar, or will Mordex return to form? We got to touch that stage, buddy. I was, like, it's a little, I was like a little surprised to see that this might actually be the first Mordex I've seen at all. Yeah. I, I thought this character would never get out of popularity, but... Seems like, uh, you know, we still got knees obviously in the top uh, top eight, so someone's piling his more X to great uh, success. But, oh, ooh. Man, not so much uh. here in this match, man. Another set where somebody is starting off entirely too hot, and knees got now going to be the one to heat up quicker than, uh, you know, super quick, because right now my man is getting absolutely de destroyed. Gonna see here, gets uh -oh. that down there. That's gonna be the stock, and knees responds in tow here, but has a whole stock deficit. I think the scythe is the option to go for here. You get that neutral light, you go for a string, maybe the 50 50, get 70 guaranteed damage, or carry Acno off stage, and you're back into this game. He sends them forward. I thought for sure he was gonna send them back. Yep. You know, try to get that stage control uh, established super early, but no, maybe we want to try to get him with a, a little bit of a mix-up combo. Even Acno probably expected to be behind him at that point in time. Does it this time around. However, Acno, oh. good job of fighting his way out of that situation and immediately explodes with a dash sig, and it hits. It's, man, that's, that man's got to have some accuracy on that. Okay, we got 10 uh, sigs and 30 accuracy, so three of them hit. And really, I mean, the, three that, the two of them that did hit, Ended up in the stock, so yeah. that's exactly what you want your sig to do. You hit the sig, it takes a stock. <laughs> that's, that's the reason you're pressing the button, right? Yep. A lot of the time, and Agno making it look very convincing. I mean, it, that Ragnar Axe side sig can hit so freaking hard, and we watched it, we observed it. That neutral sig as well being a good one. I mean, Agno, all the stocks he got were with signatures. Mm -hmm. What's up? Boom, there it is. Three, so, two, all right, right, taking one, it right back four. to APOC knees. Just gotta wake up, really. Like, I mean, there's nothing else you can say about the gameplay, but like, you just got absolutely ran over by uh, Acno. I'm sure that there's some thought process in there, you know, but from my, from the super limited quick analysis, one, stop getting hit by Sigs and Red, and two, wake up. Yeah, no, it, it's very interesting, too, because a lot of the year we saw Knees on the Lucian. Uh, you know, it's kind of when everyone was playing Blasters. We had a lot of Blasters guitars, but instead switching over now uh, to the Scythe in more recent times. Almost gets the scoop right there. Has a ground pound opportunity. No, we see a recovery in the wrong direction from Acno. And that one is kind of a little bit of a Make-A-Wish Foundation stock. So for our partners with Make-A-Wish this year, please make sure you guys donate and get your limited time avatar and title of Wishmaker. <laughs> I was good. I was good. <laughs> he definitely, definitely granted that stock for free, bro. All I want is a <laughs> stock for Magno, which granted. Thank you, Joe, brother. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> All right. Knees is going to be fighting his way into this, uh, into this set this time around. Even if it was off the heels of a, somewhat of an SD, he's going to take that to the bank. Okay. Okay. Or maybe not. Oh, oh man, I was like, don't get don't get X-Man right now. Bro. Yeah, no, for real. 
Oh man, gave him the whole left, right, half pipe, traditional Qatar setup there. And that cider from Akno is maybe gonna be enough. Yep, one more cider to make sure. And that's gonna be Knees falling yet again to a deficit. This time, not trailing as far behind as he was in the last game. Yeah. Okay, Akno. Just going to get immediately thrown off. Great dodge right there. Tries to go back on the offensive immediately, though. Maybe try, maybe establish a little more uh, stage control here. Uh-oh. Nice. Good dodge, actually. Do good dodge in from knees to go ahead and avoid that, because, you know, he had just burnt it, so if he had happened to uh, get hit, that was about wow. to be the, the half-pipe yet again. Scooped and sent up out of there, though. Where are you going? Only to the blast zone. Not a super huge lead here for uh, Akno, but not something that you know. You already know he can add up that damage. He's got the Katars in the hand. See if he decides to use these, or is he going to try to go for a weapon swap as soon as possible? Because, I mean, really, the, the Axe did a lot of damage for him in that last game. Oh. In fact, I didn't even look until just now. He did not do any or take any damage on the Katars last game. Wow, okay. Clearly a different game then with the mm -hmm. way that he's moving. Chopping up knees, but knees trying to answer back. He gets hit by that Spitfire. It's not enough, but now knees on the back foot here. Gets hit by the backswing of that recovery. Akno trying to close out the game. Knees, the weapon spawns on the opposite side. Has to get over there. Bates, Akno to swing it to the right, and manages to pick up that weapon. He has a chance now, and this could be the string that he needs. No, he doesn't get the dodge read. I was like, good. I mean, Jukes right there from Knees, though. I think a lot of people kind of panic and immediately try to get over there, but no, he, he mixed up his right. Oh, not the big whiff, putting himself in perfect position to get hit in the back of the dome with that stare, and you know it was going to be over. Yeah, I mean, at this point, Akno's effectively saying to Knees, like, bro, you got to earn your stripes. I've been the top dog for so long. Yeah, sure, there was a moment where I fell off for a little bit, you know, took a little bit more time, decided to go touch some grass. But now I am back, and I am in full swing, and Nice does not seem to have an answer. You know, Agno is definitely playing, like, he's trying to tell Nice he wasn't supposed to be in this top eight the way that he's playing right now. For real? <laughs> like, he's like, you know what, I don't know how you got here, but I'm going to make sure you don't get any further. 2-0 in the way of Agno right now. Nice has been on the receiving end of some damage for sure. He even had a slight lead there. You can see it on the chart how early Agno dropped, and that allowed Nice to get a, a slight lead, but he didn't really make anything with it. As you can see, there's a slight damage bump before you see his stock drop, which means he maybe got like a hit or two in there, and then immediately it was an even game again. Yeah, and I'm wondering, do you stick with the Mordex here? Something that I'm so used to seeing Knees do is have these immaculate plays off stage. Sometimes he looks like a, a god, a genius, Pavelski-level type plays of just, Three, I don't know, two, tomfoolery, one, but it looks like a million IQ play. And it looks like on the side of Knees, he decides, you know what, let me put the Mordex away and pick Val instead, which is going to give you a bit more consistency when it comes to finding those KOs because you do have that sword, but you don't have that X factor that you had from the Scythe. Yeah, the Scythe, that's, that, that's usually what you kind of get off the Scythe is that, like, I really could just steal a whole stock if you if you guess wrong at the wrong position. So, unfortunately, you don't really get that type of luxury so much from oh. uh, Val, but you do get just a solid character. Oh, the ground pound slightly off in Akno. So quick with the recognition. He'd be like, you missed and you're gone for it. Yeah, I mean, I have to give it up for Nice too, because there's a lot of time where people go for the wall touch and they're like trying to read the immediate jump off. Yeah. So like, I was like, all right, that's a decently placed ground pound, but Akno was just able to read him. Mm-hmm. Okay, nice. All right, caught him on the way up though. Unfortunately, that six does not have the crazy amount of power on it. It's just a very kind of safe sig, really. That's what you throw that out for. Get that little bit of extra damage there as Knees trying to get some extra hits that neutral light. Ooh, the Kobe is going to push a little bit further, but still has to get the edge guard. And is just going to wait. A neutral light maybe on stage might push Akno to the corner. There's another neutral light, but this time from the middle of the stage, it was not going to be enough to KO. Goes for the yeet. That means he has to burn the recovery there, but Knees can't get in position to secure the knockout. He's, he's definitely swinging for the. Uh, managed to find that. Okay, good stuff. The, the neutral dodge does allow him to drop down or fast fall into that recovery to go ahead and take that stock. He was struggling a little bit to find uh, that last hit that was going to take past that blast zone. You can see by the damage that he's already taken. The man's sitting in that uh, bright or, or that orange, that that orange red. Let's get into those. Uh, you know those kill those kill percentages. All right, let's see. Akno once again trying to hunt down knees, knees, using these dash landings to try to mix up the spacing as Akno doesn't want to give knees an easy way back into this game. He has him in the red. He wants to secure the knockout before knees can do much, but it's a little too late here. Knees is finding unanswered hits. That's going to be a punish. No, goes for the juiciest punish he can get, but just a little bit too slow. Oh, 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 oh man. Wow. wow. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> like, just watch your neck, bro. 
Okay, Ooh. he's uh, shut that fire up for sure with the with the neutral sig. Like to see it. Abel got able to get himself back on stage and oh. some good damage. We oh. are swinging. Akno is swinging, and Knees is definitely capitalizing on all of these whiffs. That was perfect spacing from Knees there. This close to getting chopped by that gravity cancel side sig, but instead manages to find a haymaker of his own. And now gonna go ahead and pick up this weapon. Has the sword Knees throwing away the guitars, I believe, wants that axe. And maybe that was a bad idea from Agno. Forced himself an arm for a little bit and takes a fair amount of damage because of it. Okay, Akno really just needs one Sayer if he can find it. Even a neutral light should be able to do it from anywhere on the stage. The down light, almost enough. Unfortunately, that 45 degree angle is usually the worst angle to send anybody if you're looking for a, a, a stock. Nice trade for Akno there is going to lead to that stock being taken. But Nees was able to get a pretty fair amount of damage on that penultimate stock here. If he can just get a weapon, he can start fishing for the final KO and get that one game on the board. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. He said, I'm just throwing out big hitboxes. They are definitely working out that jump up ground uh, pound. Uh, you kind of just spin a, a huge hitbox in the, in the same area. Very akin to like really just using a, a slow version of the spear near. Oh, Knees looking for the D-Light recovery. Doesn't do it in the right direction. Uh -oh. That recovery on its own isn't going to be enough. Needs to find another D-Light. Goes for Ooh. the weapon stop. Actually wanted the sword, but couldn't quite line up the weapon pickup with that. But you know what? At least he has Akno unarmed. Psych, not anymore. Yeah, Akno was able to find a weapon, but it only takes but a couple of more uh, shots here from Knees to take this one. Akno. Oh, wow. okay. Sneaky with it. Getting back on with the uh, neutral light. And now he's starting to add some damage. It goes for a big swing, but not a big punish there from Knees. Okay, wow. What a grab from Akno. Akno baiting the dash land. Goes for the grab, cancel, and sing, and that's going to be it. No Akno way. gets the 3 0 oh, 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 oh. with a gravity cancel and sing. And what looks like was going to be Knees' game, but just steals it right from under his nose. Oh, man. I feel bad for him, bro. That was, you know, <laughs> that rad. That's not the way I was expecting that to end at all. But, you know, he did a, a good option of, you know, if you try to jump up here, I'm going to be there. But he did not expect that level of patience for Akno. Gets the perfectly placed, turned it around too, so he didn't even hit the wall. He's like, I just want, I want to make sure this goes exactly where it needs to go. Get the W from under the stage, man. Yeah, and it was a tough position too, because before we saw Akno had done a dash land off of the corner into that end light to yep. hit knees. And so he was like, all right, you're going to try to do that again. He was setting up the spacing for it, it looked like. So I'm going to hit you before you get there. Mm -hmm. And then Akno was like, actually, I baited you. Yep. Big Dang. bait right there, man. That's what you love to see. Akno taking that 3 0 and even off the heels of almost losing that uh, third game. You know, he was very close to, well, he was literally just one good hit away from uh, losing that, but Knees was just not able to find that final hit. Akno gonna knock Knees out of his bracket and keep it going for himself as his next opponent, uh, was, uh, was he on the Sandstorm side or the Impala side? I, I, I gotta look again, I gotta look again. Yeah, no, I mean, granted, it doesn't matter. Wherever he's fighting, it's, it's either Kiner or Impala and it is gonna be rough. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. As a former world champion right there. I mean, oh, we're seeing it again right here. He baits it, and then the gravity cancel ends it. And that one's so tough because with the way that that set was trending, Akno nipped the flower in the bud at the perfect moment because mm -hmm. had Knees won that game, it was trending as if he might be starting the reverse 3-0. Yeah. I got to give it up to that. I like the new announcer having, like, different um, things to say at the end because oh, yeah. I definitely, like, if you had caught my face during the end of that, I definitely was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Me and the announcer were on the same wavelength. <laughs> So, yeah, man, look at it right here. You could tell that that was coming from behind him. 569 damage to 651. Knees really ramped up. He did, he did what he needed to do there, but just could not find that last hit. But it was good to see that the Val came out and the swap actually was worth it. Genuinely, sometimes, you know, you see that swap and somebody getting body, you're just like, oh, so you had no answers. But he did kind of have an answer here. Just the last play, big, huge play uh, right there from Agno is going to go ahead and steal off and steal away that game. Yeah, I wonder if in the head of knees there, you're kind of wishing, oh man, I wish I tried that Valen game too. Yeah. Because then that could have been the difference maybe between having a completely different outcome in that set. But we're going to find out in just a moment how the rest of the bracket is going to unfold. Because, I mean, we got players like Akno still hanging on. We got players like Sandstorm still hanging on. We have Yu's doing absolutely. I'm still in shock by that Yu set, to be yeah. honest. He looked like he was about to get cooked. There is just so much to look at and so much in store here at BCX. You guys won't want to miss it. Stay tuned. We'll be back after a quick little break.
to BCX 2023. We are now about to get into some more hot matches. I mean, we're already in the top eight, and it's been good. I'm TK Joe, my man Flambo. We've been having a great time up here. I hope you guys have been having a great time, not only in the crowd, but also in the chat. I know I've been seeing the votes go out. It's been a good time, but man, Blaze, Sandstorm, that's what's coming up next. You know I'm excited. Yeah, no, I mean, this is Sandstorm, obviously. Fan favorite, crowd favorite. Everyone loves to see just how wild he can go on the sticks, but is in the elimination side of Bracket. And so would have to make a really deep run to collect yet another BCX title. Oh yeah, now I think we're in this, this is one of those matches. I know that this is the photo thing to do, but I really need that 3-2-1 brawl. You know what I mean? I need that from the crowd. Can y'all do that for me? Can we get the 3-2-1 brawl going? Is that cool? There we go. All right, thank you. All right, we're gonna do, we're gonna get some three, two, one brawl going because this is this is definitely the match that deserves it uh, right here. So game is about to get started. We're going into it. Two, uh, just two seasoned competitors. You no, know, Acton Blaze has been around for a better uh, a long time. So was obviously Sandstorm, but uh, Blaze Sandstorm gonna be heading up against each other. The Tesca is on the screen because that's what I want to see. That is definitely what I want to see. I love that character. This is the big money earnings right there from uh, both of them. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Sandstorm, Blaze. Uh oh. Three, Here we go. Two, one, brawl. Thank y'all. There we go. Get the three, two, one brawl going. Probably Sandstorm and the Tesca is indeed out. So my man's about to be dropping some kick. Well, he's going to be dropping all kind of uh, close quarters combat, you know, with the gauntlets and the boots uh, in tow. And maybe a couple slams, too, depending on how things go. At this point, I mean, pretty much the only representation of boots that we have left in this bracket, effectively. But Sandstorm has proven both in the singles and doubles landscape that his boots are nothing to be uh, <laughs> slept on quite literally. I mean, he's getting all kinds of strings that I've seen no one else get. Yeah, his boots are filthy, man. So I, I feel like he's definitely been in the lab. Or is, is this just pure gamer intuition? Like, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that you just want to know. But I've got the uh, update on the stats. And Sandstorm, so they've only played once. Sandstorm took that 3-1, and it looks like he's trying to take that even faster this time around. A, a boots W right there. He takes that first stock. Uh-oh, watch the combo. Oh, oh where are you going? Oh, okay, I was like, don't, <laughs> no, he's don't let going. him do it. He ain't stopped yet. <laughs> oh, man, but Sandstorm just showing what those boots are all about. Nothing quite like it. On the other side, though, Blaze trying to stop this man. I mean, Prince Zuko ain't never seen kicks like this. No, not at all, bro. He was, he was like, I, the whole time I've been wanting to fight the Avatar, and this was happening <laughs> to me now. <laughs> oh, I should have been looking out for Tesca. Like, all what, right. What kind of bending is this? <laughs> This is going to be a tough one, though. I mean, granted, we have a decent response from Blaze there with that gravity cancel. D-Light into the ground pound to get some extra juicy damage, but Sandstorm still putting on that pressure. Oh, oh yeah. But man, and let me get your weapon, too, before you leave. <laughs> yeah, for real. Let me take that. Another one going the way of Sandstorm on small Brawl Haven as well. So it means he has so much more affordances in terms of getting those early KOs with those boots on other stages where you might be able to sustain yourself a little bit longer. Nice. Okay. Uh, he, he truly kind of got uh, Sandstorm, or not Sandstorm, but Sandstorm has Blaze looking just a little lost about what to do against these boots because my man is taking some beats. Man, he managed to get a dodge in this time around. And I think that's going to be something that Sandstorm is going to uh, account for if he gets that same type of opening. Speaking of. Okay, no, can't dodge in when you're too far off the stage. Gosh. It's drifting with hitbox. Get out of here. Wait a minute. How we finish this one? Look for another one. Nobody home there for that uh, next side here. Oh! Yeah, and he loves to do that as well because it puts him back on stage. Yeah. If it whiffs, the positioning is still a Mac at the weapon throw. He gets so wild with those weapon throws. I've seen some Sandstorm Twitter clips about what he does with those weapon throws, but a D-Light Sare is going to be all he needs to get that first game off of Blaze, and I'm not going to lie to you, TK, that looked easy. Uh, I mean, uh, that look, he's playing ranked right now. <laughs> Buddy is playing ranked. Well, this, this is just another day in the life of Sandstorm for sure. This is going to be something that we're going to have to see if uh, – Zuko can make any, I mean, if he can figure anything uh, out, because Zuko, yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this was not the episode he wanted to be in. I say that. Yeah, no, for real. Like, <laughs> one, He's that buff from Sozin's Comet or something. Yeah. <laughs> so far, it's looking rough for Blaze. And granted, you know, one of the tough things about this is Battle Boots, a newer weapon. How many opportunities have people really had to play against Sandstorm's boots on land? Mm -hmm. The answer is not many. And so just trying to figure out what's even going on can be difficult when you've never played cold quite a player like Sandstorm on this weapon. Okay. Sandstorm, Ooh, like that. I mean, the, the reverse neutral air 
Really, I mean, he's covering a bunch of space too, man. You try to dodge up, you probably get hit by that. You don't dodge in far enough, you're probably still getting hit. And he might not always get a follow up, but it also is relatively safe the way he's going for. Uh oh. Okay, gets stuffed out by the neutral light there, but then immediately throws out that down sig, hits that Rey Mysterio 619, sends him backwards, and now Sandstorm still fishing for that first stock. Blaze, though, doing a great job of keeping things relatively even. It would be so big for him if he was able to get a lead, but Sandstorm shuts down that dream immediately with that gravity cancel neutral light. All right, gonna refresh the boost hill, make sure he doesn't, uh, doesn't drop though. He starts taking too much damage. Now, man, it's absolutely moving at a different frequency than Blaze is right now. It's literally looking like Rey Mysterio, bro. Every time he does those dash lands, he goes, booyaka, booyaka, booyaka. I'm like, slow down. Who's that jumping out the sky? Are we wild Mysterio? Here we go. Like, he, he got the whole jingle going, but Blaze finally finds that first stock with that side sig on that sword. Let's see if Blaze can get some of that fire back. Yeah, he's going to have to get... Oh, okay, we are going to be on the gun this time around doesn't matter i mean obviously a lot of this is going to be oh done on the boots it was 77 percent time when the boots last game 449 damage put out and you understand why he stays on those boots i managed to find him Jeez. quite quickly oh the down right into the recovery easy confirm also let me have that weapon as well and you know he's taking so many weapons because he's just doing nothing but damage that dash land from sandstorm yet again giving that burst of speed that blaze wasn't ready for the punish from sandstorm again on the whip blaze having such a tough time gets caught on the way up by a uh -oh. like gets caught yet again. He's carrying him oh down. My. He's carrying him up. He's, he's taking he's him all over the stage. <laughs> he's still going. How is he still going? The man got on the elevator and hit every button. <laughs> like, we're going to go see all these floors right now. <laughs> so we in the parking garage? <laughs> we in the lobby, bro? <laughs> what? Sandstorm going absolutely ham hocks right now. Blaze trying to find some kind of answer, but it is not looking too good for the boy from EU. Oh, no, not at all. Okay. Oh. Man, trying to get stylish. He almost got the, got the doubled off the easy until an actual comf confirm. If he had hit that down light, you oh know the gosh. recovery was coming. Uh-oh. Inch movement. My, tr literally micro spacing. <laughs> oh, my God. Almost enough. He's sending a statement. He's standing still. He's saying, I have your soul downloaded. And Blaze doesn't seem to have any answers. As Sandstorm looks for one more hit. Goes oh! oh! He's no! against the ropes! <laughs> against the ropes on guides! Sandstorm sending a statement. To Blaze, what do you say to that? Oh my God! I mean, you know that would have if it went the other way, the down uh, <laughs> active input, it would have killed too. He said, "You know what? I want to make it look as flashy as possible. Get them off the wall with it from so deep." Sandstorm said, "I'm making clips, bro. I I don't know what to say. I, <laughs> you wink. Hey, what up, bro? I'm here. So, Off uh, stage, her Karana, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy when it." Bending over backwards, quite literally sending Blaze into the stage and bouncing him off of it into the blast zone. Sandstorm is making this look gratis right now. I need Blaze to power up. I don't know. He has to dig deep within his soul. He needs to do something right now, yeah, because again, this last game off the numbers alone, 616 to 334. My man did double the damage that you did and then made you look foolish at the yeah. end. Super All in one. Oh my, he's still doing it again. He's still going. He's still going. He said you're not a real wrestler, Roman Reigns. <laughs> <laughs> you're not about that life. He's like, please. Oh man, Blaze absolutely getting cooked a little bit, but is finding those hits in between here. Thankfully, that force from Taros is adding up, but Sandstorm keeps answering back. These rebuttals are frame perfect. Sandstorm is gonna lose out on the boots here, but he does get the gauntlets in hand. He still has an option, yeah, good uh, stuff from Blaze, not jumping into that. Understandably so. This is, looks like Sandstorm's looking for quite a bit of jumps. The scream is going to work right there. Gets that neutral sig, sends him straight up, and he is out of there. First time for uh, Blaze to get himself a, a lead here in this set. Yeah, this is exactly what Blaze needed. I want to see how it looks when Blaze is playing from ahead because it is going to make the difference, but Sandstorm leaves no time to bring the stock count back to even. We'll see how long it takes for Blaze to even get a weapon. Oh my oh. gosh, oh my oh. gosh. Okay, yeah, Sam Storm. Oh my God. And now he's already, he's already got the boots prime too if he ends up losing these. I mean, you saw the way he was going for the weapon tosses to make sure he can prime those next boots. Uh-oh. Oh, oh, bro. Leg drop. Okay, almost got the throw. It doesn't matter though. He's too far away and he did not hit that neutral layer so he could not chase dodge. That was a, a quality edge guard right there from Sandstorm. Trying to finish this off in 3-0 fashion. Don't let it happen to you, bro. Nope, for it's real, my first it time out here. What's going on? Don't let it be you, bro. <laughs> Sandstorm is looking for it right now, pulling up, saying, what up, cuz? Uh, oh, 
Uh, that's a dodge read. Oh, so, oh, somehow I think the stage actually messed up that confirm. It doesn't matter, though. My man is get, taking the kick. It's all Bruce Lee action here, bro. He is hawing, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kick, 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 kick. And Blaze has no answer, bro. Like, what is the answer to this aggression from Sandstorm? Okay. Woo. Okay, yeah, he wanted, to, he wanted to sling him up out of there. So that's a chance. Oh, drop the weapon. We'll look for the weapon toss. Maybe trying to catch his jump back. And that's going to be enough. Down light to recovery. Sandstorm making quick work. He said easy. Light work. Put the glasses back on because he know business is done. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> if he was wearing a suit and tie right now, that's he just a little bit of a... <laughs> <laughs> Had to hit that John Carlos Oriano. Yeah. <laughs> Here at Pueyos Hermanos. <laughs> he really packed him up, bro. It was bad. It was bad. I'm just going to call it the way I see it. Homeboy got cooked. Oh, man. No, that was, yeah. I, I mean, there's nothing else you can really say about it. I, I would love to be like, you know, act. You know, well, what, what can I say is Blaze it did put up a way better fight in that last game, but it did not matter. I think the, the momentum that uh, Sandstorm's coming in, I don't think there was going to be a victory on that side, bro. I, it doesn't matter what character you pick. That boy was getting the kicks going. He was making absolute highlight reel plays the entirety of this set, and you're going to see it right here in this highlight reel. <laughs> man, yeah, we got to, we got some... <laughs> clips to watch because Sandstorm was just absolutely phenomenal in that game. Blaze just could not find an answer to these boots and that's why this weapon can be so oppressive, especially against someone who has a really good movement like Sandstorm. Like, you feel like you never have an inch. The struggle is getting in with the weapon, but if you get in, that's kind of all she wrote from there. I don't even know if he even saw my uh, DM. I definitely DM'd him. Let me see that Tesco, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if he saw it, but he definitely had it picked in prime. I wanted to DM, thanks, bro. <laughs> I needed that. I'm, I'm woken up now. Yeah, no, if you weren't awake before, that definitely put a shock to your system because, I mean, take a look at that. Even that last game wasn't that bad. We, that was the first time in the set, I think, was in that game where we saw Blaze get a lead for a little bit, and then that just got yoink right back. Yeah, he wasted no time getting that back, man. I'm actually looking at it right now. Yeah, I mean, he had a, he had a pretty tall chance of, of a lead here, uh, but it seemed as though that lead only lasted for about 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah, about 30 seconds. <laughs> wow. Well, you tried. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know? You know, attempts were made. So, <laughs> just unfortunately, you are going against Sandstorm, man. He's going to he's gonna put up those uh, uh, those uh, numbers. He's going to play that way. That's the, it's the GOAT factor, as we like to say. I mean, it doesn't matter how much time has passed. Sandstorm is in, in practice. He is going to be a competitor. He is going to be someone that you should fear in, in your bracket path and know that you have to put up 120, 150 percent to get that W. Yeah, and especially this year, it's been a great year for Sandstorm, at least as far as online championships go, winning those back-to-back. -back. But then when it came to the Royales, could never really get that dub so the question for the weekend has always been is sandstorm finally going to be able to outperform himself this year on land and so far if he keeps playing like that the other people left in the bracket are going to be in some trouble yeah man and so we will be moving into our next match though sandstorm has been moving on so he'll be uh into a match after this but before we got kinda and we got agno stepping up Okay, so this time we're going to have a little bit of a mix. We're going to have some South America and we're going to have some EU. Now, granted, Acno and Blaze have been the team that people know so well, but Acno has always had an edge over Blaze as far as singles performances go by quite a bit. And so going into Kaina, this should be a scrap fest for certain, but Kaina, once again, one of the favorites to win this entire thing. I want to see how Akno is able to perform. Man, look at that. Again, this, this, that's how you know this boy been around for a bit. When you start seeing people over that uh, 100K mark, just know that they've been in this Brawlhalla game since like year one or two, you know what I mean? They've been uh, playing some games, a lot of golds just between our competitors, but kind of really now trying to uh, pull up and show you that, you know what, I should be winning this here tournament though. Yeah, and this is something we've never seen before. You can see it right there on the bottom of the screen. Lifetime score, zero to zero. So this is the first time we're ever going to see this matchup. We have no data to look at to say, like, who's going to come out on top here? Is it going to be Acno historically? Is it going to be Kaina? We have nothing to reference. Only vibes as we go into this quarterfinal elimination. Yo, thank you, thank you, thank you, crowd. Once again, hit me with some 3 2 1 brawl because this match is about to be just as electric as that last one. Agno kind of stepping up right here to run those hands. We got the axes out for both sides. 
And Ragnar got a W, so Ajax uh, can, can live to see another day, but I'm not sure if he's going to be able to get W so quickly against the Taros. That was almost a stock right there. That is insane. <laughs> that is absolutely insane. When he swings, he swings. He swings. Put all of his body in it, knows how to have the perfect form to make sure you get all of your force into your blow. I mean, look at Kaina holding the corner here. One stop, and it's going to be the stock from Akno. Akno's trying to find a way back down to the ground. Gets to do so with that side light. But it looked like when he did it, he didn't even know that it connected. So he kind of backed off right after, and Kaina was like, okay, I'll take the stock then. Kaina. Moving up, moving through. Kaina wants to get, okay, there we go, nice. Oh, okay. oh, 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 yeah, don't, don't get hit all the way up there, man. Kind of made, stacking these combos up super quickly as well. Oh. Going for the big swing from Agno. No one home, but does not take a huge punish for it either. Okay, and kind of going, oh, goes for the pump fake there, but Agno not falling for it. Calls goes it for the down sig. Perfect spot dodge at the right height to not get clipped. And kind of still trailing by a pretty hefty lead here. I thought we might see a juicier punish than that, but kind of doesn't really care because look how often he's winning the neutral against Agno. Yeah, he's definitely kind of slow and steady wins the race, race but you... It's oh not God. really that slow and steady when you're playing with Taros. All of these hits can lead to a stock. And actually, that does. From the middle of the stage, I guess he just never touched the ground. Uh, so he didn't get any resources back. Kinda running away with the first game. Could potentially find himself a three stock here if he can keep this type of pressure up. Nope, gonna go ahead and rob that away quickly with the side stick. All right, let's see if Akno is able to adjust with enough speed here, because Kaina has been making this look pretty easy with this axe, especially. I mean, we've been saying it over and over again. Kaina's axe has looked so immaculate all weekend, all year. Honestly, I mean, look at the dash back on that to turn around neutral. And I've always said he breaks the game down to the simplest of form. Oh my God. Oh, okay. I was like, hold on, man. Where are you going to go? We're going to see a recovery coming out. He's trying to line it up. Oh. <laughs> nice. They both, yeah, both freeze in the air right there. Oh, but the down light on the soft platform is going to leave him high up enough for him to turn, push him past the blast zone. And that is a very solid first game right there from Kaina. Kaina knows how to chase, man. And we were saying it right there, right? They both hit that pause at the same time. Kaina was like, if you fast fall, I'm going to down sig. And then Akno was like, ah, I'm not trying to do that. But then immediately afterward, got caught on the way down. Like, this is looking like another Three, rough two, set, one, right? I mean, it would be kind of a, a, a bummer if both we watch Blaze get packed up and then we watch Akno also get packed up because then you feel like you get a bundle deal. <laughs> The two for one. No, no. It's not how, not how we were expecting to go out like this. We got to get at least one W for the team, man. But, yeah, now, as of right now, kind of definitely working real quick. My man said, I'm FedEx. How quickly I'm packing it up. So, no, hold up. I trust here in Akno because, you know, similar we were saying before, this matchup has never happened before. Sometimes game one can look like that against someone you've never played against before. But it's looking like game two is starting off somewhat similar here. Oh, he made it. Okay. Got a stock there. Yeah, good job from Akno holding on. Oh, he's breakdancing. What, what, what is the answer here? Oh, he's throwing things up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he put a wall up and he still he got the hit, but he did not capitalize off the hit. I don't think he had a weapon in hand in time. So, Akno, nice. Slide here, the neutral light. He's gonna go ahead and push and be enough. Once again, Taros with that high attack stat, making those neutral lights ever more potent as a KO option. Akno, though, not trailing too far behind. At this point in the last Ooh. game, it looks pretty bad. Maybe here, he'll be able to answer back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would like to see that, though. You don't want to take too much damage here again. That's the Taros factor, man. Every time you hit, you might be in a different oh. color. And that's exactly what happened there, man. Yellow, oh. orange. Doing the whole yep. spectrum here. Red, <laughs> like <laughs> my fat racks it up. Each two piece is another co uh, color. Does end up getting that punish for uh, uh, the recovery for the stock, but we do need to do a little weapon starve here. Wasn't well, able to get it, man. I mean, even without the weapon, kind of is still pretty much on full offense. Right, nice, man. This is the most amount of D lights I've seen actually take off. Uh, you know, take a stock too. And that's the thing about Kaina. When I say down to the basics, I mean the basics. It's like N light, D light. You whiff, I hit you with side light. But the way he be using these fast, because people are always like, oh, Axe is a heavy weapon. I'm like, have you seen the frame data on N light and D light? Like, yeah, I'm going to keep using those. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty heavy. I mean, I, maybe not the heaviest, but it's definitely on the more heavier side. However, uh, I, I, I see what you're saying about the frame data, though. Okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, side air is low, but everything else, like, he knows how to swing. Kind of yet again with the response on the chase with the side light nair. Gets another end light. What's going to be the response from Akno here? Gets back onto the stage. Slides on. Gets a bit of a turnaround, but at oh. this point, it's so far behind. Can't take any more trades, and end light from Kinda will be enough to KO Akno here. Okay. Put a hitbox in front of him and grab that wall at the same time. Gets a slide on into the new, uh, neutral light. Two of them right there. Actually going to disarm as well, but 
really the, the unarmed gameplay from uh, Kine has not been okay. uh, bad. Good two-piece from Akno to go ahead and take that stock. Okay, I need to see a, a Stingray versus Kina stock from Akno right now from last year's BCX. Needs a perfect stock, can't get touched. That's how you start it off. Goes ahead and picks up this weapon, has uh -oh. the Katars in hand. He's playing this immaculately thus far, but Kina needs one hit, one end light, one D light, one side air, anything. Akno can't get touched. And there it is. As you said, that's the hammer in hand. It didn't matter what he touched him with, it was going to say, unless it was a side light, and still, <laughs> I still would have questioned him. <laughs> <laughs> I still would have questioned him. Like, well, I don't know, man. Maybe he got a buffer. <laughs> but yeah, it was that was a super deep red, so it didn't matter what he hit him with. As long as it had a little knockback on it, he was probably gone. Man, yeah, absolutely tough break for Akno, but I will say that game two did look better. Mm -hmm. You know, the slowly adjusted. Game one looked bad. Oh, well, game yeah. two looking a whole lot better. Game three, this could be where the adjustment is. I mean, we saw in that last set that Akno had against Knees that Knees was kind of making a similar type Three, of adjustment, but two, couldn't get it all one, the way through by the one. end. I think Akno's making a similar, uh, I call it slope of adjustment, if you will, but he has to edge it out better than Knees did against him. Oh, yeah. All right, here we are in to game three. Uh, Akno definitely performed a little better there in that second game, uh, but really, it's still the kind of show. He's gonna have to, he's gonna have to get, get somebody to turn this channel if he wants any type of W. 660 damage to 447 damage in that last game. So, you know, Damage aside, no, I feel like genuinely goes above two damage areas where you, one of them could have won the game, you know, regardless. Um, but it just really shows you how much damage that kind is able to put out and how many times he's been able to win neutral on advantage and keep it going. A double down air is going to do it for that first stock. And he does have some damage on him, but he is still continuously in control of the pace of this match. Yeah, we're going to see if Akno can even get this weapon. You can see kind of uses these. Oh, my gosh, we got the Tarot special. Hold on. I was about to say, it was Akno about to get tucked in right there. Has an opportunity here, goes for the recovery, just because why not? Had to check, that kind of did indeed dodge. But now, we've been lapped here at this point, effectively. Oh. Okay. Juking up. Nice. Oh, no, never mind. Sit down. That's what <laughs> Like, immediately, you know what, I'm done with this. Hits him with, with, the, with the flame, sends him back, but took quite a bit of damage already on this second stock. He's already in the red. Even though there's no weapon in hand, though, so he has a little time to work with until now. Let's see, Agno trying to answer back. Kind of just swinging out of disadvantage yet again. Agno not ready for it. Will not be able to have enough drift to get the wall touch on that dodge up as well. And this could very easily be tournament stock for Akno here in the elimination quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, they swing. The down airs are coming out from both sides, but oh, uh oh, good chase down right there. Akno kind of even on a whiff has just been able to position himself to not you get don't punished. Like that. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Ooh. He's got that down there. That would have completed a combo too, for sure. If he's, he got the dodge, if he had hit that down and he got the ground bounce, probably would have finished the game. As we finish it just like that, so simple, so clean. Here from Kaina, finds the down air, or finds the down right into the side air. You're gone. Yeah, no, I mean, that was a pretty tough showing from Akno there in that final bout. Want to give my congratulations for one, even making it into the top eight of the most stacked tournament, not just of the year, but I'd argue of all time in Brawlhalla history, but kind of just absolutely piecing him up. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely, uh, absolutely insane how we those last two matches went, man. We got just two straight beat downs, you know? And as I said, you know, these people, we're fighting for top, you know, we're fighting for top one. And that's the type of aggression you want to see. You want to see somebody come into that match and absolutely prove that they were supposed to be the winner and they need to be moving further in this bracket. That's what we got in our last two matches. Kind of doing it over Akno. Sansom doing it over Blaze. Sheepy, how you feeling about the action that you saw? Man, we were backstage just... <laughs> We were, we had our choices, right? Some people are, you know, rooting for Akno. Some people are rooting for Kaina. And backstage, we're going back and forth, and we're like, come on, look, you gotta look at Kaina. He is clean on this Taros. His reaction timing and everything, what he's doing, amazing. And I cannot believe he was sent into the elimination side by his own fellow South American player, Use. Like, that broke my heart, too, but oh my goodness. 
uh, we are very much enjoying ourselves back there, <laughs> watching everything what's happening. It's crazy too, because the way like the way that he went down on you, like he actually was up 2-0 in the same fashion that we saw in these games. Like he was dominantly winning the games he won, but you just figured it out. It just seems like Akno was he wasn't able to do the same thing that Yuz was even for a game there. As you see, big damage here, 536 to 339. My man kind of was putting out all kind of damage all, across both games. I think he was plus 500 like easy on all three. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where the question we always keep asking every year is like, can anyone beat South America that isn't South America? There's always some point in the bracket where the two have to face off and the team region elimination KO has to happen and it happened to be with using kind of, but kind of saying, you know what, in the elimination side of bracket, I'll, ma I'll make my way back up to you, bro. <laughs> Look, I'm just saying that I, I really, truly think that South America, Europe as well, they are showing up. I mean, literally that, those are the godly and yous are your people, competitors sitting in the winner's final. I'm, I'm hoping some, some, something happens with North America because let me tell you, there's only two left. And that's actually going to be the next match, uh, um, Impala versus Sandstorm, which I, I don't even know how to feel. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I got, I got, I got, I got to, got to bring it back though. You bring say, it back. You say EU is doing it. it that's godly. That's, that's <laughs> different. Okay. Like godly EU. That's what's going on here. You know. But I'm, I'm excited to see because you know that's my guy, man. I just saw him over there a second ago. But yeah, I like to see godly do some, uh, some, some great um, action here. We're gonna see it in a little more in that winners finals. But I was happy to see. He got over Impala, and he did that so emphatically. He wanted Impala to know that, like, look, I understand that you won BCX last year, but I'm got I want to make it happen right now at 3 Oh man. Whew. Boys Such cooking. a smooth run, too, mm -hmm. all the way through the winner side in singles and I in doubles, too. Man, Godly must be feeling good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. All right, guys. So we're going to take a short break before we head into our top Four, five of the World Championship. <laughs> Look, y'all, stay tuned. It's going to get good.
Welcome back, everyone, as we are heading towards the end of our singles competition here at BCX 2023. I'm now joined by my favorites, Duke and Sparky. How are you feeling? I mean, I think the crowd speaks for me right now. <laughs> they are so pumped up, and you cannot not be pumped up with the action that is on display. And we are very nearing a different era of Brawlhalla. We've already gotten an EU gold medal in twos, I had to say it. <laughs> we also got an NA gold medal. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's split. Beef squashed. But we could very well get another medal to not NA specifically for a world championship, which would be a first. It would absolutely be a first, and it would be a big deal for uh, any region yeah. to get that. It would be it would be a, a big moment in Brahala's history from the beginning all the way up until now, especially if it was here at the World Championship and not, I hate to say just another land, but yes, of course we're, we're talking always relatively speaking, and the context here is at the World Championship. Well, before we get into the next match, which will be Impala versus Sandstorm, I got Glitter on the main stage ready to chat with them. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, this is going to be a very intense match matchup. It's going to determine who continues through on the road to those grand finals. We've got Sandstorm. We've got Impala, both experienced with those grand finals. So talk to me right now what your experience has been so far in the day and how you're feeling. Um, I don't think I should be in losers right now, but I'm playing pretty good, so I'm very confident, and I just hope we both play pretty well and have a good set. And Paula, what about you? Um, I don't know what to say, honestly. I mean, you've been here before, right? You know how to handle this pressure up on this main stage, so what's going through your head? Um, I mean, I just want to play my best. I never promise a win, but... I only feel like bad if I don't try my best, so we'll just see what happens. All right, well, you have won five times, if I'm not mistaken, so far. Write something like, well, if we're including, you know, twos as well. So you're, you're right, no stranger to really hoisting that trophy. Do you think that this year is the year where you can add another one to the collection? If I keep playing the way I'm playing, then yeah, definitely. Crowd loves to hear that. And obviously, Impala, we talked about this two days ago to start off the entire weekend. You are the champion from last BCX. Do you feel like you have to live up to that this time around? Now that I'm in Blizzards, it's not really looking like it, but I mean, I'll still try to to add to like um, to the title. We'll see, we'll see what happens. All right, this is going to be a match you certainly don't want to miss. So if you're, at, if you're at home, get settled, get ready for this. It's going to be intense. I hope everybody in the crowd is ready. You two go get set up at your stations. And for now, we'll send it back on over to the desk. Thank you so much, Glitter. Oh my goodness. I don't know how to feel about this match. Uh, first off, all I do want to say is that Impala, believe in yourself. You are in the world champion for a reason, OK? Oh my goodness, we are looking at the bracket right now. Boys, how do you feel about this run? We got our two North American players and the elimination side. Well, you can see all the way on the left side, about four sets from the top, Sandstorm went down into the elimination bracket, as he just said, to use his great sword. Of course, gonna be a completely different matchup here going up against Impala. Meanwhile, where is Impala's name? You can see he took out Fiend 3-1 and then went into Godly and got three owed coming off of a big 3-0 and a handshake and had to spend that time figuring out what to do we have a north america versus north america region ko potential but sandstorm's banner is in the entryway after you come through the metal detectors only one of these players banner is right next to the main oh. stage you are so right and duke how do you feel 
I mean, I'm uh, very sad that we're only going to get one more North American to continue on into the top four. But like we've been saying, we didn't really know who was going to ultimately take home the victory. Godly's playing out of his mind. Hughes is playing out of his mind. Kain is playing out of his mind. Kaina! Which North American is playing more out of their mind? That's what it's going to come down to. Well, we definitely know that there are so many fans rooting out there for their GOAT, their King, Sandstorm, the three-time world champion in the past for singles, and we're not, we're not even including doubles. But I'm getting word that Impala versus Sandstorm, that match is ready. So Sparky, Duke, bring on the action. It's time, baby. It's time. We talked about it at, what was it? Was it DreamHack uh, Valencia when they played last? They, they have it was played. San Diego. Okay. It was San Diego when it was like the passing of the torch between these two. It finally felt like that was the time where it was the passing of the torch from Sandstorm to Impala. But there is no better place to do it than here at BCX, this deep in the bracket, when Sandstorm is playing this well, when Impala is playing this well. But it's Impala over stuck on the wall at the weapon disadvantage. The a flurry of kicks coming through from Sandstorm. He's been tearing people up with his boots. He is still untouchable right now as Impala finally able to pick up a weapon. Gets a Sair, gets in there, a little bit of taps of damage here as Sandstorm was going big for that recovery. Wanted that early KO. This is, again, small brawl haven. We know stocks go quick. The damage is just building up for Sandstorm. The beginning of this match is looking like the beginning of every other match that he's played against the opponents that he's taken all the way to the blast zone earlier today. And it's looking like it might happen pretty quickly. There's the recovery, not quite off the top. It was just a little bit too low, even though we're on Brawl Haven. Throws out the down signature, not gonna connect. Impala over to his signature bow. It's a nice little side light. Oh. Sandstorm with the gravity cancel down light over the down light of Impala gets him the first stop. And that tiny little bit of elevation is just enough to get you over that D-Light. It seems like it has all the range in the world, but it doesn't have the height. And Sandstorm, it's just a flurry of kicks. You're hearing so many boots noises. Incorporating the signatures in as well. He had the weapon toss. He's at the weapon disadvantage. GC side light into the side air from Impala. Harpoon toss. He's going to take this over to the edge. No, backs up, grabs the bow. In light comes out. One more will do it. But it's going to be the neutral air. Not quite enough force on that to take off the top. Oh. Sandstorm getting a little bit cheeky there. Yeah, went for that turnaround as Impala went for the recovery, just narrowly missed, and Sandstorm swung back onto him. Sandstorm not yet able to pick up a weapon, but you know what? He's done a lot of damage on the second stock of Impala. That Nair going to finally finish him off. So is his next weapon, what is it going to be? Do you Gauntlet, remember? Right? I think he I think he literally only picked up the boots. I would agree with that. And now it's time to pick up some gauntlets. I was wondering if he was playing so much unarmed towards the end of that stock. Okay, it is the boots. That's probably why he yeah. didn't pick up that set of boots, because then if he got knocked out, he's going to come back to gauntlets, and he's not going to be able to do that, at least not as quickly. Going to be able to set up yet another pair of boots. Man, favorite Sandstorm here. Starting off the final stock of Impala here in game number one. Two neutral lights will connect. Side light puts him into the open air, but Impala with the dodge in. Gets underneath for that Nair. The weapon toss goes out. We might actually see Snow, but still the boots. I'm, I'm losing track. Sandstorm's able to keep track of it, but there's just so many attacks coming out from Sandstorm. Almost had the range on that. Impala was just a little bit too far away. Starting that one off. Tried to get the turnaround. Got, almost got the reset. Forcing Impala over to the edge. Are we going to get an edge guard here? No, he's going to back up. Neutral Sig comes out. That neutral sig was wild, and Impala was able to get at least some sort of punish onto it as Sandstorm was swinging towards the fences. There's a neutral light once again, keeping Impala to the outside. Down light, side air, and Sandstorm gonna take game number one. Like he makes it, he makes it look easy. Like he, 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 he legitimately makes it look easy. He makes this almost look like a pools match. I don't want to put any disrespect onto Impala because he has earned all of the respect I could possibly give him and more. But the way Sandstorm is playing, the way Boots are in current meta, and the way he's utilizing it, like we're potentially seeing the destruction that we saw from his scythe. Yeah, what it really feels like is Sandstorm came in with the game plan on this Tezka, and Impala has not been able to change it up. He hasn't been able to force Sandstorm to do anything different, but right now Sandstorm's on the gauntlets. Game one was all about the boots. We'll see what he can do with these gauntlets. This could be win condition for Impala. It's a little bit early in this game to make any major generalizations just yet, but the fact that, you know, Impala was winning the damage difference while he had the gauntlets in his hands, if he can get Sandstorm off of those boots. The only thing is, is Sandstorm's not throwing his weapon too often. He's not completely staying away from it, but he really doesn't have a high risk of being disarmed until you forcibly do enough damage to hit those boots off of his feet. Yeah, it's very situational when he'll go for those weapon tosses. Once again, Impala oh just gosh, stuck dude. outside. He might need a platform map at this rate because he's just struggling to get back up against Sandstorm on these corner That's guards. That's probably it. No, I'm not quite. Uh, 
Even here, no weapon toss here. He'd rather use the dodge. Oh! Okay. Still able to get back up. You have a lot of vertical movement with the boots recovery. No ground pound thrown out there. Wants to respect Impala. The gravity cancel down sick, beaten out by the Nair from Impala. Impala starting to add some damage up onto Sandstorm here. This really could swing back in favor of Impala. Swaps back over to the boots. It was like that toss to yourself so you can throw the gauntlets away. Keep that weapon spawn off of the field. Impala over back on the edge. Still has found not a lot of momentum. Finally gets the KO. That was kind of a long KO. At least Impala did a great job of going relatively even in damage. Like that was our first stock in a minute and a half into this game. So his survivability has been solid so far. If he can clean this one up quickly, he is going to go off stage at the weapon disadvantage. The unarmed recovery came out. Okay, there's the D-Light into the neutral air and it does KO off the top. Impala in a good spot so far, even with Sandstorm. He's got his pick of weapons. He wants the spear. Sandstorm going to come in. Voice to the gauntlets for a brief moment here, but he's definitely no stranger to these uh, gauntlets. Oh, oh the gets the down. reset. Doesn't go for the double? There's another D-Light into the side air over to the edge. Try to get a little cheeky with the slide charge. D-Sig, okay, the down air is going to send low. No major offstage oh, engagement. Sandstorm has more of the stage control here, and he's taking oh. it high. He wanted the gimp off the top, didn't quite grab it, but he still gets the punishment on the landing. Yeah, Impala just narrowly able to drift to the side. Throughout the signature there, as Sandstorm ends up interrupting. Nice little Nair just tapping Impala, making sure he's in a little bit of hit stun whenever he can. Side airs doesn't get him over onto the stage. I can't believe the final hit still made the connection there from the middle of the stage, so it's not going to find the KO. One thing we haven't seen a lot of from Sandstorm is the down air on the boots. He's been mostly in the straight up and down vertical and horizontal planes, not in the diagonals. Yeah, he's definitely been going for a lot of side light and down light into side air. Really just playing that horizontal game. Even his verticals has just been like, maybe he'll get in there, maybe he'll throw out a recovery, not too much else. Impala here with the first lead he's really had in this entire set. He's finding some Nair juggles here. He has Sandstorm in a pretty good spot because he has the lead. Sandstorm's on gauntlets. There is no weapon spawn on the field yet. Now he's at the full weapon advantage. Sandstorm grabs the recovery, plucks Impala out of the air, and we are on final stocks for both players. Oh, but Sandstorm has his comfort weapon, and he's primed up a second set of boots. Impala comes in, picks up a bow, has him in the edge guard, doesn't go for the dare, instead goes for a ground pound, and Sandstorm's going to go for the reversal. One of the first dares that we've seen, the recovery over on the edge, a little bit of an extended edge guard there. They both get back. That neutral air all the way up there, still not quite enough. Went for the side signature, one of the rare signatures we've seen from Impala so far this game. No, but he manages to jump over that follow-up there. Sandstorm is going for the read with that GC downlight off of the side air. Impala keeping him at bay. The recovery gets him back oh. up. He's got stage control, but he gives it away. Impala almost had the perfect spacing on that GC D light, but Sandstorm was just a little bit too far away. Now back over to the spear. Oh. The weapon toss for a little bit of stun, a little bit of momentum interruption, and the unarmed recovery for the KO. Unfazed Impala, just stoic as ever. He's locked in. You're not gonna see any cracks, any emotions until the set is over. On the same on the other side, Sandstorm, let's think it a little bit about this one. There is some sort of like mental damage that it does to, to me as a viewer as I watch, like the way boots are designed, like there's so many hits per move. Three, and then, two, you know, Impala will one, hit like a downer. You'll hear bink. But then Sandstorm comes out, it's like, doosh, 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 And it feels like he's doing a lot more than he is. And then all of a sudden, they're still going even. That's what kind of struck me last game. It's like, I thought Sandstorm was running away with it, but then you look at the damage, and it was relatively even. Oh, there's a down air. Down air, he's changing up the angles he's throwing out against Impala. I think Impala's defense also kind of plays into that damage, but there's oh, a that was huge. another one. Impala did get the wall touch. Coming back up, recovery gets him onto the stage. So last game was very spear heavy for Impala. 337 damage compared to the 164 that he did on the Holy bow. Miss. The unarmed one, some damage. Didn't quite get the ground pound follow up off of the D light. Still a relatively low damage, so I don't know if that would have led to the immediate KO into the blast zone. Nice GC D light to get back on the stage at that perfect angle. Oh, and Sig nice. out, and Impala stays low. Down Sig to counter punish, and Impala with the lead. It seems like he's really opting into that spear here as well. I mean, Sandstorm's been like in his face so much and his ability to jump around and specifically do those nares that kind of covers him in the air. He wants to use a little bit of that range without really leaning into the range that like Bo has. So sort of that mid range. All right, there goes Sandstorm, gets a downlight recovery. Not quite enough. Second recovery will finish off. Sandstorm playing from a deficit, but once again, he's all about those boots. 
Impala coming in, really throwing out the neutral air almost instantly. That's going to take away his iframes as he throws out his first move. Rather than waiting for the weapon spawn to come in and waiting as long as he can before his iframes are gone, he's just continuing to get sent over to the wall, finds his way back in, but now he's back over to the wall. Dodge is burned. Sandstorm's going to see that go in. Weapon toss down, back over to the wall. Dude, this is gonna sound mean, but it really feels like a Meg D corner guard, right? Like, where it's very safe, stays up top, and catches you as you start to peek over, and then it'll get that jump there if you try to recover too high. Down sick thrown out, Sandstorm stays be below it. Downsick has really been the one that we've seen get some continued use. He's not like spamming it or fishing for it. Yo, all the way down there, reaching straight down with the down air. He's only about halfway through this second stock. So Sandstorm's gonna have to find something, find it pretty quickly. He's gonna be hunting for a weapon spawn. A little bit of unarmed damage comes in. Gauntlets with the recovery, still doesn't KO off the top. He's probably gonna be looking for some more of that. Maybe off the bounce, you see him reaching up with those neutral airs. And sick thrown out once again. Impala staying low, gets that punish. It's a side light this time. Side oh. thing, this is Impala still holding on to the second stock. Another neutral light, not gonna KO. Impala was able to dodge the high, then he was able oh. to dodge the low. I can't believe that side air hit made a connection. Side light into the recovery, and that's gonna be the KO. Sandstorm, maybe about 80 damage on this stock so far. You see him juggle his weapons back over to the boots. Impala wasn't able to hit him out of that before he picked it up. Oh, Impala with the neutral light. The down air again to cover himself. And sick thrown out, but Sandstorm doesn't get caught. He needs this to KO. Otherwise, Impala might be in a really strong down position. Down air again. In there! Gives him game number three. He's up 2-1. And the spear down air, if used correctly, like he has done now two times, I don't think Sandstorm really has anything that can even touch that. The range is so far compared to everything that Sandstorm has, really on either weapon. Yeah, I mean, that is such a tough thing to try to challenge for Sandstorm, right? The nares do not reach high enough. The recovery is so easily stuffed on the boots. So Sandstorm's gotta be careful. He might have to lean into more of like an up weapon toss and go for the unarmed, kind of like how Lance players will challenge against someone who's playing that vertical edge guard. So now we're seeing them kind of uh, both settle into the kind of the same game plan. We have Sandstorm is very boots heavy. Of course, he, he did some work on the gauntlets that game. Only put out 70 damage compared to the 344. Meanwhile, zero bow damage from Impala. He is 100% relying on the spear. Unfortunately for him this game, he's going to start off with the bow. Well, here comes Sandstorm with a pair of gauntlets. Did a little bit of work with them in the last game. This time, looked like he was going to throw them away, okay. but the air connects for Impala. Oh, he's going off stage with it, too. Trying to get nasty, floating up a little bit. There's the side air, and Sandstorm's immediately able to get back. He expected that off-stage aggression Gosh. from Impala, so he threw out the neutral air, found the priority, and he's back in the same spot. Ground Pound comes in. Sandstorm gets back on the stage, swaps out his gauntlets for a set of boots. Got away from that one there. Nice read. Gets the turnaround. Gets a neutral line as well. Impala stuck on this corner. The down light's going to miss. It's crazy how much space he can cover with that down light. You saw how far back he was playing, and he was still all of a sudden in the blink of an eye right on the corner. Dash down light for the boots players can get you right over that corner. Impala unarmed on the outside. Sandstorm with the neutral light. Impala still needs to get back to the wall, but Sandstorm misses the down light, and the Nair's just going to help Impala out. Chase Dodge up, hoping to get away. Then Sandstorm still keeping him over on the edge. Grabs the KO there. A lot of weapon spawns on the field. That's how you can tell that they're really leaning into one weapon and one weapon only. There were two weapon spawns on the field. How often do you see that in a one tournament one. match? So insane. They both really just want their individual weapon pickup. Sandstorm going for the recovery there. Was definitely looking for some more damage off of that one. The neutral air, the neutral light. He's keeping Impala on the corner. Oh, he picks it up again. Another one. And another one. Weapon toss bonk on the head. That's the stock. Impala with about 80 damage on his second stock as Sandstorm is spawning back in. Able to juggle the weapons for a little while to deny the weapon spawn, but still safely get back over onto that spear. Gauntlets come in for Sandstorm. Gets the neutral light into the weapon toss. D light, side light. Oh, he went for the dash jump there. Oh, weapon toss. Impala fast falls below it. Gets disarmed. Impala oh. gets caught by the recovery. Sandstorm. He can force a game five. He keeps this pressure on. He's now back with a thick lead in this game. Just a little over two minutes into it. Full stock lead. He has Impala over on the edge. Goes for the down air towards the wall. Even though there was just really a guess whether Impala wanted to move over towards the wall or stay deep in the push-off column, Sandstorm was also able to touch the wall and reset his jumps. They're remaining safe. Yeah, it's a 50-50, but a little bit safer on which side of that coin that flips. But he's still finding hits. That's the important thing if Sandstorm wants to close this one out. Oh, he grabbed that too. That was the dodge as well. Harpoon doesn't hit. Oh, the D-Light. Perfect dodge from Sandstorm to get through that D-Light. Yet another dodge. one that's going to be the dodge gone. 
No follow-up off of the down air from Sandstorm. Instead, backs away. Impala with the side air. Gets him back onto the stage and another side air. Gravity oh! cancels. Side light. A page out of Sandstorm's book will get Impala to final stocks. Keeping himself in this one. Looking for the potential 3-1 here against Sandstorm to move on into this proper top four here at the World Championships for 1v1s in Brawlhalla, baby. Which of these all-stars will be the North American representative? That's oh, what they're battling oh. for, the neutral light. Not quite enough. He's going to let Impala get that wall touch. Doesn't care, but he misses the down line, and Impala with the nair gets him back on. He has true combo KO options. Of course, he has the recovery potential Whoa! off the top, and that's what it is. Sandstorm pushing it to game five. He asked in the interview for a great set, and that is what we are getting. Fans of Brahalla are going to be loving this as we've got a game five between two world champions. You can see the camera looking at that trophy, zooming in on it. I don't think their eyes are on that trophy just yet. Their eyes are on everything they have right in front of them right now. You can't look beyond this set. You can't look beyond even your monitor to the other player right across the stage from you. You got to stay locked in here as we get into game five. Impala, first one to pick up a weapon, picks up the second one as well. Sandstorm still unarmed, but he finds two hits onto Impala. There's a weapon pickup. It's the boots. Impala instantly over to the wall, not worried about staying there. I mean, we've seen a lot of exclamation points come out from Impala throughout this set, but he's never let wall slip really take effect before he gets onto the stage. Yeah, Sandstorm really likes to go for that dash down, okay. like trying to catch Impala's head, but it hasn't been working out too hot. Impala, turn around, neutral light. Haven't seen a D-Sig in a hot minute. Oh, there it is. Fast. Ooh, that's a dodge from Impala, but Sandstorm can't get more. You see him just dash jumping back and forth. Impala's able to get on the stage. The harpoon toss comes out. Here comes the bow. Instant with the wake up. D-Light finally hits that signature. He's been looking for it. Throwing it out maybe about three times throughout this set. That's really the first one he's been able to make a connection with. Now he's got a sizable lead here. Sansa's going to have to put in a little bit more work if he wants this stock to get taken. Right side, Impala, once again, able to get to the wall safely. Neutral light going to put him off stage. Sandstorm just kind of stuck in place. So that neutral air that immediately came out from Impala didn't have enough reach to go on a Sandstorm. Side air, once again, Sandstorm's just launching. Oh, Impala, nice one. But the weapon toss, we talked about how he wasn't doing too many of those. That's the first time he was falling down, hits the weapon toss, and he'll be able to even this one up. He hit the 45 degree or two. Snowy's one of the best in the game at doing that in Sandstorm, showing he can do it very well here to take on Impala. Trading blow for blow. Impala with the immediate dodge. Sandstorm back down. No dodge. Impala goes dodge up, and Sandstorm wasn't ready for the read. Has a fresh set of boots on him. Impala's trying to back up as best as he can and maybe play the range game throughout those D-lights more, but no, Sandstorm's too oh! close. That's going to interrupt, and he gets the KO off the bottom. Sandstorm yet again with a full stock lead. We saw this last game, and it led to a Sandstorm victory to bring us here to game five. The mental game Sandstorm is playing 5D chess. So many times he did the down light into down air with nothing afterwards that time. He hits the ground pound. He's going to hit the recovery here. Impala on his last legs. This is elimination side. We could see a new world champion. Sandstorm doing such a great job of staying grounded, but also using his jumps to be just a little bit above where the spear in light comes out. One of the fastest moves in the kit, and Impala's just not able to use it very well against Sandstorm. He now has the bow in his hand. He's got a mountain to climb. There is a weapon spawn, and Sandstorm's going to grab it, so Impala's stuck on the bow. Over to that right side wall, side air. Impala goes so far out there. Sandstorm with the side air, and Sandstorm is going to be joining us in the top four. He's the three time, back to back to back. He's the GOAT. He's the player that you can never count out because he has the pedigree, he has the resume, he has the skills to back it up. Seems like every darn time. I mean, so often people go, oh, you know, it's Sandstorm. We got to root for him. And so often people go, well, Sandstorm, he's kind of fallen a little bit. Maybe he's a little washed. But right now, if you're a North American fan, you are rooting for Sandstorm. You want this guy to go the distance. He's got the boots, man. He's, he's showing us with his boots 
domination, destruction, and control of games like he did during the Sandstorm era with his Scythe. Back then, there weren't as many people playing the Scythe, and he was the one who made all of those people in my ranked games move onto the Mordex with the Sandstorm setup, trying to play like the GOAT. Is he going to do that here with Boots? I hope not, because I don't want to go up against stuff like this in my ranked games. I'm a duckling Sandstorm is leading the charge, and all the baby ducklings are going to be picking up Boots here in a little bit, and ranked is just going to be a different beast. Now, I think one of the big things last game is the fact that Impala wasn't able to lean on the spear as much. If we look at Sandstorm, 362 on the boots, 62 on the gauntlet. So he was able to have the boots and he was able to find damage on it. Meanwhile, Impala kind of splitting it down the middle, 184 on the spear, 143 on the bow. So he wasn't able to find the nares to keep him safe, find the neutral lights to keep Sandstorm away, find the side lights, getting the resets to find the side light, D-light into the side air. Wasn't really able to find that. You see, he only dealt 300. 27 damage. I mean, even Sandstorm, 492. That's not a lot of damage because he was so efficient with it, especially with that edge guard on the left side on that second stock. Look at the graph. Look at the graph. Tell me about, tell me how small that middle wedge is, Duke. That's that second stock where he hit that down air, backed up a hot minute, and then caught Impala's recovery with that ground pound. That's why that triangle is just a little bit shorter because he didn't take that much more damage onto it. And the big thing is Sandstorm got that early. You can see how little damage he had on it and how little damage he was taking as he was still adding up damage onto Impala. The angles of those triangles are vastly different. Look how long his first stock was. That was huge. He almost spent 50% of the game on that stock. But then that middle stock, that second stock, it's not very long. He spent less than one-sixth of the game. Remember, you have three stocks, so if you spend it equally, each stock would be one-third of the game. But he spent that on less than one-sixth of the game. That's how game-changing that edge guard was for Sandstorm. Yeah, that, that was critical. That really brought the momentum in favor of Sandstorm. And no matter who you are as a player, that getting caught like that is going to stop you for a moment. You're going to have to think about it. And the best players will be able to shake it off in that moment. But I know a lot of players will get stuck eating that ground pound and going, oh, man, boots. We have a North American KO. One more North American falls here. There is one remaining. It is Sandstorm moving on to face Kaina. But before we get to that, we're going to be taking a short break. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back with top four at BCX 2023.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are officially in the final four of our singles competition. Four players, one trophy, a piece of $250,000, and it all comes down to this. Our players are gearing up, so let's take a look back at our road to BCX. Here, Brawlhalla, where champions are made. where champions are found. from the USA to Europe and beyond. players from all around fighting for their shot at the title. And it all leads to BCX. Brawlers, can we please make some noise in the crowd for our top four? Godly, Use, Kaina, and Sandstorm. What an incredible top four. Duke, Sparky, I've got to hear your thoughts on this. This is it. We have, we're going to crown a new champion. And it's going to be, a, it could be Europe. It could be North America. It could be South America. Duke, thoughts on this? I mean, I think this top four really is just kind of uh, an indication of how the year as a whole has been e got a victory they got a representative south america has been getting victories a lot of people think south america is the strongest region they got two representatives north america had one victory we got a representative any region can take it but only one ultimately gets to lift the trophy i had it in my 2v2 predictions from the very beginning now even though my actual the details of it didn't pan <laughs> out the overall theme of it was there three regions three medals we could have that here as well in the 1v1 space. We have all three regions represented. We could have all three regions each represented on that podium as well. I'm looking forward to it. You got the bracket right in front of you. It's Godly versus Yuz. On the bottom side, it's Kaina versus Sandstorm. We, I was about to say, potentially going to have some of the best Brawlhalla we've ever seen. Potentially, get him out of here. Throw it in the trash. We are about to see the best Brawlhalla that we have ever seen in our entire lives. Yes, and we've been, I know we've been here quite a while. And this, since the beginning. Since the beginning, and this this year feels like no other. Now, the next match that's going to be coming up here soon is actually going to be the winner's final of our singles competition here. And whoever wins will go sit happily and grand. So, um, Duke, I want to know your thoughts. Godly versus Use. 
This is definitely a tough call. Godly, of course, he's been the big guy for EU. You know there's so much pressure on his shoulders to finally do it. He finally got a victory for the European region in 1v1s, but to be able to finally do it at the World Championship stage would mean something totally different. But also, Hughes is the guy who beat him to the punch. He beat him to be the first region not in North America to win in the 1v1s. Hughes has more 1v1 wins in offline events than any other player. He also has a winning record against Godly. It is 3-1 in favor of Yuz, but the same thing was said to be against Kaina, and look who came out on top. And it looks like they're ready, so boys, let's find out who goes to the Grand Finals. Godly on the ring, man. Yuz on the J on, you know Flambo's in the back. So happy that we're getting some great sword representation here in the winner's final. It's crazy if the patch came out just a little bit earlier, we would have a SpongeBob winner's finals here because we have Godly on the Rayman, hoping his gauntlets and axe can find the way in on this devastating greatsword that Yuz has been slicing and dicing through the bracket all day. It really comes down to how Godly can get around this greatsword because Yuz's greatsword is so good at keeping that pressure going, but right now, Yuz is struggling against Godly. His gauntlet going to KO, down Sig to take the corner. Played a little bit high on that wall hurt box peeked over just a little bit and godly found purchase with those bombs that he was dropping right on the edge that pretty safe corner guard it's going to be really tough for you to find the timing to get through that with a dodge usually players against a rayman will just play low exactly like you just did and you see even there he didn't get hit by it but he still wasn't able to punish yeah, I mean, it is very hard to get back up against that. Yeah, you can be safe, stay low, or maybe stay to the outside. But even then, like you said, very hard to punish. Right now, Godly already adding up damage onto this second stock of use and use needs to hold onto this sword. That is the big KO tool for the Jayuns out there. He hasn't found a move in like 10 or 15 seconds. The first one was a neutral light, not a KO move. The second one was a nair. This time he picks up the recovery high enough in the air to get the KO off the top. You see him doing those dashes back and forth, the dash jumps making sure he sticks to that ground. Those fingers are warmed up and he's ready to swing. Has the great sword in his hand now. We'll see what Godly has against this now that he has the ax. I like what Yuzu's doing with this great sword. Got a little bit of an opener onto Godly, but then backed away, trying to find the read there. Godly not able to connect onto that neutral sig as Yuzu's staying very low, respecting Godly. And we were talking back in the green room during a, a previous godly set about how godly gets more hits with that neutral signature than both you and i think he has any business getting but somehow he finds it at the right time use waiting he didn't immediately go for the ko finish waited for just a second then found the neutral air wasn't quite enough to ko yet again the weapon toss coming out hoping to shake godly up a little bit and then get the follow-up with the recovery the neutral light is the only thing he felt safe doing there instead of the D-light into the side air. Not going to lead to the KO just yet. Both players very deep in the red on their second stocks. Godly looking for the gauntlet recovery. The side air with the weapon toss. Bonk on the head. That's going to be the stock used with a lead. Rewinding a little bit. I love that neutral light from Yuz. That quick reaction because Godly just narrowly missed with his own neutral light. And Yuz had to go for the quickest option he could. That was the sword neutral light. But Godly cleaning up the stocks. Down light recovery. Only one weapon spawn on the field so far. One comes in just in time, right where Godly was over on the soft platform. Odin blessing him with that one so he can strip the field from Yuz, who's going to immediately go over. Oh, no, he goes, he what? What, is he, what is he doing? He went all the way to the left and all the way back to the right, then all the way up to the soft he platform, and he's doing it again. Is he allergic to weapon pickups? Finally, he is able to pick it up. But man, he gave Godly so many opportunities. All things considered, though, Yuz has the stage control and the damage advantage. It's like he made the decision to go towards it and then got close was like, Actually, I don't, I don't want pizza. I want tacos. Well, I'm sorry, but we're going to Pizza Hut. You got to get the pizza. Hoping he can get a full deep dish here against Godly. Ooh, you can see he's playing some real neutral here. Only finding his first way in with the weapon toss. Almost like an old school snowy game. They're really picking and choosing now. You can see how important this final stock is for both players. Oh. He falls off the soft platform, so the second hit's not going to connect. Use still unarmed. This time he actually does make the move over to it. You see the side light. Godly was way too high, but he's not able to punish it because he was so high in the air. Oh, the same direction, GC side light. Neutral layers coming out from Use. Oh, oh he no wasn't nair? able to get the nair afterwards. Once again, Godly trying to find that read off that side light. Side light. Ooh, tried to read the dodge in. 
This time, oh. Nadi goes for it. The Nair almost takes him off. Over to the sword. Recovery and use takes game number one. After the signature, he was able to immediately dip down below the main level of the stage. Godly's attempt at a punish was if Yuz was stuck on that main stage. He was able to get around it. That signature, it looked almost like a Hail Mary, like that was going to be it, but he was able to fall out of it in time. Well placed from Yuz, and he's going to take game one because of it. Yeah, really well done with that side signature, because A, if it hits, it's going to launch off stage. B, if it doesn't hit, you get to fast fall, dip low. Now we're going to small brawl haven for game number two. Opening up, Godly's gonna grab the first weapon. Use grabs the second one very quickly. He also found the unarmed down air, so he's found the only damage so far in this game. And Godly instantly over onto the wall, spending about five seconds there before coming back to the main platform, landing with a down air, now juggling with the neutral air. Second one doesn't make a connection, but punishes to landing with a neutral light and a weapon toss after it. Oh, trying to open up Use with those weapon tosses, but Use finding more damage for okay. engagement. Down sig, weapon toss doesn't hit, but the down light ground pound. Use in trouble, he's sweat beating. of cooldown just in time to find the GC neutral signature. Found priority there, got the hit on Godly, which forced him away, giving Yuz enough time to get over to the wall. No, but Yuz finds the down light recovery. He's able to get the KO. Godly so close to finishing off the first stock, but Yuz capitalizing. A little bit of juggle game coming out here. Oh, the weapon toss oh. goes right through Godly. Godly's able to grab the weapon, find the instant KO. Weapon spawn comes in, but Use is still spawning back into the game. Not able to get over to it. Godly going to stick with the axe. It's going to be Use's sword. He sidelights over and immediately goes back over to the wall. Both players have now started off early on their stocks, instantly going over to the wall to give themselves some breathing room. Goes in for the chase dodge Nair, but Godly able to avoid it. Finds a Nair of his own. Once again, kind of trading blow for blow. Dude, they're both just like whiffing by pixels. Their moves are so close to one another during these dodge circles. Two piece. There was the dodge from Godly, but Yuz was not ready for it. Down sig whiffs. Yuz goes down for the down air, but it lets Godly get that recovery. There is a weapon spawn on the field. Yuz is just playing around oh! it. In light into the D light, gets the recovery. Oh, he's still down. Oh, but he doesn't dodge in. Yuz was going for the read. Oh, the in light just barely misses. July uses sweat beating once again. This oh. time he can't get the touch for the chase dodge up, and Yu's going to fall down to his final stock. So one thing that's different with Godly versus Yu's here compared to like Kaino versus Yu's earlier is Kaino just wasn't dodging. The string would start off from Yu's greatsword and kind of would either like jump or fast fall back down or move himself back in, but he really wasn't dodging very often in the scenarios. Godly is dodging much more than Kaino was to get out of these strings. Yeah, very often he'll dodge, but he's also doing a really good job changing up yes. those dodges. Oh, oftentimes what happens is he'll see Yu's go for like the inside read to that dodge in read, and then he's like, oh, next time you go for me, I'm going to do it because you're not expecting me to go in. Oh, he grabs the landing with the neutral light. I was expecting a down air to come out from Yuz, but I think he was looking for the more horizontal entry. Yuz trying to cover this corner. Godly gets around him, has Yuz in the open air. Greatsword, not the best aerial weapon. They're so close to Sweet one another. Eating. And he's done for. Godly going to take game number two, ties it up 1-1. His gauntlets are looking really good, even though, of course, on paper, the range is absolutely going to favor the greatsword from Yuz. But Godly is doing such a good job of staying either completely outside of the range or he's right on top of Yuz. And you see Yuz running away, trying to put that space between them so he can utilize his extra range against Godly. Godly is just not letting it happen. Yeah, I mean, you kind of talked Three, about it earlier, two, right? The spacing one, game. They were whiffing each other by pixels. That's because they are playing such precise size footsies against each other. We're going into game number three. They're changing up the map picks. And what's one of the reasons you play the J.E. on it? You play it for the great sword, of course, but if you look at the damage split, it was 220 on sword compared to 142 on the great sword from Yuse. That was Godly staying inside and on top of Yuse the entire time. So Yuse could not find that great sword damage. That was his win condition before. He was tearing people apart with that great sword, but Godly is just not letting it happen. Yeah, he's finding ways around this great sword, but right now he's doing a really good job denying weapons from Godly, just trying to chase him down. There's the weapon spawn. Godly not going to pick it up for free as he's got that Nair, but doesn't get the read. He did hit the two-piece. Godly came with the dodge through to get in, around, and behind Yuz. 
The jumping downers coming out from Godly does pick up the neutral light there, sending use over to the far right side, then moving back over onto the wall, picking another one up out of thin air. Now going over to the oh! gauntlets. That is so big. I think it probably would have led to the free edge guard regardless. But the fact that he picked up the axe neutral light while use was already in the air meant his in-air movement economy was already a dreadfully low, and he just kept it going, especially with that down signature on the edge. Yeah, that was just a great recognition of the situation. After use went for that recovery um, past the weapon toss, you can see he was definitely running out of options there. Ensig thrown out. Godly able to get back up onto the stage. Picked up the side air with the bounce off of the down air. Now going back over to the great sword. Ooh. Oh, grabs that one quickly, evening this up about a minute and a half into this game. Stocks are even, games are even between these two players. Godly is without a weapon, but is spacing again. He really didn't have to do anything to get away from that neutral air that came out from use. He just kind of moved a little bit to the left and he was there. No dodge burned, no jumps burned, nothing. Once again, Yu's trying to find that read onto Godly. You're not seeing those big extensions from the Greatsword play that he so desperately wants. We're also not seeing that neutral signature come out from Godly that we talked about previously. And that's because, like, when you're a greatsword player, you like to stick to the ground. I know Flambo talks about that a lot. You love to control that ground. Yeah, you do some jumping up and down, trying to throw out that down air maybe every now and then, but you like to control that ground. And what does that neutral signature on Axe from Godly do? Takes you into the sky if they're playing aerially. So we're not seeing him use that very much so far. Of course, we did just see the neutral signature, but we're also seeing now two side signatures this game, that lateral along the ground area. Use just to avoid that neutral signature from Godly. Once again, just poking Godly. He's really trying to figure out these dodges of Godly because otherwise he's just getting an opener and maybe a bridge, which is not that much damage. And he's not getting them that often either. That was one of the big things that he was doing so well against the previous opponents. Does get that clash there, but he's not finding those huge strings. He's not finding that huge momentum. They're just kind of going blow for blow back and forth. I mean, they're trading back and forth, like you said. Godly manages to hit that neutral out. Not quite enough to KO as Yuz is really far out there, but he gets back onto the stage. He knew Godly wanted to chase in the air, so he was saving that dodge. He knew he was really high in the air, so he had enough movement to get back if he really just held right. Oh! Beautiful! Watching. Beautiful choice from Yuz to get back onto the main stage, hit Godly, send him in the blast zone, get a little bit of a lead, but you instantly see the answer back from Godly. He's going to be able to strip the field as well, moving back over onto the axe. Yuz is going to have to wait for the weapon spawn. You immediately see him retreat over to the soft platform. Godly pushes, but Yuz is able to grab the greatsword pretty quickly. Now that gravity cancel side stick that happened to finish off that second stock of Godly was something that Flambo was pointing out in the back. He's like, this is why Skeldra is such a good greatsword player. It's something that not enough people are doing. And when you do it, you have to do it very rarely. If you do it every time, like it's it's yeah. Orion Spear neutral signature. Everyone knows it's coming. Finally gets a solid great sword string. One of the very few that we've seen from you so far. Got the D-Light oh. into the recovery, then Dodge over the on the edge. Okay. Oh. Okay, use his turn it up. One more hit, Yuz could find it. He just needs that big swing, but Godly swinging back with the axe, the down light. Yuz tr struggling to get back down onto the ground. Then oh! His name is Yuz, but you might have to change that Y for an L for lose, and not like the opposite of win, but because he's lighting up like a light. I really hope lose is light oh. in Portuguese. It is in Spanish, oh. so sorry if I'm being ignorant here, but he's lighting L up, L man. L-U-Z. Yeah. L-U-Z, L-U-Z, so, so I'm like three layers deep, yeah. baby. I'm four Yomi levels deep uh -huh. if I'm gonna take a page out of Flambo's book here because all of a sudden, we saw that great sword light up. Ooh, and you saw on the screen the character swap coming out from Godly. It's gonna be the Taros for game number four. He's hoping this will be the thing to take it to game five and get him closer to the grand finals. I don't know about this one. I don't know about this one. Hey. And it, it's specifically hey. because you beat Kaina earlier on the Taros. What do you think, dude? Believe in the Taros. I, think I, I, I do believe in a Taros, and I believe in Kaina's <laughs> Taros, and the fact that he couldn't do it against Yuz. I don't know how Godly's going to do here. Godly's saying he's built different, or maybe he just did not like how his gauntlets fared against the great sword of Yuz. One thing that Taros brings to the table really well in this matchup is you're not having to find those big strings. Instead, you can trade blow for blow really efficiently with Taros against a great sword. That is true. Yuz picks up the two-piece there. 
A lot of distance between those two. Godly being very careful how he chooses to go in. You see him whiff that D-Light, instant two-piece punish from Yuz. Dude, the dash landing from Yuz, like he just whiffs and then dash lands back and forth, makes it really tricky to try to get that punish onto him. Down light, not gonna connect for Godly. Needs to start finding that finishing blow. He does have the axe in his hands, which is of course gonna oh. be the carryover from the Rayman. And the weapon toss is gonna hit Yuz, send him into that blast zone, and Godly's gonna have his choice of weapons, swapping back over to the axe. Started this one off with hammer, and it was solid, but I think he's really going to be leaning into this axe, of course, and that's why we see him moving on to it. Taro's brain takes over, and he gets punished for it. Yeah, sometimes when you see the bull on the screen, you just got to press that neutral heavy button when someone's on the corner, but Godly with the swings getting more damage put out on to use a second stock. Going in unarmed. Has the hammer now. Doesn't want it. Oh, the cider's gonna bounce off of the stage, take away some of that momentum, and even that almost did it. You still struggling to find this KO. Goes in with the punish on the D-Light in to the recovery for the easy KO option off the top after the whiff from Godly. And now used with that weapon advantage, tried to push it, but Godly with the Nair gets him the weapon pickup as it comes in. He's got a hammer, but Whoa. beaten out by the down bridge. I can't believe he found priority there. If he's able to avoid these just stray hits that Godly is throwing out, he's done a pretty good job so far, but the neutral air sent him flying. Godly's looking for the more consistent setups here. Has a much better vertical KO option with the hammer compared to the axe. Yeah, for sure. Those neutral airs, so valuable. Even down air can be a really good tool for finishing off opponents, and there you're seeing him throw it out. He's continuing to throw it out, staying just above Yuz. Hasn't found a connection with it yet. Yuz is really starting to fight this one back. Godly struggling to find this KO. These neutral airs are not making a connection. Yuz is being very careful here. Whoa. He knows the solid neutral that he's been playing for the latter half of this stock has been working. Godly really struggling to find that blow. You can see he was going for so many down airs and Yuz capitalizing. He's like, all right, if you're going to keep doing this, I'm going to start finding more and more punishes. But there's the Nair, that vertical KO like you were talking about. I can't wait to get a look at this graph to see how long Godly went without finding a hit onto Yuz on that second stock. Yuz did a great job of lowering that lead, making it much smaller. Oh. Goes for the D-Light into the ground pound all the way over on the right and high in the air, finding the connection, finding the KO, and tying this game up. This is final stocks here, game four. Yuz could go into the grand finals oh or Godly oh my could gosh. get us a game five, but Godly's axe swinging. Dude, what a difference between the axe and his hammer. He gets so many hits off of his axe though. He's, oh, oh, got the read. Oh, oh. One of the Jump few signatures scare. he's thrown out this entire set so far. They're even. The lead that Godly had on this final stock was so big once he picked up that axe. But now we're back to kind of the same what thing is? that happened. Oh, not quite enough just yet. Just one hit away from a game five. Used with the Nair. The neutral oh. stick. Yuz is going to grand finals. We got a South American in grand finals. Famo Brasil, baby. Yuz did it. He took down Godly. My were on Kaina, so many people's eyes were on Godly, and you oh, that's tech. just took he dropped him his controller. down. If Godly loses the rest of the games, it's because Yuz, he, he did what I asked him to do, which is to sabotage Godly. Whew. Wow. Goodness. Wow. You're seeing Yuz on your screen right now. He's feeling good after that win. You saw him after the one of the last wins that we saw him get. He was feeling good about that. He's pushing it every single time. We saw him deal with Kainas Taros. Then we saw him deal with Godly's Taros. Godly's going to have to work on that hammer, man. It just wasn't it. When the clutch moment came down, he's whiffing so many attacks. He just wasn't able to find the connections that he needs. And that's hammer. That's like one of the biggest things you're looking at when you use that weapon. His axe was light out do yeah, not get me sure. wrong but his hammer man that was the struggle i mean i really want to stretch a point that you were kind of making earlier which is that everybody in the elimination side has lost to use everybody who is sitting on the elimination side right now has is here because use is the one to beat them so they're all looking to see who's going to be the one to take him down now we're seeing the clips here. We're going to get a check out of the graph here in a moment. Look at that 608 damage from Yuz. There was the D-Light into the ground pound. 
That was the downer, and it wasn't enough. It seemed like he just needed the one hit, but he didn't hit it in the right spot. There was the GC in Sig from Yuz, and there was the pop-off once he did it. Yuz has got to be feeling so good. He's sitting in the Grand Finals. He gets to breathe. He knows he's got that winner's side advantage in the Grand Finals now, and everybody is going to be hunting him. Now, I want everybody to look at the like bottom middle of their screen at that graph. I want you to look at that second stock of use, that kind of tealish, dark tealish color. I want you to look at sort of the latter third of that. He basically spent a third of that stock not getting hit by Godly while making that lead nothing. It that was, was such a big lead, and he turned it into zero. That was Godly whiffing dare after dare after dare on that hammer, and Yu's just taking advantage of it. Godly's going to have to rethink his strategy here as he's sitting in the elimination finals. Has to be prepared for whoever comes out of the elimination semifinals, but also has to be thinking towards the future about how he's going to get through Yu's. I'm surprised that Godly finds himself in the elimination bracket at this point. I really am. I thought he was going to be able to handle Yu's, but... Once again, I have been proven incorrect, and it was clawing, scratching, biting from use to take that 3-1. That was huge for him. It's now going to be an amazing match that I'm looking forward to, too. Yeah, I mean, the, the scrapping from use definitely deserves so much credit, but now we're going into the elimination side. Once again, no second tries here. Kaina and Sandstorm both lost to use, but now, Who's going to continue on? Kaina, he's been playing that Taros. Sandstorm, he's been on the Tesco. His Tesco's looking really good. His boots are, of course, looking really good as well. Kaina's going to have to find a way to deal with that. Now, of course, we have Wes, who plays boots in South America. The way Sandstorm's playing today, a comparable, but also a little bit comparing apples to oranges. But he at least has some matchup knowledge against it. Hoping maybe he can deal with it. I'm hoping for a kind of win here. I got kind of taken the whole thing, but we're gonna be taking a short break here. We're gonna be getting back with Kaina and Sandstorm for the elimination semifinals at BCX 2023.
and we are whittling down the talent here at BCX 2023. Still one representative of every single region remains, but one region has guaranteed a grand final spot, and that is South America. Will another South American continue, or will the multi-time Sandstorm, one of the goats of Brawlhalla, take out Kaina? I think it's kind of wild that Sandstorm only has 56% of the vote here. Not because I think he's going to win this in a landslide. In fact, I think Kaina's going to win this. But the fact that Sandstorm, the GOAT, the name recognition, you look at that vote and you're like, okay, Sandstorm, that lights up all these neurons in my brain. I click the Sandstorm button. The fact that even the community, and it's going down, by the way, it's at 54% now as Kaina votes are surging in. The fact that it's that even is while Twitch chat might be on to something here for the first time ever. Well, you can look at the lifetime score. Twitch chat definitely knows their stuff. In the head-to-head, -head, it is currently tied. Sandstorm versus Kaina. But what I'm remembering is that the Summer Royale, Kaina said one weapon in particular gave him a really tough time. He only lost in the round robin phase against two people playing one weapon and one character only, and that's Tezka. He lost to Escrape, he lost to West. Guess who he's running into now? Sandstorm on the Tezka. And he is the one lone Tesca left in this. So you could do a little bit of extrapolation here and say that at least at this moment, Sandstorm likely the best Tesca in the entire world. Of course, given his pedigree, given everything that he has accomplished in this game, I don't think that is a far cry whatsoever. But I also got to look, dude, I got to look at the ranked queue for Kaina every time. He has 344 wins and 55 losses in the ranked queue. Six 6.25 win-loss record. We'll Three, see if he can two, bring that fury one, here one. against Sandstorm as we get in to the elimination semifinals. Elimination semifinals, like you said, this determines who's gonna podium. Will it be Sandstorm? Will it be Kaina? Kaina, no surprise, on that Taros. Last time they met was that Summer Royale, or maybe it was the Autumn Royale. It's not updated yet, Creed. I really asked you to do that this week, but you didn't. Uh-oh, you're going to get called out here for it. But it's Summer Royale. Kaina was the victor, but it wasn't against the Tesca. It was against the Mirage. Now Sandstorm all about that Tezka, but Kaina might have picked up a thing or two about playing against those boots. Right now playing a great job, staying grounded against Sandstorm. Catches him with a neutral light, but Sandstorm able to get back up onto the stage and kind of gives him some breathing room there. He knows how far that dash D-Light can carry. Okay, staying grounded. Oh, now throwing out the dare. Throwing out the dare early in this one. Neutral light as kind of goes through him. Put the hammer, but Sandstorm reaching once again with that down light. Oh, he does such a good job of just right in front of you, looking like a little teaser there. So kind of throws out the move. Nope, Sandstorm jumps around, gets behind, and finds the punish off of the move from Kaina. And now all of a sudden, everything Ooh. is evened up until Kaina finds the punish with the neutral air on that recovery. If Sandstorm wants those vertical KOs, he can he, uh, he get him and he got it with the unarmed kit with the neutral heavy there against Kaina, evening this one up just a minute and a half into this game one. I really feel like Kaina was watching that previous set of Sandstorm versus Impala though, because that was something Sandstorm was doing. He'd go for the up toss with the gauntlets, pick up into the recovery. Oh Another side my Kaina running out of movement. He won't have enough. Sandstorm with a big play on the left side. And he dodged so early in that. It was while he was still on the main platform form and Sandstorm hit through the final iframes of that dodge. That let Sandstorm go crazy. He knew he had room to play with. Oh my gosh, is he gonna do it again? Watch out. He's kind of just wants so to get it. back to stage, bro. And Sandstorm's like, here, let me show you. This is how you're gonna get Ooh. back to stage. Completely oh. stepping on him. Recovery kind of gets disarmed. There's the weapon pickup. It's the hammer, but Sandstorm disarmed himself. Going for the big play. Now he's got another set of boots. Stomp, side air. <laughs> Taros difference, hammer difference, at least evening up the stocks, but kind of is so far behind at this point. Now he's swapping back over to the axe, getting the D light to send Sandstorm flying away. Sandstorm now over onto the gauntlets. He's been able to sit on those boots basically this entire game so far. Weapon toss gonna whiff. Sandstorm looking for that weapon spawn. It's on the left side and kind of not able to completely deny. Neutral air into the recovery, not gonna connect. Juggle game coming out, double neutral airs, and gets the down air. The recovery, he attempts off the top, not quite enough. We are on Demon Island. Got wide oh! KO box, but it works.
works in favor of Kaina. He hits the down sig to take game number one. He grabbed the backside of the down signature. We talk about signatures that hit in front of you and behind you all the time. That is a perfect example of why they are so favored in Brawlhalla. And big credit to Kaina there for shaking off that play from Sandstorm because he had a massive lead off the Three, offstage two, boots play. And now we're going into game number two and Sandstorm's like, yeah, no more Demon Island. I want a closer KO box. Weapon's gonna go to, oh my god, dude, that's Taros. That's Taros right there. And it's gonna be the first weapon on Sandstorm. It's the Gauntlets. This is exactly what Kaina wants. This is the win condition he has. As I say that, he's getting worked by these Gauntlets, but then he gets three hits, and all of a sudden, there's a lead again. The side air. Sandstorm's got side airs to get back to the stage, but Kaina has a damage lead right now, and Sandstorm likely thinking about when the next pair of boots will be available. There's the pickup, but Kaina with the side air means that Sandstorm once again is going to be stuck on gauntlets. And Kaina, he doesn't care. Like, he notices that weapon spawn is there, doesn't even make a move a little bit towards it. He says, yeah, go ahead and take it. I don't care. I can outplay your gauntlets all day. I've been doing it so far this game. He's continuing it here at the second stock. Sandstorm tossing his weapon away. Now he's disarmed. Yeah, the boots are coming in for Sandstorm, see if he can bring this one back, at least find this KO, but Kaina's in the orange, he's gonna have to find something huge. Oh, the weapon toss, not gonna connect, the neutral air will disarm Kaina, not able to get that weapon pick up, Sandstorm with the neutral light, has the corner guard, but Kaina gets back, the Nair misses, Sandstorm is playing the weapon control game. Good spacing from Kaina initially, but towards the end, there's the signature punish from Sandstorm. Finally gets that first stock away from Kaina. Kaina spawning back in, has that unarmed kit, not super wanting to go in on Sandstorm, not super focused on that weapon spawn just yet. He did it safely, and he has the axe again. Ooh, but he doesn't get the read there. Kaina with the spot dodge gets past Sandstorm and punishes with the down signature. Basically a full stock lead here against Sandstorm, and he has a game lead. Sandstorm backing away, misses the down light, kind of with a two-piece, three-piece, four-piece. He's getting so many chunking hits. Oh, just barely whip with that in light. I thought we were going to see another one right there. Didn't feel confident enough to throw it out in time without taking a punish. You just see the color changes on Sandstorm happening so quickly. Anytime Kaina has this axe in his hand. So much unresponded damage. Kaina is getting so many hits onto Sandstorm. He finds a weapon toss down, but that's about it. Ooh, oh, that's big. Speed. Can he get more? Oh. Down light into nothing. But he gets the oh, time. He gets back. He survives. What a wild edge guard coming out from Sandstorm there. It seemed like at any moment it was over. At one point towards the end, it seemed like it was over for both of them, but the dodge was there. Sandstorm had that clutch and kind of being so careful right now. He's moving over, grabbing the ax. This could be curtains for Sandstorm, but he's gonna be trying to find his way back and gets the turnaround. Dodge, no dodge from Kaina this time. That was the dodge and Sandstorm's gonna chase, but he doesn't hit the neutral line and Kaina with the I, I thought I thought I was staring at Kaina from last BCX. I thought he was going to lose it all right there. Once those iframes from the dodge ran out and Sandstorm found the hit, you saw that Sandstorm was kind of carrying him up into the right just a little bit. Then all of a sudden, Kaina went down. He's like, I'm not going to get caught jumping after this. I am not going to waste my in-air movement. We're already reasonably high on the right side, so I'm going to hold down. I'm going to hold left. I'm going to get over to the wall as fast as possible. I'm not going to the blast zone just yet. Zero hammer damage. Image coming out from Kaina. It is all axe, baby. Yeah, and he was doing work with that axe, finding hit after hit. He was getting extensions where most axe players three, do not two, get follow up one, hits. But here we go. Game number three Sandstorm, the last North American. Can he hold on? Yet again, Kaina able to start off with this axe. The RNG is on his side for those first weapon pickups. And it's seemingly against Sandstorm as he has the gauntlets in his hand. Easy falling down air for Kaina. Side light into the neutral air, true combo. The big damage is coming out. We're barely even 20 seconds into the game and Sandstorm's already in KO damage. It's that neutral air, get some hits done. It's over to the boots. Doesn't get that follow up though. The gravity cancel down light just narrowly missing Kaina. Final frames of that down air landing on the stage and making contact against Kaina. The light, Kaina's out in the open, has no weapon, uses his dodge to get back to the wall. Down light, side air, sandstorm with the lead. 
first stock here, going to Sandstorm, getting back over to the boots as fast as he possibly can. Kind of going to have to rely on the hammer here, if he can even get to that weapon. Oh, Sandstorm tried to read the jump or the dodge. Oh. Up! Neutral Air finds the KO. He's going to probably move over to that axe very quickly, and that's exactly what he's going to do. Sandstorm spawning back in, gets hit with a neutral light. The chain dodge across the stage to chase after Sandstorm. This is that side air, wanted to get back up onto the stage. Weapon toss, just trying to throw those away. He wants the boots, there's a the weapon spawn, but it's over to the right side, picks it up, gets a neutral air. I feel like kind of uses downlight probably more than every other axe player. Like he's KOing with axe downlight, which normally isn't the best thing, but the fact, oh, I thought we were gonna see a recovery coming out from there for from Sandstorm. But the fact that he's able to put out damage so quickly means that, okay, he's putting out a lot of damage, but it's oh! in a much shorter time period. And we are a minute and 45 seconds into this game. Sandstorm is already on final stocks. Kinda is up 2-0 in the elimination semifinals. One more stock and Kinda moves on. Oh, the neutral sig! Sandstorm gets away from the follow-up, but Sandstorm is on his tournament stock right now. Can he close this out and get us to a game number four? He's got the boots. He wants the edge guard. Spot dodges, but Kynas finding hit after oh. hit after hit. He just waited there right next to Sandstorm. Sandstorm fell, kind of fell. Out came the next neutral air. His dodge is gone. There's the GC side light. Easy cleanup for Sandstorm once he saw that dodge gone. Kind of now spawning in on final stock. Sandstorm either in or very close to KO damage. The axe coming in. You saw how far that down air bounced him, even though it was off the main stage. That was one dodge. He's chasing. Fast fall Kinda down. waits. Same thing as last game. The fast fall down to get away from that string. Sandstorm went for the dare onto the stage. He's finding damage onto Kaina, but Kaina knows he's one hit away. The dodge up this time. Kaina goes low. Yes! And he gets the recovery. North America is out of there. We're getting a new region to be the 1v1 champion. Famo Brazil now two out of the top. Three, use in grand finals, and now Kaina in elimination finals. Kaina handling Sandstorm. Sandstorm, he's so many people's goat. So many people thought he was going to be the one to do it, but Kaina taking him out. Three, oh, beating one of his demons in terms of characters as well. Kaina now going to continue on into Godly. And you're seeing a little chit chat going between these two players. A little bit more than we're used to normally seeing. And Kaina, unfortunately, he doesn't get to take a break. No, he's in the hot seat. If he's going to want to win this, he's going to be sitting there for the rest of today because he's got to go through Godly, and then he's got to go in to use the, two, the person who knocked him down in here. Now he can take a moment to look at the front of the stage on that beautiful trophy that we just saw. Pressure is on young Kaina. He's gonna have to deal with Godly. And then, even if he makes it past Godly, who by the way, took him out last year at BCX, this, even though it's not in grand finals, after we got to see Kaina versus Stingray, Kaina versus Godly is like the other set that I really wanted to see. He dealt with the boots. It was looking tough in the very beginning, but he found the solution. He found his axe gameplay. He stole that game away from Sandstorm, hitting with the backside of the down signature. Man, Kaina so good with the axe, finding so many hits. Sandstorm basically playing from behind so often, he gets those stock steals. So sick, and dude. then kind of still manages to close him out. I thought it was over here, and there's that fast fall. He did that that game, and then he did it the game after as well. He didn't get carried over into the blast zone off of a bad dodge. And this crowd going wild. They know these sets are amazing. They are feeling it. We now have our top three, Duke. We said it several times. Now you're looking at the stats of Kaina versus Sandstorm. It was a 3-0. We were sitting back in the green room and Glitter Explosion looked over at me and was like, okay, now that we're this deep in the bracket, how many 3-0s do you think we're going to see? And I was like, yo, we're this deep? I don't think it's gonna be any. And then it was like 3-0 after 3-0 after 3-0 after 3-0. So that shows how much I know and that shows how unpredictable this tournament is. I mean, like you said, it's been completely unpredictable. 
And yet, to a degree, it's been a little predictable because everybody was coming in here saying South America's gonna do it. We want the South American W. I even started off the broadcast weekend saying, you know what? Maybe not North America. North America's been struggling, but let's at least keep Godly from getting that W. And so if Kaina can get the win here, hey, we got a South American W. That would be huge, not only just for the region, but for all of Brawlhalla and how far Brawlhalla as an esport has come in its short but also very long and very storied history. Yeah, I mean, history, like we said, has been made. It is being made constantly, but it also has been made here at BCX 2023. We've already seen Godly get one gold medal. Can he get two? He'd have to get through both South Americans. I just, I, I don't know what to expect from this set because it's going to be, it's going to be heartbreaking if I have to watch kind of lose to Godly again. It broke my heart in BCX 2022 to see kind of struggle to finish off that set against Stingray and then against Godly. He already conquered Stingray this BCX and that was huge. We'll see if he can do it against Godly. They haven't met very often in tournament whatsoever. The first time was at the Brahalla World Championship in 2022. That was a 3-1 for Godly. And then at the Winter Royale, that was a 3-0. And then at the Autumn Royale as well. Only three, times Only three times for these two incredible players. I mean, all of it being here this year, because we're seeing, you know, kind of has been able to make it more uh, out to more events. Of course, those Royales, but also he was able to make it to Dream Hacks. We're seeing more representation, like I said, of the South Americans as we go on. But kind of, he's in the hot seat. He's going to be going up against Godly now to see who's going to be going into the grand finals. Loser this goes home with a bronze medal at BCX 2023. It's time for the gameplay. I'm really, I'm really looking forward to this one. Man. It's going to be good. I almost like I'm so glad to be able to call this one, but I also kind of hate that I have to like pay attention and be like, OK, I'm going to do analysis on this play <laughs> instead of just like screaming and going, ah, ooh, ee. like I have to be a professional here instead of just like making fan noises. Look, it's OK. If you want to be as biased as I know you are inside, I'll, I'll just play the counter bias as much as it's going to hurt me <laughs> to have to cheer for godly of all people. I just, you know, I'll do it for you. And that's what happens when you got a good teammate the on the desk really. like dude. Look at that viewer vote right there. The people believe in Kaina. They believed in him against the GOAT, and now they believe in him against the God. They really think that the South Americans are going to do it. I mean, again, coming into this, a lot of people were looking at specifically Kaina to be that guy. He lost to use which means he hasn't lost to anyone outside of South America just yet here, but he's going to be now, again, going up to Godly. And we're going to be throwing it over to Glitter Explosion on the stage here with our two competitors, Godly and Kaina. That's right. You know, we had to talk to them before we got into this very sure to be epic match. Godly, I'm going to start with you after that last back and forth we saw. That means no NA possibility for a singles winner. And you mentioned it when twos happened. You're like, well, it only counts as half a win. Now it can only be any other region. So how do you feel about that? That's good. I like an SAEU win. Uh, we don't want those NA wins. We don't want those NA wins. For real. I love it. I love it. And kind of, I want to ask you, if you're able to make it through to that grand finals, what would that mean to you to be able to compete in an all South American finals? Yeah, it's going to be really fun, uh, cool because uh, South America has increasing his skills. So. All right, I love it. Like I said, we're now down to EU, South America. This is gonna be fantastic. Go get ready at your stations. We're gonna send it back on over to the boys at the desk to get this thing started. Give it up for your top three. Godly and Kaina are gonna now fight it out for your viewing pleasure. My big question is what is Godly gonna do? Is he gonna try to warm up the, the Taros against Kaina's Taros? Because that seemed to be his fallback in the matchup against Yu's. Or is he going to go back to the Rayman, the thing that he's been playing throughout the bulk of this weekend? It would be a wild decision to go Taros v. Taros against Kaina, especially the way that the hammer just really wasn't working for him. Now, Kaina wasn't leaning on the hammer, but what we know, that Kaina has one of the best hammers in the entire game. I think that'd be a wild choice. 
he's probably going to go in with the Rayman, but only he can make that decision, and only he truly knows the reasons for making whatever Legend choice decision he does, because he does have a reasonably deep pool of Legends that he can pick from. He can go for the Wushang, he could even go for the Asuri, he could go for the Mordex, we've seen him pull out the Caspian. He has a lot of choices that he could make here. The Legend Pool for Kaina is also reasonably big, but it's mostly been the Taros, and it's been the Taros for a minute now. Yeah, he's definitely been full committed to that Taros, at least for this year. He's been really sticking with it, and he's been doing very well with it. Of course, he's in the top three here at BCX 2023, a very stacked tournament, and now it looks like the Rayman's locked in for Godlet. Now, both of these players were knocked out by Yu's. It was in the winner's semifinals for Kaina, and then one set later in the winner's finals. But we're not on the winner's side of the bracket, Duke. We're on the elimination final side. Winner here moves on to fight Yu's. The loser has to go home with that bronze medal, and neither of these players want that bronze around their neck. They both want to continue on. They both want a chance at that gold, but right now, they're fighting it out, Axe v Axe. Both of them have had e explosive Axe moments. Yeah, we're gonna get some nasty Axe gameplay in this set. Godly now swapping over to the Gauntlets though very early on, definitely taking the greater of the punishment here as we're only about 30 seconds into this game. Gets the early dodge there from Kinda, takes him into the sky, oh. gets the same direction sidelight again, and gets the KO off the top. Godly already reading the movement of Kaina. Got that double side light to get that initial stock. Kaina did get some good damage here onto Godly, but needs to find that finishing blow. Is it going to be a stomp side air? Oh, Godly still opening him up. Maybe the Nair. Okay, no, he goes for the stomp side air from the middle of the stage. I was almost expecting the stomp neutral air since that was a big kind of choice. He uses the hammer Nair a lot more than some of the other few hammer players that we have out there. Specifically, like, early on while he was playing Taros, he would go for the GC D-Light into the neutral air, just like the middle of the stage. That was part of his hammer swag. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big just testament to the play style of kind of, like you said earlier, is that he uses a lot of axe downline. He uses a lot of hammer Nair as well. He really is good at punishing people who like to approach him vertically. Godly over on the edge does get the first hit on the side air, but he's right on that corner, and that keeps him from moving along with that hitbox. Kind of doing a good job evening this one up. Two hits coming out from Godly there. He stays high in the air, so he doesn't get hit by that side signature. Disarmed with the unarmed side air. Hammer stomp, but he doesn't have the reaction in time. The side air not going to connect. Spaced and punished. Downline into the side air, kind of just outside of that neutral light hitbox from Godly. And that's some classic hammer stock ending gameplay where you wait, you play that spacing game, you wait for them to get impatient to throw a move out, and then you move in with the D light into the side air for the punish and the KO. It's going to do a similar thing here early on with the axe, waiting for the move to come out into the side light neutral air true combo. Now, Godly with that weapon advantage. Neutral lights, kinda. Gets the side light to follow up. Wasn't ready. Oh, just barely missing that side air. Godly finding a nice punish with the down air. Trying to chase after Kaina, but Kaina going back grounded into the center of the stage. He always tries to make his way back into that center stage until he sends his opponent flying. Then he's going to start to push. Even the Ooh. reset back just a little bit with the back dash, sending Godly over. Oh. That gets the dodge. He can't into touch. Into the down air, and game one goes to Kaina. But let me remind you, Duke, and everybody at home, this is exactly the pace that was set at BCX 2022. Game one went to Kaina and then game two, game three, and game four. Three in a row went to Godly. Now he was playing a different legend, but was Petra another gauntlet legend? Well, Is that going to be the pace this time? It's a new year and a new Kaina, but we're seeing the lock in from Godly. It's gonna be back to the classic, the Mordex for Godly to go up against Kaina here in game number two. Now, he did not bring this legend out the last time they fought. That game one that kind of took was on the Asuri and then the switch to Petra for the rest of the games. And kind of was not on the Taros. He was on the Koji and then a Sidra. No axes coming out from any of those players. Okay, Godly going to start this one off with the Scythe. We'll see if his string potential is better here than it was with the Godlets. It's looking like it is so far. He Still missed. has 
the dodge up in time. Godly had to make a guess, and he happened to guess wrong. Godly not able to complete the stock just yet, but that side air will do it for him. Fantastic pressure to start this off. Godly needed no warm-up time for this Mordex. Do we have South American Scythe? I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, so I'm not sure how in the know Kaina is against that matchup of where you need to specifically dodge, what dodge changes you need to make. He does have the experience against Ooh. the Great Sword, also has the experience grabbing that d sig for the KO exactly when he needs it. What a good response, because he knew Godly was trying to force him into the open area. He saw that Godly was coming past him for that turnaround down air, and Kaina was like, all right, down sig, covers everything. He is just a little bit behind here. He's looking for his way in, hasn't thrown out an attack in about 10 or 15 seconds. There's the down air, two down airs, almost tried to turn it around, but Godly stuck in place, did not waste his dodge there, found the down air. Okay, two more hits in the bottom side of the recovery, and that down air! Over the corner, just adding up more damage, but Godly with the recovery kind of manages to dodge away in time. Neutral light catches Godly, but Godly's got enough movement to get back to the wall. Side light Nair oh. again, and the turnaround side air, and that's gonna be a KO? He's so good at finding that extra hit. A lot of times, you get your two-piece and you're looking for the read, and kind of time and time again, gets that read. I can't believe he got the KO off of that. I feel like I need to watch that on a Say Jam Will It KO segment. The way he found that side air, that's Taro's strength, baby, coming out on top here. Godly has some good damage in the meantime, not quite enough to find the KO. Oh, oh. it was that like stacked and in the air stomp that he found. There is the stock, just about 50 damage on this final stock of Godly. He has the scythe in hand. He can turn this lead around in just a second. It punishes the weapon pickup, but kind of stays low. Godly was reading high with that jump there. Nice side air this time. Ooh, kind of is struggling against this scythe from Godly. The momentum is in his favor. He whiffs an axe move. He's going to take at least one hit from Godly, if not more than that. Ooh, switching over to the hammer. Did not want to play that axe game against Godly anymore. Now he's going for the vertical. Goes for the recovery there. He's bringing a lot of movement, but oh! Godly catches the landing, and Godly gets himself on the board. Game two goes to Godly, and we are seeing an exact copy, at least so far, of the pace when they fought at BCX 2022. Let me repeat again. Game one went to Kaina. Game two, three, and four went to Godly. Does Kaina have what it takes? There is no legend swap here. He's going to have to find something to deal with this scythe from Godly. We'll see what it's gonna be. Kinda of all people has handled a lot of scythes, specifically at the Royales. Time and time again, I've been like, you know, Taros can struggle a little bit against the scythes out there, and then he tends to prove me wrong. Like we talked about against Sandstorm, he beat out Sandstorm's Mirage at a previous Royale. He's getting the better of the damage fight so far here. Now, one thing he's doing with Scythe here compared to what he was doing against the Great Sword is we are seeing him dodge more after getting hit the first time rather than just like fast falling down or jumping away. So those dodges are really going to come in handy for him. Stomp into the sidelight. If he's able to dodge in the right direction, make the right guesses, completely end those side strings. Then when Godly goes over to the gauntlets, Kain is able to use some of that range, use those large hit boxes that both of his weapons have to get the lead. Kind of already adding up extra damage. About to lap Godly here, but Godly finding some good damage in response. Downline not going to hit. Kind of able to drift to that, we uh, to that wall. Now, there was a lot of in-air movement economy burned for both of them, so Kind of couldn't really chase after that whiff happened. He had to just get over to the wall to reset his jumps. There's the down air sending over into the corner. Oh, oh he goes for that recovery. Just barely makes contact with it. Throw it threw it out almost instantly. First stock gone, but Godly has about 100 damage on this stock. He's got to be careful, so he's going to go over to the side. Such a crucial play from Kaina to burn a jump instead to, to an exhausted recovery. Now he's going in unarmed onto Godly. Now he's got the hammer. Side sig gonna whiff, but Godly with a soft punish. That side light not gonna do much. Stop side air, and Kaina is up big. Full stock lead for Kaina. Could be going into the game four with a 2-1 lead on Godly. That would break the pace that happened one year ago. There's the down air, though. Godly's hoping for the edge guard situation here. Went to reach up with the neutral air. Oh, the recovery just barely missing as well. 
Once again, playing that footsies narrowly around each other, but the ground pound connects onto Godly, and this is Godly's final stock here in game number three. Weapon toss. Godly's got the weapon advantage now. Similar idea from both of them. The connections were made by both of them, but Godly happened to be a little bit closer to that weapon. Kind is able to grab one. He's in the orange, but he's still only on his second stock. The side air sending Godly flying. Easy weapon grab for Kind oh. Hoping to get the KO off the top. Snaking that one out. Oh. He went for the weapon pick up there. There's the neutral signature. Even though it's a 45 degree angle, he built up enough damage to take out in that corner blast zone. Oh, he's got a scythe now. We've seen scythe, scythe steal socks before, but we'll kind of give him the opportunity. Nope. Pace broken. Game one went to Kaina. Game two went to Godly. Now game three went to Kaina. He is staring at a 2-1 lead here. Three stocks, one game can separate him from the grand finals and a chance to fight Yuz in grand. All South American 1v1 Grand Finals for BCX 2023 would be monumental as it looks like it's going to be a Chun-Li lock-in for Godly for game number four. Hoping that spear will give him some range, hoping he can use that signature kit maybe a little bit more freely than he did while he was playing the Mordex. Saw that the scythe wasn't working too hot for him. He does like those gauntlets. Most of his character picks so far have been some sort Three, of gauntlet legend. Two, now he's hoping this is the one to get it to game number five. He's stuck on the Chun Li, and here comes Kaina. Now, it is a little bit interesting given the damage split for Godly from last game. He only did 88 damage on the gauntlets compared to the 250 on his scythe. So there's more than just the weapon, specifically with the gauntlets that he wants here. Of course, it's going to be that signature kit, could be the stat line, and of course, could be that spear. But he's getting handled early on in this game. There's the D light. I was expecting yet another neutral light to come out from Kaina. Barely misses that side light and gets punished just a little bit for it. This is a side light, but does find a neutral air onto kind of another neutral air side light recovery. Not going to put him off screen in that second recovery. Not going to connect. Down six. Nice. Seeing him use that one very early, that's one of the reasons he made the choice on this legend. So he can find those KOs earlier. He doesn't have to just rely on the gauntlet reads, doesn't have to rely just on the scythe reads. A very solid signature kit. Not like Mordex is lacking, but Kaina is not lacking either. As he grabs that stock, ties things up a minute into this game. Now he's got that weapon advantage. Godly picks up the gauntlets, but Kaina able to avoid that neutral air. Once again, playing that footsies game. Godly gets in with the side air. Now, Kaina's kind of been doing a lot of work, of course, on the axe. A lot of his KOs have been in that left blast zone, right blast zone, or the bottom blast zone. Not a lot of vertical KOs. So I don't know how this stage is really going to affect him with that high ceiling. But if Godly's going for those vertical gauntlet KOs off the top, he could struggle here. But, of course, he has the signature kit, which has a lot of lateral KO options, like that signature right there. Caught the jump from Kaina, got him with that neutral signature, and like you said, lots of horizontal launch. Godly now able to work on Kaina's final stock here in game number four, but Kaina with the corner guard. Still throwing out those stomps over on that corner. Godly was able to get through, find the punish with the lead, but the down air still had enough damage on it, still had enough force on it to take off the top. That high ceiling, not a struggle here for Kaina to find KOs with. Light from Godly. Could be his tournament stock here. Two pieces, kind of comes back down the dare into the nair. I love that that first dare that kind of found, Godly didn't dodge immediately. He went for the neutral air because he knew a second down air was coming. That has been a constant for kind of when he finds the down airs in those positions. It's down air, wait for the dodge. The iframes are gone into the second down air. A lot of damage being added up here, but it's on both sides, too. Oh. This is Godly's tournament stock right now. He needs to survive. Narrowly gets that wall touch, but that's a hammer for Kaina. He's looking for the one stop that he needs, and he gets it. We got a South American Grand Finals. Godly is going home with the bronze medal. Kaina took down his demons from last BCX. That was the one thing that I was really looking at was that choke. 
The pressure was on and kind of folded. But that was a year ago, and I said it earlier on the pre-show, 2022 Kaina is not here anymore. We have 2023 Kaina. He didn't choke here. He clutched it out. He had the damage output. He had the KO potential. He found everything that he needed at exactly the right time, and he lost 3-1 to Godly last time. He beat Godly 3-1 this time. Kaina with that Taros has been on point, marching through opponent after opponent. The top North American, get out of the way. Top European, get out of the way. There's one person left, the top South American. Can he get through Hughes? He didn't before. We saw it happen in winner's semifinals against Yuzu's great sword. He struggled against it, but now, before we get to that, we're looking at these clips. Oh, that was so sweet from Kaina to take that game. I was worried about this scythe, man. This scythe was looking so good. It seemed like the perfect ingredient for Godly to find quick damage exactly when he needed to. He also was using the signature kit exactly right there to find the KOs. He also found a neutral signature, which I think might be right here. I can't remember if this is the one. No, that was actually a Kaina victory on that game. Whew. I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> you getting a little sleepy? I, I, I'm getting a little easy. Take a little but... nap right before grand finals of BCX <laughs> 2023. What do you want? I'm, I'm exhausted, man. Kind of putting me through the ringer here. I'm so excited seeing all of this. The adrenaline has been pumping through my veins for way longer than the body should be pumping adrenaline. <laughs> That's true. We are getting a lot of adrenaline here. I know my heart has been pumping because these sets have been immaculate and we're going into the grand finals now kind of versus use like we said use knocked kind of into the elimination bracket now kind of has to do the roots the opposite he has to knock using the elimination side so that he can finish this out you just laid that out i heard photo come out and say what's up brahala i'm awake again yep I'm hitting my, no, not even second win, it's probably my fifth win <laughs> at this point because we are moving in to the grand finals for these two players. Yuz and Kaina have been the top guys in South America. Of course, Yuz coming into this one, PR1, Kaina coming in, PR3. The first time I really started taking a look at Kaina was at a South American land, Caratata, put on by Estes Sao, and I saw what Kaina could do. At that land, though, it was Yuzu's Orion that took him out and ultimately won the tournament. Is that going to happen again, or are we going to get that revenge? Look, the story has been playing out throughout the year. I keep saying it. North America starts strong, but South America finishes stronger. We saw it was a North American win at the first Dream Hack. Guess what? Yuzu was the one to win it after that. Godly would have won. And then we go to the Royales, where guess what? Kind of won. Kind of just a little little bit behind and I'm feeling like that's how it's just gonna play out here once again use getting ahead of Godly and Kaina well he doesn't have much longer to figure out the solution to the great sword and sword problem from uses Jay Yun. the only time he has left is the break that we're about to take right now don't go anywhere because we will be right back with grand finals here at BCX 2023 
Did you think you could keep me out? I can't tell if you're sweating or crying. You're stronger than I thought. <laughs> I'm not cheating. You're just not trying. You're so predictable. I'm Loki, and you're... Who again? Lord something? <laughs> Very good, Legends. <laughs> I think he likes you. <laughs> I'm finally here. Or am I? <laughs> Welcome to Brawlhalla. Kitayo uragirareta nakama yo. うよ。勝わない相手なんていない。力を貸してくれ。風に無勢だが、俺には叶わないぞ。ラプターフォースの真の力を見せつけろ。お前の攻撃は強いが、俺の意志にかなわない。まだまだ。仲間のために戦う。残ってるのは俺だけだ。最後の防衛。ブラルハラへようこそ。Every moment of Brawlhalla Esports has been leading to the Grand Finals at BCX 2023. South America as a region has been waiting for this moment here at BCX 2023. We're about to go into Grand Finals. It's Kaina from Brazil. It's Yuz from Brazil. Famo Brazil! I want everybody to cheer for this as this gameplay is about to unravel in front of us right now. I am so honored to witness history in the making because guaranteed it's going to be a South American champion for our singles. Oh my goodness, the excitement is nothing, nothing else that I've felt. Every year we do this for what, the last eight years. 
but this year has been so electrifying. It literally feels like nothing else I've ever felt before. Whether I'm sitting backstage, kind of peeking out here in the audience, it is insane here at the venue. And we are so excited for this grand finals. Duke, I gotta grab your thoughts about I this. I mean, this is this is like you said, it's history. It's it's groundbreaking. South America is getting a 1v1 gold medal at the World Championship. No matter what happens here, South America is getting the trophy. And you know, everybody in South America, such a beloved region, has got to be feeling so stinking good right now. They're all validated. All of the work that has come from that region from Estesau, from the commentators, from the players, from the community members, from the people who just watch tournaments, all of that has built players like Yuz, players like Kaina, of course, the entire cast of characters from South America that are here, the tournament mods, all of those players and everyone involved had a hand in what is about to happen in front of our eyes. It's Kaina or it's Yuz, but it's South America. And, and truly, South America deserves it. You bring up the ranked stats so often, but really, truly, South America, they grind harder than any other region. And now every other region's got to take a, sit, a step back and look at them and go, you know what? We haven't been doing enough. Now, I do want to point out, they are competing against each other, even though it's going to be a guaranteed South American win. And we can look at the viewer vote. And it seems like, it seems like our viewers are rooting for yous here. Um, he is sitting pretty on the winner side of Grand Final. So, I mean, hey, there's a reason why he's up there. You know what I mean? I mean, he took down Godly. He took down how many people? If I can look at the bracket real quick here, he had a beautiful run through the winner side, um, in including uh, beating his fellow uh, competitor, kind of, as well. Um, so, Sparky, I want to know your thoughts about this matchup between these two just real quick well first off i'm surprised that it was used going through on the winner's side because kind of overall in their entire career has uses number in matches their 20 and 11 in favor of using games i'm uh, sorry in favor of kind of in games it's 71 and 37 in favor of kind of kind of has uses number he beats use almost all the time but none of that matters now anymore because what happened today, and that's what the viewers are looking at. That's why Yuz is number one on this poll, because of what Yuz did to Kaina not that long ago. That's right. Now, the players are geared up and ready to go. So without further ado, let's bring our players out. All right, everybody, it's that time. So please make some noise as we welcome to the stage your top two players of the BCX 2023 singles competition, Kaina and Yuz. Wow, look at them. I love how Yuz walked out to was like, hey, buddy, here we are again. But I know that their region, their South American region, is so, so proud of them. I don't know if I can disclose this, but I, I did see Enrico back there really feeling it and being emotional about it because I'm sure their region, everyone back at home, everyone watching is so proud. I could even tear up right now, too. I am tearing up right now. <laughs> I mean, like we've been saying, this is such a monumental occasion, a monumental moment for not only the region, but of course the players as well. Like Sparky has said, all the effort they've been putting into it has definitely paid off. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that the South South Americans themselves were like, we're not, we're not good enough. We don't deserve it. But now they have shown they more than deserve it. They have put in so much effort to be here in the grand finals. And those words about them, quote unquote, not deserving it, those were literally kind of words that he said to me at, I believe, the Winter Royale. He said, yeah, we went to tournaments, but our placements were, and these are his words. These are not my words. These are his words. We're a joke. Oh, no. And they took that personally, very personally, and you can see everything that South America has accomplished, everything that Kaina has accomplished, everything that Yuz has accomplished, and they find themselves here in Grands.
Well, here we go. It is the grand finals of BCX 2023. Take it away. Who's it gonna be, Kaina or Yuz? Like we said, Yuz has already beaten Kaina once before, which means that Kaina has to do two best of fives against Yuz if he wants to be crowned the BCX 2023 singles champion. Kaina did bring it all the way to game five against Yuz, but wasn't able to close it out. We'll see if this set is any different. Now you see on the bottom of your screen, Kaina has an L next to his name. That means he's coming through on the elimination side. Meanwhile, Yuz has a W because he's coming through on the winner's side. That means it's a double elimination tournament. One of the first things we covered, Kaina has to win two sets against Yuz. He has to double eliminate Yuz. And so far, it's looking a little rough. It's looking rough for Kaina, but great for Yuz. He's got the sword in hand. He doesn't have him quite in that KO percent. That down air just adding up a little bit more damage, but a down light recovery might not do it just yet for Yuz. There is a weapon spawn on the field. We haven't seen Kaina move over to the axe, which has been his main weapon of choice for the past couple sets. He might want to try and lean on that a little bit further into this game as Yuz was able to take the first stock with only about 100 damage on it. Now he's over to that great sword. It's been a powerhouse weapon for use for a while, but now Kaina's on that axe, which, like you said, has been a powerhouse weapon for him. Use over on the wall. He's taking turns between playing high on that wall and then he'll go back down low on the wall in case Kaina wants to throw something out that peeks just over that corner. Neutral light gonna send Jay Yun flying. That defense is gonna come in handy, but not on the second time. Really clean edge guard from Kaina, spot dodging that weapon toss just in time to get out of it and throw out that neutral light and keep Yuz from getting that wall touch, keeping this one close. Oh, he goes for the nair, and then the second after that, he goes for the ground pound. Normally, he goes for the double nair, goes for that juggle, the juggle with the light attack after the light attack, but this time, threw out that 360 degree hitbox with the ground pound, found a connection with it. He is still behind Yuz, but it is not an insurmountable lead. Yuz swinging back. As long as Yuz doesn't get this KO, then Kaina can find all the damage that he needs. But there's the downlight into the recovery, but it wasn't enough. The dare on the first stock gave him the damage he needed to get that KO. This time he didn't get that dare. It is wild that we could see Greatsword potentially win BCX, and it's not the online BCX when, when it was released when Greatsword. Wins. Side air from Yuz, he'll get the KO. Kaina gonna have to come in and find that KO immediately. Otherwise, Yuz gonna find a lot of runway here. Swapping back over to the Great Sword. Kaina now has the hammer. Instant cleanup. Coming in at about two minutes and 45 seconds into this game, kind of swapping back over to the Axe. He wants that damage build opportunity. He's sticking to the ground. He's not jumping up and going for the Nairs. He is not challenging Yuz in the air. He's like, you can sit on that soft platform, but eventually you're going to want to come down. The sweat beads come out from Yuz. He's running out of options, but Kaina just takes that opportunity to get some more damage. We're now seeing a standard aerial from Kaina being the first axe neutral air and then the ground pound. He's threw out yet another ground pound in the air. That wasn't something he was doing too much earlier, so he's changing things up here to go against Yuz. Goes in for the sideline. This time he'll hit it. He gets the ground pound, punishing the dodge of Yuz. Oh, but the weapon toss goes through and Yuz capitalizes, gets a big three piece into the recovery. Yuz gonna take game number one. Yuz is two victories away from going home with the gold medal. His runway for takeoff is so much shorter than Kaina's at this moment, and he's ready to take off. Like the vector he used to play, he's a jet plane and he's ready to launch got all the jet fuel he needs to fly and he is flying high right now as we get into game number two kind of and use can kind of find any response because right now use has just been running wild kind of starting off with the hammer use is starting off with the sword back-to-back -back neutral lights coming out goes for the big move with the ground pound over the stage stays there for just a second great dodge to get through the down light in kind of corner guard again kind of very much staying on the ground trying to control that ground as much as he can waiting for the landing to come in that time there was a falling sider that made a connection with kind of there's the stomp side air from kind of stomp side light because he picked it up right on that corner he knows exactly when to save versus side light, depending on where he picks up that first D-light. Stomps being thrown out from Kaina. Doesn't hit the side air, use lands, gets a nice little neutral light. Both of them jockeying for that stage control. Weapon toss to open up, coming out from use. 
They're both being so careful with how often they attack. He went for the stomp down air, but ends up dropping it. Neutral light coming out. That's going to forcefully disarm Kaina. There is a weapon spot on the field. That neutral air is going to give him some room to go and grab it. But Yuz also grabbed the second one. Neutral light. Yuz not able to land, and he will have to land on his second stock. Kaina gets the first one. Sticking with the axe. Oh, not enough just yet. Didn't even oh, send off screen. He ended up driving out of that recovery, so it didn't have that final force dump that happens right at the end, but the D-Light recovery is going to make full connection, and the KO goes off the top. Use about 40 to 50 damage behind Kaina, which with the way he's been outputting damage so far in this set is virtually nothing. Ooh, there's a dodge coming out from Kaina, but Yuz had him in the air, so couldn't do too much more. Opted to swap weapons and get that uh, primed greatsword. Kaina getting oh. stuck in the blender, but he gets out of it. We're seeing some of the greatsword momentum now coming out in this game, too. Opening up with that neutral light, but Kaina was behind him. Finds the punish, finds the juggle as well. No ground pound. The follow-up is the side air this time. Sent Yuz over far to the left side. Now he was sent high and right. The range on that side light from Yuz. Oh, the weapon toss just halting use the down light the down light kind of maintains the tiniest of leads and this is what i was talking about with kind of finding d light ko's normally that's a bad thing normally that means inefficiency but you can see he was just outputting damage faster than use was if you look at the clock it didn't really take that long for him to find that second stock and he found the d light up on the soft platform so that was a smart move for the ko there rather than just like hoping for a read or hoping for a stray hit but use was able to answer back in quick fashion yet again and we are even going into this final stock kind of needs this game to help interrupt the momentum that Yuz has going into this set. Now, right now, I don't think Kaina can afford to lose this stock. He needs to take this, but Yuz, once again, getting those openers. He's getting the opener into the bridge. Before he was going for the double dares, then he just hit one and waited. He didn't want to throw anything out because he didn't want to take the punish from Yuz. There's the side light. No major damage coming off of that. The side light doesn't quite have the range, but this one does. Finds the two piece with the neutral light bridge. Swaps over to the hammer. Use not able to get that recovery off that down air. Kind of just patrolling the ground while Use is floating up. Oh, misses the stomp. Misses another stomp. Kind of looking lost right now. He's not able to find anything. Oh, the recovery almost puts him off screen. One more recovery from Use, and Kind of could be down 0 2. Use able to avoid the stomps from Kaina and there it is the finisher from youth he's up 2-0 the stomps from Kaina are completely unsuccessful now he's not able to find them in the right space he's not able to find them in the right time he's not able to find them at any type of range whatsoever Yuse is just dancing around them each and every time he completely has Kaina's number here the floundering from Kaina to find those down lights that was like the only thing that he had there Everything that he threw out completely missed. And now it comes down to this the final game for Kaina, potentially, if he cannot close this out. Otherwise, Hughes is going to be crowned your BCX 2023 champion. D Light Dare sending Kaina over the edge. Hughes and Kaina swapping positions. You see Kaina backing up here. He does have the axe. A lot of last game he spent with the hammer in his hand, especially towards the end. Back to back neutral lights again. Hughes is finding so much damage. A third! Oh! the side sing use with a full stock lead now and two games in this set he's got so much momentum on his side now everything coming up use has the great sword which kind of has not found the solution to especially not when he has the hammer in his hand uses movement is too good uses initiations are too good uses advantage states are too good and too frequent He's just in kind of head now. He's finding hit after hit. He's not having to go for reset and just walking away with an opener bridge. Instead, he's going into the finishers. There's the dare. Oh There's the recovery. Use. Is he going to three stock Kaina to finish this out? He's about to be staring at a two stock lead on Kaina. The weapon toss there. He's able to pick it back up as well. Finds it oh. downer. Goes for the on stage ground pound against Kaina and takes virtually no punishment from it.
Hughes with the weapon advantage. Downline into the recovery. Weapon toss to help him out. Three stocks to use. One stock left for Kaina. Hughes has complete control. He has control of the physical game with his two stock lead. He has control of the mental game with the pressure that he's putting on to Kaina. He has control of the weapon game. Now that Kaina has the hammer in his hands, he has control of the crowd as it is chanting, use, 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 use. We know who the crowd here at Cobb Galleria wants to win. We know who's close to winning as he's got Kaina in the open air, but Kaina gets back safely. Can he deny the three stock at the very least here? We need to see that Axe gameplay coming out. He has to find a miracle here. Oh, he's th these second hits, these bridges coming out from Hughes have not found a connection yet, but the damage is still adding up nonetheless. Oh. This is the down line. This is the neutral light. Neutral light this time. He denies the three stock, gives a kiss, but is it enough? There's still two fresh stocks for use. And I think that kiss was absolutely genuine. Even if he takes the L here, he knows that Use deserves the victory. Back to the hammer. Hopefully he can find the down lights against Use, but Use is staying very aerial. Okay, we see a stomp side air. Feels like it's been a long time since we've seen that, but Use oh. instantly answers back. And hit with the bridge, and there's the dare. Use is your BCX 2023 champion. Somehow, Yuz overcame every single game that Kaina has defeated him here in recent memory. He overcame every single player that went up against him in this bracket. Yuz is your BCX 1v1 champion. He deserves so much accolade. Not only did he break the curse of NA winning all the 1v1s in the LAN environments, but now he's broken the curse of NA winning all the 1v1s in the World Championships. NA has got to step up their game, but right now South America is on top because Hughes is your champion. And Hughes came back. He started off the year so strong. And again, we're always relatively speaking I'm for the still. context of this. Spring Royale 2023 first place. DreamHack Dallas first place. DreamHack Valencia 13th from Hughes. And then fourth in the Summer Championship. Didn't podium. Fourth in the Autumn Championship. Didn't podium. But he took that time and he learned and he grinded and he brought the Jayun all the way to BCX. We have a great sword that won BCX. Great sword won BCX, South America won BCX, use one BCX. Give it up for your BCX 2023 1v1 champion. He deserves to lift up that trophy. I've heard it's heavy. Uh, it is. It's got to be. It's huge. Congratulations to use an incredible effort that he brought to BCX. More than a year in the making. So much time and effort put out from these grinding ranks, grinding competitions, going to lands that we didn't have in the past, putting everything on the line and showing what it means to be a true champion. He is once again the champion and he absolutely deserves it. We're gonna just take it in the moment. All eyes on yous. I think we got ourselves a good timeline. I'm going to say it. We have a good timeline time here. We have Godly and Zen cross-region team coming together, taking 2v2s. We have Yuz, a brand new champion in a brand new region. Brawl is the best that it's ever been. Yeah, we got, you know what? A gold medal for every region. All the big three regions got a gold medal. That's huge. And we're going to throw it over to Glitter Explosion. I want to hear what Yuz has to say. Do Brazil, parabéns! Congratulations on your performance. Tell me what is going through your mind right now. Thanks. I'm thanking like everyone. Thanks God for this. I'm, I never imagined my, myself in a position like that. So I'm very happy, very, very proud of myself.
you should absolutely be very proud of yourself. Enjoy this moment here with everybody and tell us a little bit about your experience this year at BCX. Uh, from the last BCX, th this BCX was awesome. Like, it's, they improved the BCX, it's insane. I really like the event. Like, see, it's always good to see my friends, people that I can see normally. So, it's amazing to be here with you guys. Thank you, thank you. Now, before I let you enjoy your celebration and the trophy and just the feeling of being the world champion, I want to give you an opportunity to do any thank yous to anyone who supported you along the way or shout outs, and you can do it in whatever language you want. Okay. Então, primeiramente agradeço a Deus por tudo. Agradeço meus pais por me dar a oportunidade de estar aqui, poder fazer meu melhor, me esforçar. Muito obrigado por sempre confiar em mim. É... Sempre dá uma motivação para continuar, nunca ter duvidado de mim. E eu queria fazer um agradecimento especial, eu queria agradecer ao Lopes, esse cara, o pessoal mais incrível que eu já fiz na minha vida, leva para minha vida, é como se fosse um irmão para mim. E o que eu desejo para ele é que ele possa voltar a competir. Uma parcela dessa vitória o Lopes tem, porque ele sempre se, se dedicou para me ajudar, sempre jogou comigo, me ajudou, sempre fez seu máximo para mim ajudar. Eu, eu, eu amo muito esse cara, velho. Então. Eu agradeço a você, Lopes. Muito obrigado, viado. Te amo de coração. Obrigado a todos que estão nesse evento. Thank you, guys. All right, I want to hear you guys be the loudest you have been all weekend to close out the show one more time for you, your world champion of BCX 2023. Wow, congratulations to you. I am speechless. I almost teared up here sitting on the desk hearing all that. Well deserved. Oh my goodness, what a grand finals. I gotta grab your thoughts, guys. You were sitting here watching it all. I mean, here we go, the highlights of the game. Duke. I think, oh man, I, as someone whose like kind of job is to say a lot of things, I am so lost for words. This has been the best event I've ever been a part of, and 2023 has been such an amazing year, and I look so forward to 2024 right now. I think all the Great Sword kids like can't complain ever again. <laughs> <laughs> like they just can't complain. You know, Great Sword can't KO a lie. Great Sword is bad, needs buffs, needs help, a lie. Because Yuz showed what you can do with the weapon. He showed what you can do with Sword. He showed what you can do with Jay Yun. He placed ninth at BCX last year, which isn't bad by any means, but going from ninth to first place. And not just that jump, but he destroyed everybody in his path. Nobody had the solution to use. Oh, I love that. that trophy high and mighty just all the way up there in the confetti and everything what a wonderful end to our grand finals that is your winner right there that is your bcx 2023 champion oh my goodness we had had so many i feel like ups and downs and everything and i just want to just talk about that because this is this is it. This was this is the end of our BCX. We have our winners and stuff. So let's just kind of like, I guess, talk about this whole weekend and how it's been in the last few matches, dude. I mean, it's been it's been a wild ride, and it's all things must come to an end. BCX 23, 23 cannot go on forever. As much as I want it to, as much as the people here want it to, because you know everybody here had an amazing time. But all things, all things must come to an end. And I just, I'm so thankful to be a part of this ride, especially with you guys, because, I mean, I couldn't ask for a better, a better oh. group to be a part of. I'm tear up, guys. Stop, dude. Oh, yeah, <laughs> dude, we're getting emotional up here on the desk. Sparky. BCX 2022 was an unforgettable experience. And somehow, y'all came back a year later and seemingly blew that event 
out of the water. You do it each and every time. You make everything better time after time. You surprise us every time. Brawlhalla is the best that it has ever been, but not the best that it ever will be. Blue Mammoth Games, the support that they bring to this community, the community, the support they bring to this game. It is this beautiful symbiotic relationship at every different level from the bottom to the top. Y'all, I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've cried actually live on the desk. So you're gonna have to excuse me a little bit because I'm sorry, the makeup gentleman... artists. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay because literally this year of esports has been nothing like I've ever felt before, and the competition was fierce. We're just just thinking back on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, today, incredible matches. We saw history in the making live in front of our very eyes a South American win and they are so they deserve it so much because they worked so hard for it over the years not just this past year over the many years that we've had in esports and I can't just can I just say I'm so excited for year nine of Brawlhalla esports oh my goodness and we can look at the bracket here at this run Sparky, tell me your thoughts about this one. I mean, look at this bracket. What an amazing bracket. We had so many representatives from each different major region. And we know that at the end, three competitive regions, three gold medals. We've been talking about it all year. All the regions are so close to one another. And we have proved it over and over again. Every time there's a bracket, the players in all of these major competitive regions I mean, I'm waiting for Aus to step up. I'm waiting for SEA to step up and give us a performance like South America gave us this year. We got more than just the three major competitive regions. So I hope that they take what happened here and they use that to fuel the fires of their own communities so that eventually we can have however many competitive regions in the future. I want to include Japan in there as well. What a bracket, what a tournament, what a... How did we do this in three days? <laughs> yeah. how, did, how did we compress all of that into three days is is nothing shy of a miracle. I, I, I mean, I, you got to give props to all the people yep. behind the scenes, the TOs, the people who kept things running and on time. Yes, we yes. had a very tight schedule and uh, everybody behind the scenes made miracles happen. I'm pretty sure that you said you, you can't wait for year nine and like toast and Austin and everybody at Skill Shot back there was like, hold up, we're, st we're, still, on the <laughs> we're still on this <laughs> broadcast, dog. Don't talk about year nine yet. Well, you know year nine is going to be better than ever. And now, guys, I do want to grab your final thoughts of BCX 2023. Duke, I'm going to start I mean, with I, you. I, I, again, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. It has been, again, such an amazing event. There's so much that cannot be captured on camera or be captured in words. There's so many amazing people, amazing cosplayers. I saw a librarian Mirage cosplayer. Shout outs to her. Uh, she wasn't here the previous couple days again. Yeah, that was so icy, babe. Yeah, there's there's just so much amazingness that like you at home, you can only get a, a taste of. And uh, I will repeatedly say that if you are a part of this Prohala community, there is nothing like coming out to the World Championship. And I guarantee you, you can find someone in the audience and ask them if your friend went to BCX and say, hey, should I go next year? They will 1,000% say, absolutely. I've been able to do my favorite things that I've ever done in my whole <laughs> life. And I love my friends when they get over She's here. running. She's running away. Right. She's running away. I love my friends. And I thank everybody out there for letting me do this. Because it's the favorite thing that I've ever done in my whole life. And I can't even get through. I'm crying more right now than I did <laughs> y'all's wedding. <laughs> we're, I think we're because of what Brawlhalla is, is baby. But, I love oh this game God. and everything that it has allowed me to do. And that's BMG letting me do it. That's the community supporting everybody. Now y'all are coming out. You're going to really make me cry, we man. I cried this long in a long here. time. Again, God. come here, Zip. Come here, You guys here, know the faces. They were on the side stream. They were on the New main friend stream. glitter explosion. Give yeah. love to glitter. Come She's here, joining Dara. the Brahala family. Dara. My and Swedish course, king. Stick, toast. Foda, Left Aza. it down. The only one who understands the oppression of ball people. <laughs>
toes. <laughs> Esports year nine. You got to worry about it, bro. But it just enjoy year eight. I'm crying. Tazaraki, crying. my old travel partner. <laughs> Everybody in the back who can't make it out here. That is the reason that this happens. There's a whole production truck back there. That's not even no, all of them, man. That's not even close to Celeste all of Celeste is standing over there. She's been the talent coordinator. She's been the coordinator for more things than I even know what's going on. Yoshi, she drew that amazing shirt that everybody loved. She was drawing sketches. Y'all literally cannot understand how many people are involved. There's Flambo! Flambo! <laughs> Flambo! Passionably late. This broadcast would go on way too long if I named everybody, all of the heroes behind the scenes that make this happen and let us do what we do so that y'all can do what y'all do. Guys, it's been such a blessing to be part of this community for so long. And <laughs> I'm sorry, I am tearing up. It's been a blessing to be here and I'm so grateful and I cannot wait for more because guys, wow. <laughs> I'm so glad you're losing it too. I didn't want to be the only one. Oh, I feel better now. This I was like, cut away from us. Like, oh, <laughs> guys, this year has been insane and we wouldn't want it any other way. We couldn't have asked for a better BCX 2023, and that is all due to this amazing Brahala community that traveled far and wide to attend this year. And of course, everyone watching at home right now. That's right, you guys are also a part of this. Congratulations again to Zen and Godly as our doubles champions. And of course, use your BCX 2023 singles champion. 600 plus competitors showed up, but ultimately there could only be two winners and those two have officially been crowned. We want to thank you all for tuning in this weekend. It's been incredible and we can't wait to do it again, of course, next year. So from everyone at Brahalla, our partners at Skillshot Media, and on behalf of the entire talent team, those behind the scenes, the community out here, thank you. Thank you seriously so much <laughs> for an amazing year eight of Brahalla. We leave you with the final sights and sounds of the Brahalla Championship Expo 2023. Until next time, good night, everyone. Oh my goodness, Zen Godly versus Maine and experience us the first match of today on Championship Sunday. As we prepare to get into the grand finals. Plays an act though, EU's best team uh, going up against Zen and Godly. Stop them. It's about lifting up those trophies high above your head. Put them up and congratulations to Godly and Zen taking it all home this weekend. Hey, Harry Harrison, where are you going? You oh. can't run away. Oh. oh, and he goes for the neutral sink. 100% accuracy. Godly looking for protection the final blow here. And Paula needs to make sure he doesn't get caught by the final glove again. Oh. That is just it. I did not expect the power off of that, but Godly knew. Hey, wow, what a grab from Agno. Agno baiting the dash land. Goes for the grab, cancel headset, and that's gonna be it. No Agno way. Gets the oh, three. Oh, oh. Oh. It's all Bruce Lee action here, bro. He is hall rank, bro. Yeah. <laughs> kick, 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 kick. And Blaze has no answer, bro. Like, what is the answer to this aggression from Sandstorm? We look for the web talk, maybe He's trying to catch his jump back, and that's going to be enough down light to recovery. Kind of needs one hit, one end light, one D light, one cider, anything. I'm going to finish the game as we finish it just like that. So simple, so clean. Officially in the final four of our singles competition. Just one hit away from a game five. Hughes with the nair. The neutral oh. sick. Hughes is going to grand finals. Spot dodges, but kind is finding hit after oh. hit after hit. South America as a region has been waiting for this moment here. 
back-to-back -back neutral lights again. Hughes is finding so much damage. Oh! And the side sink! And hit with the bridge, and there's the dare! Hughes is your BCX 2023 champion!